This program is brought to you by Newsworks in cooperation with the City of Eau Claire. This program is simulcast on WRFPLP 101.9 FM. Call this meeting of the Eau Claire City Council to order. Please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Madam City Clerk, please call the roll. Councilmember Anderson. Eaton. Here. Berge. Here. Christopherson. Here. Emmanuel. Here. Braggart. Here. Strobel. Here. Wells. Here. Workman. Here. John. Here. And we have quorum. Thank you, everyone. Welcome to our meeting this evening. Thank you, Madam City Clerk, for calling the roll. During its Monday, Evening meetings, the City Council holds our public hearings and listening sessions on public uh, issues that we're going to be voting on at our legislative session tomorrow at 4 o'clock. I want to welcome everyone again this evening and thank Valley Media Works for helping to live stream these proceedings, which can also be found um, on Valley, valleymediaworks.org or if you visit the government channel 99.4. Uh, as well as simulcast on WRFP LP FM 101.9. You can also find past proceedings of Valley Media Works meeting, uh, our city council meetings on their YouTube channel, if you would like. If you would like to address the city council this evening, I want to just briefly review the protocol. Once I introduce an item, staff, or in some cases, members of the city council will present on that item, and following that, council may ask some additional uh, questions for clarification. Then we open it to public comment. Once the item is open, please approach the podium uh, and state your name and your address uh, for the clerk. You'll have five minutes to speak, and you'll see it. There's, there's a light here at the front uh, that starts at green and moves to yellow and then red. Once it turns red, that means your five minutes of speaking, your five minute speaking turn has come up. And I may remind you to wrap up your remarks um, if you go past, well, I will remind you, it just depends how quickly, but um, I will ask you to, to wrap up your remarks at the five minutes, um, as there's a lot of folks that would also like a chance to speak. Sometimes council members will ask an additional follow-up question um, just to seek further clarification, uh, and, and so please wait just a, uh, a second at the podium after you speak. Lastly, if you do not wish to speak this evening, um, I want to make you, make, a, make you aware that we have a comment form at the back of the room, and you can fill that out, and we uh, get that, that information at our desks um, so that we can help with our deliberations tomorrow. You can also look on their city website. We have all of the, I hope the city web, the contact information is up. As some of you may know, our city website's under renovation, but uh, hopefully you're able to find our um, emails and our phone uh, as well on the city website. Lastly, we also offer a public comment period. Um, and so if you are here to speak on an item that is not listed on the agenda or something that's listed on tomorrow's agenda, there's a sign up sheet at the back of the room that you can sign up on. Uh, and then we'll get that. I'll call you forward once our public comment period has begun. Those speaking turns are for three minutes. With that introduction, I would like to get going on our first order of business, and this is going to be a presentation. Uh, my apologies. This is the public hearing on our alley improvements. Uh, presentation is going to be held, uh, brought to us by Dave Solberg. This hearing is a proposed improvement on the alley east of Fifth Avenue from Congress Street to Fulton Street. Mr. Solberg. Thank you, and good evening. Good evening. Um, this alley is, uh, we had 13 alleys approved previous um, earlier this year. Uh, this will be the 14th. Um, this is the alley east of 5th Avenue from Congress Street to Fulton Street. It's in the historic Randall Park neighborhood. Um, we received a petition uh, for this alley um, late last year, and it was accepted by the City Council on November 13th. Um, the existing alley is in a worn condition. It has asphalt pavement. Uh, what the uh, and it has no public utilities in the alley. What the project proposes is to uh, reconstruct the alley to a 12-foot width with 
two inches of new bituminous pavement, um, and it will be grouped if approved by the city council uh, with the remaining other 13 alleys that were approved earlier this year. Uh, with that, I'll take any questions. Are there any questions from council regarding this uh, alley improvement over on Fifth Avenue? Any follow-up questions? I don't see any. Thank you, Mr. Solberg. Then are there any members of the public who came down this evening to speak on item one? Again, this is the uh, alley east of Fifth Avenue, uh, Congress Street to Fulton Street. Is there anyone this evening who came down specifically to speak on this item? Seeing no desire, we will move then, we'll close that item, move to item two on our agenda. This is regarding street improvements. Specifically, item two is a public hearing on proposed street utility and sidewalk improvements on the following streets. Eddie Lane, which is from Star Avenue to Hastings Way, and Melby Street, which is from Anderson Drive to Hastings Way. Mr. Solberg. Um, I will go over uh, both projects and then uh, would be happy to entertain questions at the end of Melby Street. Um, both of these projects are uh, on the north side of Eau Claire. They run from Hastings Way to the west. Uh, these projects are vital links that connect Hastings Way with the neighborhoods in the industrial park uh, on the north side of Eau Claire. Um, both of these projects contain uh, railroad crossings with the Union Pacific Railroad. Uh, the, the railroad does have uh, crossing improvements scheduled for the summer, uh, which is the reason why we are coordinating both of these projects with the railroad projects as well uh, to minimize disruption for the uh, north side neighborhoods and, and businesses. Um, of note, the railroad crossings, when uh, they are improved with uh, railroad forces, uh, they will meet um, current safety standards, uh, which would make them quiet zone compliant at some point in the future. And um, we're hoping that it'll be one seamless project for each of these two streets uh, in conjunction with the railroad construction. And of note, uh, these projects will be coordinated so both Eddy Lane and Melby Street will not be closed at the same time into the, uh, into the, to the west from Hastings Way. So I'll go over Eddy Lane first, and then um, I will go over Melby Street second. So the project limits for Eddy Lane uh, start um, at um, right around Western Avenue, and then it goes to the Star Avenue intersection. Uh, the utilities in Eddy Lane uh, date to the 1940s. Uh, the pavement condition uh, ranges between 16 and 58. Um, this street is classified as a minor arterial and is 34 or 36 to 64 feet wide. What the project proposes is to replace um, the utilities uh, with new utilities, new water main and sanitary sewer and storm sewer, and construct the street in essence to the same uh, width that exists currently, um, making a number of improvements uh, along the corridor. And I'll, I will go through the improvements uh, from the west to the east. Uh, at the Star Avenue intersection, uh, we will be uh, reconstructing the intersection. We had looked at making a tabletop intersection, which is where you bring the pavement up to the surface of the top of the curb. Um, so the sidewalk, you would go from the sidewalk through the crosswalks um, at grade. Um, but after having an open house at the airport in early March and listening to some concerns from the industrial uh, park, um, we are proposing to reconstruct the intersection in more of a standard uh, type intersection with the, the pavement at the level, the, the, the grade level that you would expect. Um, we will be enhancing our signage coming in and out of the school zone. There is a school at this location, a church, a convenience store, and another business in this corner. So there are a number of pedestrians in the area. Um, there are crossing guards during the school crossing times in the morning and the evening. Um, but we are going to put some advanced uh, school zone uh, signage in conjunction with the project coming into this intersection. And then also looking at having larger stop signs with some uh, better reflective uh, warning on the, on, the, on the post that holds the signs up. As you pro proceed to the east, um, the street, the curb and gutter remains in the same, um, same width that exists currently. Uh, it'll be a new driving surface, new curb and gutter. Uh, we will be proposing or we are proposing uh, striping bike lanes 
along Eddy Lane that would continue up to the Old Abe Trail where it crosses. Uh, we also are proposing a crossing at Kilbourne Avenue here. Uh, feedback that we had taken was the crossing at Star and the crossing at Western Avenue was quite a distance and there was a desire to have a crossing somewhere in between uh, because of the proximity of Anderson Drive with the railroad crossing at this location and the number of large vehicles that turn in and out of Anderson Drive. We felt a mid-block crossing uh, at Kilbourne would be the safest spot to provide that, that crossing. Um, as we proceed further to the east, um, we get to the Anderson Drive intersection. Uh, we're making some radius improvements, trying to square it up a little bit uh, to make it easier to look to over your shoulder when you're making a turn out onto Eddy Lane. But yet, we're keeping this radius so it doesn't inhibit traffic going, particularly truck traffic, going into the industrial park from Anderson Drive to the north. Um, one significant safety improvement that we're adding is at the railroad crossing, uh, we are proposing a sidewalk connection to connect the sidewalk uh, to the west of Anderson Drive, across the railroad tracks, and hook up to the Old Abe Trail. So you will be able to proceed without having to cross Eddy Lane um, or the tracks without sidewalk to the Old Abe Trail along both sides. Um, we were able to reduce the radiuses in this intersection of Western Avenue with Eddy Lane uh, and shorten the crossing distance for the existing crosswalk here uh, to make it um, as, as, as tight as we could get it distance-wise, um, but yet still allow the turning radius for large vehicles to turn onto Western Avenue to that industrial area as well. And um, then we're bringing the cross-section into the intersection and matching uh, the existing pavement that is at this location. Um, again, the railroad is making improvements to uh, the crossing. They're adding crossing arms at the railroad. Uh, with that, we were requested to look at um, some additional signage. This is a state trail that crosses uh, Western, or crosses Eddy Lane. Um, there is a lot of activity that's going on in this area between turning off of Eddy Lane, Western Avenue, Anderson Drive. Uh, so when we get the final design from the railroad for what um, signs and features will go into the rail safety improvement, uh, we will try to have some sort of uh, trail crossing ahead or something for the Old Abe Trail Crossing Eddy Lane. Um, our primary focus for safety and improvement is to make sure that the railroad um, crossing signs are not um, degraded by having uh, additional supplemental signs that um, would be in a, a lower priority, but we will seek to try and make this more prevalent and are looking at also um, with the widened distance here, having a trail crossing or pedestrian crossing sign on Western Avenue as well. So with the large number of industrial vehicles that go through this area, try to promote a little, um, little clearer awareness that there would be um, either bicycles or pedestrians using the crosswalks. Mm -hmm. um, at some point in the future, uh, if bike lanes are extended across Eddy Lane, um, we stop them at the Old Abe Trail now and encourage pedestrians to use the underpass. But if the, if the on-street bike system is extended, uh, the intersection will support that. Um, we would have to do some modifications to the existing marking, but at least physically, there is room in this area to continue those at some point in the future when it continues on Eddy Lane to the east and then potentially up Locust Lane into the areas on that side. Um, with that, um, that is the Eddy Lane project. The other project is Melby Street, the next crossing to the north. And it's a similar, it's a similar scope project, but it's much shorter. Um, Here's Anderson Drive, We're, we, we are matching in uh, just to the west of Anderson Drive and matching in where the pavement uh, for the reconstruction of Hastings Way stops at this location. Uh, the utilities in Eddy uh, in Melby Street are uh, date to the 1950s, uh, so we'll, we'll be replacing our utilities, replacing the driving surface. Uh, feedback that, that we had taken um, was at an open house and from subsequent follow-up was to make sure that uh, there was the ability to turn left onto Anderson Drive and to keep traffic going through on Melby Street. So we're maintaining the two lanes of traffic that are going 
westbound, and then there's a single lane of traffic that go eastbound. Again, the railroad will be installing um, crossing arms and rail safety improvements at this railroad crossing as well. And currently the sidewalk ends at this location and here, and we are extending the sidewalk to connect to the Old Abe Trail along the north and south sides of um, Melby Street. This was an area that was identified in the bicycle, um, the City of Eau Claire Bicycle Pedestrian Plan as a sidewalk gap. Uh, so we are making that connection. You can see uh, this is the existing trail that was um, worn from pedestrians accessing that without the use of a sidewalk. So um, that will be a safety improvement. We're able to add the sidewalks as long as we don't lengthen the uh, railroad crossing. So that's why uh, you see the sidewalks come in and hug the back of curb at this location. If we place an extra at grade panel on those railroad crossings, it becomes very expensive to add a, another panel to that um, in the six figures uh, worth of cost. Um, so for that, we are having the sidewalks fit uh, within the existing crossing width and shrinking the lane slightly to accommodate that. But we're still with the reduction in lane widths, we're still able to accommodate two lanes of traffic adequately um, going westbound and a single lane coming eastbound. Um, with that, I'll take any questions on either of these two. Thank you, Mr. Solberg. Do council members have questions on these two items? Council member Jean. Thank you. I, could you turn back to the um, Eddy Lane? Um, you indicate that there will be bike, bike lane on the other side, correct? From the farther side, right? correct? Uh, on the east side of Hastings east. Way? Okay. Um, th there is not on the east side of Hastings Way currently, but in the future, it would be something that we probably would look at. So on, on Eddy Lane, there are no existing bike lanes, um, but we are proposing from Star Avenue up to the, up, well, up to the Old Abe Trail right here. You can see where they stop right there. And then from this point to Hastings Way, we're encouraging the bicyclists to use the the pedestrian underpass. Has there been any thought about uh, pull a bike lane to the other side too, or just just not enough space for the? Um, to the to the oh, to south the, side, I think yes, correct. Uh -huh. To this side, um, there is room to add bike lanes if you adjust the striping, um, but they don't lead to bike lanes on the east side of Eddy Lane. Uh -huh. So for now, we extended them to a what we felt was a logical terminus at the at the trail and then you utilize the existing and then when we look at Eddie Lane at some point in the future across on the east side of Hastings Way the pavement markings on this side would be worn and we could we could alter these pavement markings to match up with what the design is on the other side if if bike lanes are approved then you would have a system that would go through the lights but but currently there, it's not striped and it's not set up for that on either side of the <clears throat> actual intersection with Hastings Way. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember. Are there further questions? Councilmember Gregor. Thank you, Acting President Worthman. Um, thank you, Mr. Solberg. Uh, obviously, we've been in touch a bit today on this project, but I um, had a, a question that kind of came up in, in the, I guess it kind of builds off of uh, Councilmember Zhang's question. I guess, would it be possible in order to improve access for bicyclists to use the underpass to upgrade um, the sidewalk that exists um, just to the west of the underpass to a trail at that northeast intersection of, of uh, Western Avenue and Eddy Lane? In the northeast. Or sorry, this. Uh, I guess it'd be the southeast, southeast. corner, yeah. Um, the the right of way, it's very faint. Um, it's going, and it's actually showing that this is um, potentially um, slightly going through the corner. Um, so if you were to widen that sidewalk um, to a trail width, um, you would push it closer to the curb. So there is room to do that there, um, but you would lose that boulevard space that provides kind of a a calming area um, with the large number of vehicles. Um, so th this is the existing sidewalk. We weren't planning to do much unless it was unless it was impacted with our utility construction out here. Um, 
there's physically room for it, but it does transition from five feet where you have the boulevard to you know an eight foot plus wider when it goes underneath there. Uh, okay. The other connections on here, the sidewalks are shown as five feet. Um, and then where they're at the back of curb, on this side it's six feet. Um, typically our sidewalks are five feet with a boulevard, six feet if they're back of curb. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, further questions? from council on either Eddie Lane or Melby Street. Improvements, another question, Councilman McGregor, your yeah, light's still on. Thank you, Acting President. Um, yeah, I guess I wanted to, to switch over to Melby Street real quick, actually. Um, and this is a similar type of question. Um, I'm just kind of looking at the opportunities that we have where we have a trail that was just completed on Melby Street to the east of Hastings Way, um, but then it has people go to the north side of Melby Street from the south side to connect over to the Old Abe State Trail. Um, so I guess I was wondering if you could explain how we could, if there would be space to put, to upgrade this, the currently proposed sidewalk on the north side of Melby Street from the Old Abe State Trail to the, at least to the gas station, from like the five feet to say an eight foot trail. Um, on, the, on the north side, uh, the right of way line goes through here, right at the tip of my pencil. It's very faint. Um, so there would be room, this is shown as a five foot sidewalk again, similar to Eddie Lane, uh, further to the south. Um, we're constricted right at the crossing, so there wouldn't be any latitude to have a wider sidewalk than the six feet on each side that we have here. Um, the south side, the right-of-way, XL Energy owns uh, this corridor that goes through here on each side of our right-of-way. The south side, we're constrained, so if you were to widen the sidewalk on the south, it, it would end up being almost on back of curb. On the north side, uh, it would there would be room to widen if it if it were the desire to um, have a more trail width connection to the sidewalk over here with the trail. Um, we're proposing five feet of concrete sidewalk. Um, if it were uh, changed to an eight foot asphalt um, trail connection, it would be a similar cost to the five foot concrete sidewalk. We had that request on a project last year with our frontage road in front of Shopco where we were proposing a sidewalk from Stein Road to the west and uh, council chose to uh, upgrade the width on that um, with a different surface and, and it'll be fairly cost neutral. Great, thank you. Thank you, Council Member. Uh, Council Member Jean. Thank you. I, I noticed that there there's a mobile gas station on the north side and there's a store on the south side. Is there any affecting, like closing or something affect on to it? Um, the, there is no right of way effect to them. Um, they are outside of the construction limits. Um, this, this will be closed, so there will be a detour in place for each of these. When Melby Street is closed, um, traffic will be detoured down to Eddie Lane, and when Eddie Lane is closed, it will be detoured up to Melby Street. So there will be, we'll, we will work with the businesses to um, get the word out like we do with um, all of our construction projects that affect businesses, that the businesses are still open. Uh, so there won't be a physical uh, impact on those properties, but um, there will be a, a short detour uh, during the summer when it's under construction. And I, I, I've neglected to mention that in this section here up to the tracks, um, we do have a section where bike, bike lanes, on-street bike lanes are, um, are uh, proposed with striping just an edge line. Uh, again, once we get to the intersection here, um, at some point in the future, uh, we could stripe lanes through the intersection and then um, with the project on Melby, the bike lanes start over on this side. So um, again, this one could be at some point. To the west, there are no bike lanes currently until you get a significant distance to the west through the industrial park. So that was can one I, thing I Can forgot. I ask a second question? Sure. When is, when is the construction begin or when are you planning to? Um, we're going to coordinate construction with the railroad. Uh, so our our premium, or our, our most optimistic time frame would be to do at least Eddie Lane uh, during uh, the summer vacation for the school, since Sam Davy School is right there. Um, there are some cost savings that can be had as well as inconvenience if we're able to do it the same 
time period with the railroad. Um, we haven't received their schedule. We've told them that we would like to do it this summer, and it seems probable that they'll be in the same time frame, but I, I'm not able to tell you that we would start like in June or July, um, but I would anticipate it will be this summer. Thank you. Thank you. Further questions? Uh, Dave, I actually wanted to ask one. Is uh, the quiet zones, what's this, how, how does, how will these projects help toward our quiet zones? So these projects on, on Eddy Lane and Melby Street, and there's a third one on Star Avenue, mm -hmm. down, or, um, down by the VFW. Um, the Office of the Commissioner of Railroad ordered the Union Pacific Railroad to make uh, safety improvements to these crossings, even prior to the uh, fatal crash that occurred at Hogarth Street, the next crossing to the north. Um, they were made for, they were required to make safety improvements. They weren't required because of quiet zone. It, mm -hmm. was, it was pure um, exposure of cars to the higher number of railroad um, trips that are being used there. Um, so it's a safety improvement, but they will be quiet zone compliant. So mm -hmm. those are three crossings that in our quiet zone um, study that we had conducted um, five years ago, uh, were over a million dollars worth of improvements to those rail safeties. The, the city of Eau Claire, our responsibility for those rail safety improvements will be to do the uh, pavement marking that the railroad specifies. So mm -hmm. you see some railroad crossings and also some signage. And our uh, partners in community services um, installed signs and did some pavement marking um, as soon as last fall already to make us compliant with our requirements. And then mm -hmm. the railroad is scheduled to do theirs this summer. So that's three of the eight crossings on this line um, that would be quiet zone compliant. Wow, thank you. Any further questions for Mr. Solberg this evening? See any? Thank you again. Then are there any members of the public who are here this evening who would like to weigh in on the items we just heard, the Melby Street and Eddie Lane uh, reconstruction projects? Are there any members of the public here that want to speak on those two? Welcome. If you want to just approach the podium. <clears throat> Good evening. Just state your name and, and address as well. Uh, my name is Nick Solberg. I'm the logistics manager at Veritas Steel, 2800 Melby Street, Eau Claire. Um, first off, I would like to thank Dave Solberg, no relation. Um, and his engineering department for holding that listening session at the airport um, and taking into account, you know, some of the loads, some of the, you know, things we fabricate. Um, for those of you who don't know, we are the only major steel bridge fabricator in the state, and 90% of our projects are federally funded DOT bridges. Um, we are, excuse me. We are one of the largest employers in the business district, 200 workers, 75% um, our union. Um, we do have one of our partners here from local 2138. Um, the Melby or the Eddy Lane concerns and the Anderson concerns, we feel have been addressed and mitigated to the best of our ability in terms of getting our product out. Again, like I said, we're very appreciative there. Um, as far as the Melby Lane itself, um, we realize that improvement has to be done. We're excited about that. What I would ask the City Council, as well as the City, when it comes time to let this project and negotiate it, is to take into consideration any closure, you know, limitations, so we can continue to truck our bridge girders out through there. In the past, when we've resurfaced Melby, um, the contractor and the city have worked with us to maintain hours of operation where we can get our trucks out from 6 a.m. to 10 a.m. and we can avoid missing customer deliveries. Um, these are large DOT projects where liquidated damages can run in the five figures per day for missed deliveries. Um, also, I would feel having uh, a limited access or you know a daily access would minimize high volumes of trucks that are um, able to 
take the main exit off of Melby, you know, minimizing major disruption in residential areas. So, thank you. Do thank you for your presentation. Do council members have follow up questions? Uh, council member Zhang. Well, thank you for coming down here to speak. Uh, I think one of the quick question is, is that all your vehicle just using that road? Is there any, any other alternative road that you are using? Alternative roads would include um, the Star Avenue exit, and we take that down to Mercury and get out on the North Crossing. Um, and actually, uh, I have some pictures related to that. Um, this actually came up with the tabletop intersection that Dave Solberg had provided sure so this picture right here is um, a tub girder going to our Red Wing project so we utilized our high route um, out of our Melby Street facility and that included taking Star Avenue through the Eddy Lane intersection down to Mercury cutting out through North High School and getting out onto the North Crossing so that's a secondary route other secondary routes could include White Avenue to Anderson, and um, also going north up to Hogarth Street, and going out um, through the U.S. Bank area. However, we are limited on those routes due to length. Um, this picture here illustrates some of the longer bridge girders we have. Um, we're using steerable dolly equipment here. However, however, just the size of the intersections will limit us. Um, some of these bridge girders, the overall load tip of the tractor, the tail of the trailer, or any overhang um, do reach 180 feet. So that's why Melby Street is our primary exit. And I have a second question. Sure. How many, how many times do um, a truck pull this kind of heavy stuff each day? On a daily basis, it, it really varies. Um, we're strictly project-based. Um, on an annual basis, anywhere from 450 to 700 trucks a year. A so, year, right? A year. Okay. And that varies, you know, that, that's total truck count. That's anything from a flatbed to hmm. a super load such as this. Does that help? Thank you, Council Member. Further questions uh, this evening? I don't see any. Thank you for coming down again. Thank you. Is there anyone else here who would like to speak on this project, the uh, Melby Lane or, or, sorry, Melby Street or Eddie Lane projects this evening? Anyone else? You want to say a few words or no? Thanks for coming down, though. Well, uh, Council Member uh, Emmanuel. <laughs> Thank you, Acting President Worthman. I have a question that's probably best suited for staff. Okay. Um, and that is around, um, you know, I think the situation Mr. Uh, Solberg, the citizen Mr. Solberg <laughs> shared was uh, just around some logistical um, concerns, um, just to make sure that their loads are going through during um, possible reconstruction here. I'm wondering if um, staff has prepared or would be willing to um, work around, you know, their load? I'm sure the answer is yes. Um, so I think that would be helpful for our conversation. I know um, staff has done a really great job at being um, flexible with the businesses and residents before. So I'm sure that's no different here, but would be interested to hear more. Yeah, we all, um, we had a <clears throat> very significant reconstruction project on Melby Street going to the east a couple of years ago, um, as well as um, Menominee Street back in 2014 in front of a concrete girder plant. And um, we always work very well with, um, with the, the businesses that are in the area, as well as the businesses that go through it, our contractors that we use. Um, you know, not only are they, they good, they're good just because they're on our project, but they also, you know, are a community member and they work well with the other businesses. So um, it's very rare that we're not able to um, accommodate, you know, most of the businesses' um, requests. Sometimes, um, <clears throat> you know, if we know enough in advance, um, we can alter utility time. Sometimes businesses are able to alter their deliveries around when we know we'll be at those those rare moments where there is no other alternative, but um, 
I'm not aware of any in the last five years that uh, any projects where we've had any really significant um, um, dire impacts where we haven't been able to work through those. So mm -hmm. I, I would expect this will be the same. Thank you very much. Thank you. Any further questions? Either, I guess, of Mr. Silberg, anyone else? I see none. Thank you again, Mr. Silberg. We'll then move to our next item on tonight's agenda. This is a public discussion presentation uh, from the Housing Task Force. Number th item number three is a public discussion of the Chippewa Valley Regional Housing Task Force draft findings and recommendations. Mr. Allen, good evening. Good evening. Thank you, Acting President Worthman and members of the council. Good evening. Again, once again, good evening. Uh, appreciate the opportunity to share the uh, update, current uh, status, and findings and recommendations from the Chippewa Valley Regional Housing Task Force. Uh, just to kind of outline where I want to uh, uh, lead us here this evening uh, is through a brief history or background of the task force itself. Uh, walk through uh, each of the four task force meetings and some subgroup meetings. Uh, go through a kind of a shallow dive of data review uh, tonight, uh, and then walk through more specifically the summary, the recommendations, and findings uh, from the the task force itself. Again, uh, in that final draft version before you this evening, and then we'll uh, finish with a preview of, of what's next. Uh, certainly. Uh, then before turning it over to uh, any kind of public um, input or discussion comments here tonight. <coughs> Excuse me. The Regional Housing Task Force was launched in conjunction with the City of Altoona, uh, led by Mayor Brendan Pratt and uh, City Planner Josh Clements. Uh, the first meeting was back in June of last year. Uh, there we started working through kind of what's the uh, focus, purpose, and eventually goal of this group. Uh, I can kind of read through this here with you briefly. Uh, the focus was a voluntary assembly of stakeholders collaborating to better understand housing challenges, investigate solutions, and facilitate elevated cooperation. Uh, the, that led to kind of a purpose statement uh, to increase collective understanding of the housing market conditions and identify factors that are constraining housing affordability and contribute to elevating cost of living, investigate potential solutions, generate recommendations, and increase alignment around and collaboration in implementation. I uh, should note as well, a good point, good time to uh, point out where the group grew from its initial uh, humble beginnings uh, in June. Uh, we don't have to zoom in on all this, but I can just show you briefly. This is the uh, list, uh, what uh, I think Josh Clements refers to as the stakeholder engagement roster. Uh, we have nearly 80 participants and contributors over the last several months. So just wanted to highlight that in particular. So all this led to a goal statement. This is in the actual... Uh, summary of the findings and recommendations. Uh, this was a lot of uh, effort to put this together over several meetings with uh, that large group, that large roster, and just wanted to emphasize again, this is kind of that umbrella goal statement that led uh, to the findings and recommendations we'll go through here tonight. Uh, that is to provide, uh, well, the goal statement is fair and equitable, fair and equitable access to safe, quality, Healthy, stable housing for all individuals and families is critical for success in health, economic stability, education, and social mobility. Housing is a fundamental component of community vitality that affects the daily life and livelihood of all people. Disparities resulting from differences in race, ethnicity, income, and location must be addressed. So that was really the guiding statement moving forward with this task force. So moving ahead again through this, uh, this history, the second meeting occurred the end of 
August, so two months later, and it was just uh, literally a day or two uh, before that meeting that uh, the ALICE report findings came out. Again, Asset Limited Income Constrained Employed is that ac acronym for ALICE. Uh, provided roundtable discussions at the second meeting and posed, the, posed to the group a number of questions. Those included, what are the impediments and constraints to generating affordable workforce housing based on your profession? I can go back to that roster as well and talk about the variety of uh, backgrounds and professions that were represented and have been represented. How can we effectively collaborate and partner to improve supply? And then we asked uh, folks to list desired outcomes of progress and success and list desired indicators of progress and success. I can kind of go through some of those top uh, responses, but it leads into those findings and recommendations we'll get to here in just a few moments. Again, that ALICE data, what does that mean? What does it look like? Just a quick snapshot here. It's going to be a little bit hard to me pick all that up. <clears throat> but again, that asset limited income constrained and employed, these are households that earn more than the federal poverty level, but less than the basic cost of living for the county. In this case, we're highlighting Eau Claire County. Again, we included, since this is the regional group, we included uh, Eau Claire County, Chippewa County, and some data from Dunn County as well. So to point out, I just circled here, let's see if I can zoom in a little bit. There you go. Some of the numbers that uh, really wanted to draw your attention to. Uh, Acting President Worthman brought these to, to mind in the uh, opening uh, remarks with the state of the city. And I'm trying to read them as well. But 28% um, <laughs> is where we're at now. I just wanted to highlight that because that Alice number in the dark blue is, are those who are in that technical poverty level. Uh, the light blue are those that are outside of poverty or Alice. But again, um, it's a little bit hard to tell uh, graphically, but those, these numbers have been increasing since we've been seeing this data come out every two years back in 2010. So it's the fourth year in a row or fourth cycle in a row that those numbers have increased. And again, it shows you that 46% uh, are in Alice and poverty total. So it's everything below that light blue line. Also wanted to emphasize as well, we'll talk a little bit more about this here shortly. Uh, there's a, a subsequent study, more a national um, nature and kind of focused more regionally more than just county level, but uh, looked at wage rates, and the average wage being kind of state wage rate or even regional. Uh, you can see here that uh, Eau Claire itself is, uh, is falling behind or has fallen behind. So that, that's a key number to keep in mind because as we go through the data and have been going through the data, it's more than just you know, housing costs, but it's all these other mm -hmm. uh, components combined that add to uh, the difficulties that we've been identifying here in our studies. So again, <clears throat> getting into the data review a bit, uh, these are some of the numbers that we'll see in the final report. Thank you. I'm going to talk about uh, housing cost burden. These are uh, cost burden figures comparing homeowners to renters. And so I just wanted to highlight these are the number up above at the top row are those that are not in that Alice category. Uh, Others would be considered in that, if not even more so. These are highlighting those who are cost burden more than 50% of their income is going towards uh, their housing costs. And it's, uh, it's important to note that um, ownership, homeowners, uh, are only at 3%, but again, that's, uh, that's still troubling to know that uh, uh, folks who are homeowners are spending more than 50% of their income on their housing. But it's important to see that four times as many on the renter side are in that category as well. So to drill down a little bit more, I want to talk about housing costs and such related to ownership and then jump into kind of the rental side of things. So this is uh, pointing out mortgage rates uh, or, or housing, kind of monthly housing costs. Uh, the first group here, these first three red circles or ovals, are those with, uh, this is those with a mortgage. Down below are those without a mortgage. And just wanted to point out here that um, 
those, the kind of the, the largest group, nearly 50% of uh, homeowners are spending 1,000 to not quite 1,500 per month on their, their mortgage. The median there is about 1227. Again, this what we're showing here is kind of drilling down a little bit deeper into that Alice data, kind of what goes into the housing component of the Alice data. And again, you, you need to understand as well that that housing or the housing is just one component of what we see in the Alice data. There's transportation costs, health care, daycare in particular. Um, in Eau Claire, we've noticed is is a higher number as well. But this is the housing cost portion of that. And those without a mortgage are, are paying only 400 to 600. The majority are paying around that much uh, per month. And again, just shy of $500. Again, important to note that those with a mortgage are spending significantly more than those without. I'm going to jump into housing values because this plays a part in Again, um, house, housing costs, both in terms of sale, mortgage values, and things of that sort. <clears throat> I'll just highlight a few things here real quickly. Uh, approximately 70% of Eau Claire homes are valued between 100000 and 200000 these two largest categories here. Uh, I should mention Eau Claire is the dark orange or red, depending on how things are coming across on the screen. And the, the green line is kind of that regional average, including Altoona, Eau Claire, Chippewa Falls, and then the counties, Eau Claire County, Chippewa County. Further, 45% uh, of Eau Claire homes were built in three decades, 1970s, 80s, and 90s. Over 18% are 1970s vintage, and about the same, 70% are older than 1940. Uh, only 13% have been built in this century. Again, a lot of this is talking into, you know, what's our current inventory, what's available out there, what does the majority of our housing stock look like, and then again, comparing that to those housing values and how costs are associated to that. Again, just doing a little bit of a shallow dive into this for tonight, uh, but just, you know, ex explaining more of this and getting more into this uh, with the final report coming forward. Uh, another, just anecdotally, wanted to mention that uh, new home prices also are steadily increasing. So this is existing housing values, but you know, where are the new housing uh, costs going? And obviously they're going in this direction, more expensive. Uh, one anecdotal uh, example that was uh, shared with us was that of a 1,500 square foot single family home. Again, this is the price without the lots, without the property, which those numbers are also going up, uh, was going for about $181,000 in 2015. The same home three years later is over 206000 And so that's a 13.8% increase in just those three years. And again, a lot of that has to do with the cost of, of materials and labor and such, not just the fact that the market may be increasing as well. Uh, median home sale prices are also increasing to the most recent number, uh, depending on your data source, uh, being now over $171,000 in Eau Claire. So things are, um, are changing uh, more rapidly with, uh, particularly with single family home ownership as well. Again, going back to wages and home ownership, we'll get talking about the, the rental side here shortly. Uh, obviously this is impossible to read, but uh, what this is highlighting, this is one of the graphs in the, in the full report uh, that we'll be uh, moving forward to here soon. But uh, the, what this is showing is some data from our friends at uh, Cedar Corp help put together basically what, uh, based on your job, your median income in that job, again, this is all just generalized information, but it's very specific to the county, to Eau Claire County numbers. You know, what could be afforded in terms of your monthly rent, as well as then based on that, your average home price. And I just said, again, 171000 is about median, depending on your, your source, uh, it ranges from anywhere to 150 to 200. So that's kind of right in the middle. Um, but here, 123 is the average of the majority of, of uh, wage types, job types here in Eau Claire County. And that comes out to a monthly mortgage or rent of $903. And I can bounce back where I said 1227 is the median. So again, um, this is, very rough numbers, um, but the point being, 
monthly mortgage and that loan are both on the lower end of what's actually occurring out in Eau Claire County anyway. So jumping over to renters, should highlight as well that, uh, again, we're diving a little bit deeper into the, uh, the Alice numbers. And what this is showing here, too, is that uh, we've identified some additional data to go with that. And that's from the American Community Survey, which is through the US Census. Uh, so this is a five-year average uh, from 2017 data. It should also be known as a voluntary census survey. There's um, some margin of error in some of the numbers. So, but again, this is the best we have currently. And I'll talk a little bit more about that as we move forward to the summary of the recommendations and findings. So here we are with the, uh, the rental side in terms of housing costs. Uh, majority of folks can just establishing kind of a baseline, 63%, largest percentage, 500 to 1,000 is what they're paying in monthly rent. To go with that, these are, uh, again, talking about that Alice here, if you're spending 35% or more, I could highlight as well the 30 and above. So if we included both 30 and 35, these two lines, we're over 48% of renters are paying into that Alice range more than your affordability level of 30%. Talk a little bit more about that definition here shortly. So that's some just some baseline data, just to get us uh, our have heads focused a little bit as we move forward into the third meeting back on November 1st, where we broke down further and talked about uh, roundtable uh, discussions and different questions you identified there. Those included, uh, again, based on the information we'd already been gathering at the first two meetings, some of this data review. Again, this is the data I showed you is a little bit more updated from what we were even reviewing uh, last fall. But uh, that's, again, along the same lines of what we've been uh, collecting here through the last several months. So we asked uh, attendees, the stakeholders, uh, what changes to zoning or other local policies would you recommend and support to increase affordability, availability, and variety of housing? So we're talking about more specifically drilling down into uh, zoning, development regulations. What assistance or incentives would be most effective to generate affordable units? Again, starting to talk about the finance side. Uh, what methods should we pursue to acquire and assemble land for residential development and redevelopment? How can our cities, development firms, and nonprofits collaborate most effectively? Again, talking about public-private partnership concept. What information has not yet been obtained that may contribute to our collective assessment of housing? or inform prioritization of strategies. Again, that deep data dive. Uh, I'll point out as well later that we had over 48 pages of data we assembled um, to put into the final report, and there's plus some that we've kind of uh, uh, even uh, expanded since then. What other strategies related to affordable living conditions not directly related to housing should be investigated? So again, it's talking about what are the other components that go into the Alice uh, data that I mentioned as well. So, from there, we went into our uh, sector groups. So we broke out, and throughout November, we started breaking down to those different categories to get more information, more feedback, more input, and to really fine tune these different uh, areas of our different stakeholder groups. We had a lived experience and support agency group, builders and developers, zoning and policy and finance. Again, they met throughout November and gave us some feedback as well. It led into that final meeting back in uh, December where we fine-tuned some recommendations, reviewed and defined portions of the draft document, and then uh, started strategizing on the implementation side of things as well. So it was really out of that meeting three, between meetings three and four, that uh, we were able to put together this uh, summary of recommendations. But one last slide before we get into that. And I don't want to forget uh, concurrent efforts or a number of other things that are already going on, not to mention the work of uh, the Eau Claire um, Housing Authority, the Eau Claire County and Altoona Housing Authority. Uh, we've met with uh, folks at Dunn County. They had a community forum on housing back in October. Uh, the Joint Homelessness Initiative that's still ongoing with Aaron Healy came in through the Housing Authority and their partners in, November, in October. Of course, uh, the Affordable Housing Task Force and Porch uh, with the, the folks at Jonah. So with that, 
now we can start talking a little bit more of what's become of that. We're calling it an executive summary, summary of findings, summary of recommendations. Uh, this is essentially kind of the uh, preface uh, to the overall full report that uh, the group is still finalizing. I call this a draft, though, as well, because the group is looking to meet in mid-March to uh, finalize and fine-tune, perhaps even based on uh, comments and discussion here tonight. So, <clears throat> so with that, it was important to identify consensus statements from that group over the, again, we have over 80 different people from various backgrounds. Uh, it's important to come to some consensus on a number of basics. I can walk through each of those, uh, but again, the materials were included in your packet as well. Uh, we defined affordable and finally decided after a lot of hand wringing throughout this process, what does affordable mean? And it seemed most uh, appropriate to land on the more common or most common definition that is um, affordable housing is most typically defined as housing expenses that comprise no more than 30 percent of gross household income. So from there, we were able to build and define better our different housing segments, not just uh, generally, but more specifically uh, to the Chippewa Valley region. We identified homeless and very low income, income insecure, middle income, income secure, and then uh, three kind of uh, additional um, uh, aspects of perhaps each of those segments students, seniors, and people with disabilities. We then broke uh, down or talked briefly about income measures, so that's kind of speaking to the different data that I've already highlighted here uh, in terms of you know, what does Eau Claire County, Chippewa County, and others look like in terms of their uh, you know, different uh, job markets, segments, and wages related to that. And then housing data. So obviously talking about uh, some of the housing numbers already shared with you here tonight, just a real brief sample of that. And putting all those things together, we landed on five different categories as part of the summary recommendations. And again, this is based on discussions with the sector groups, uh, all those different round table discussions and questions we asked, able to to uh, sift this out and work down into these different uh, summary recommendation uh, buckets, if you will. So with that, I'm happy to walk through each of those. And what that gives us is uh, draft recommendations that what we call the comprise short-term tactics and long-term strategies for local units of government businesses, nonprofits, and engaged citizens to consider. A systems approach is required as no single solution exists to solve our existing housing challenges. I think that was the most obvious thing we identified right at the beginning is that there is no one single answer to solve any um, housing challenges that we've faced and all the uh, ancillary uh, issues that go, that go with that, wages uh, and other ALICE components. Uh, the recommendations are designed to reflect the combined priorities, insights, and creative ideas generated uh, through this discussion, uh, examination of publicized contemporary best practices, which we're still doing, and case study of examples that are yielding success in comparison communities. So these recommendations are presented with a variety of depth of detail and is generally understood that most will require further focused study and consideration before they are actionable. So what we call this is the assembled menu as presented does not include prioritization, so that's important to note as well. Uh, and from here, we're going to kind of shuffle these around and talk about starting tomorrow, perhaps, uh, with a work session, start talking about an actionable work plan as a result of these different recommendations. So it's critically important to propose recommendations that reflect the general consensus of the task force in order to reflect collective action. That's what we believe we've done here. We call this the kind of a 95% final draft. Uh, it is recognized that each jurisdiction uh, will consider their own actions based upon these recommendations and that non-governmental stakeholders will likewise weigh what their roles may be. So with that, the first one that we identified, kind of one of the biggest talking points was 
you know, what can we do, what do we have some control over? What are some things that can be modified uh, at the local level and perhaps speak to and address some of these issues? What, the first one, again, is that of development regulations. Uh, zoning is the primary tool utilized by local governments to regulate land use, intensity, character, and location development. Aside from the rising cost of labor and materials, zoning was the most frequently cited and discussed impediment and opportunity to increasing housing supply and affordability. City policies was the next. So again, these are things that, that we could wrap our hands around a little bit more easily right off the bat. Uh, cities utilize a variety of policies that directly and indirectly guide development decisions. The chief tool is the comprehensive plan which identifies the community's vision goals and also includes policy statements and future land use map. These plans are primarily implemented through development regulations, city budgetary decisions such as capital priorities as well as programs. And again, as, as we need to, we can go through these uh, sections individually, bullet by bullet if you'd like. Uh, the third on the list, uh, public funding and looking at financing from the public side versus we'll talk about public-private partnerships next. Uh, public funding, utilization of public funds to assist in the generation of affordable housing is often necessary. Some of these strategies and programs may function best and or set the stage for public-private partnerships, the fourth item in the list. Effective public partnerships between public, private, and nonprofit sectors are essential for achieving long-term community success. This dynamic is true for a healthy housing market that provides quality and affordable options for all residents. Uh, the last group is, I would say, kind of a, a catch-all, but those civic, so those uh, trying to be more collaborative in a civic nature and looking at uh, such things as uh, community-wide housing survey, um, organizing to improve public engagement in housing discussions, and what we've come to call turning NIMBY into YIMBY. So that's the civic part of that. So with that, um, I'll conclude with a couple other uh, what's next and uh, some questions, and we can go into more detail, if you'd like, on the actual summary. So what is next? Uh, the task force is looking to conclude its uh, final report uh, in mid-March through recommendation refinement, so any other input here perhaps that may add to that. Uh, report development, that final report, which I believe is up to 40-some pages, and I stand corrected, it's over 70-some pages of data right now. And then uh, finally finish off with some public presentations. Uh, the draft summary here we are tonight, uh, work session tomorrow, and should also note that the city of Altoona is going through the same process uh, with their city council on Thursday at their meeting there. Uh, next Monday, uh, looking to present similar information to the uh, Eau Claire Plan Commission. And then uh, the next day, looking to have uh, a similar just uh, informational presentation. Uh, no action, of course, scheduled there to the Eau Claire County Board, since they've been a part of, uh, Eau Claire County staff have been a part of this as well. And then uh, finally concluding with uh, City of Altoona Plan Commission on March 11th. So again, those are simply uh, presentations at those other plan commission and county board uh, but of course there are some public comment periods available at each of those as well uh, primarily at the Eau Claire County Board and the City of Altoona Plan Commission so from there we're looking at that policy and ordinance revision is what we call it but it's really looking at that work plan kind of where are we going to take this and put this to action and then finally um, and more specifically, I should say, talking about the policy and ordinance revisions, as we look at a work plan, providing a roadmap for short, mid, and long-range targets and action steps. And then finally up there, as you see, public-private partnerships and community collaborations. Uh, help ID local partners connect with investors, and some of those meetings are already happening and are ongoing. In fact, our new economic development manager has uh, set up a few of those as well already to talk about uh, uh, the funding um, a aspect through investors and IDing local partners through that as well. So with that, I can take any questions, but I wanted to just reference some of the materials here uh, just to, sh to highlight and share 
as you probably already readily aware that uh, there are a lot of other things going on related to this issue elsewhere, uh, locally, regionally, uh, statewide, and nationally as well. I wanted to point out the American Planning Association, of which I'm a member, and most uh, the city planners uh, in the area are, uh, is working on a new housing policy guide. And they are drafting that and have a draft for their member review this month as well, coincidentally. I also wanted to mention, talked about NIMBY to YIMBY. That's what this is, yes, in my backyard. And the Urban Land Institute just released this study as well and talking about how states and local communities can find common ground in expanding housing choice and opportunity. So this is not a new issue, obviously. It's becoming a more uh, prevalent issue uh, throughout the country. And just wanted to highlight some of those other materials out there that we've already been getting plugged into as we continue moving forward to that final report and final recommendations. Also wanted to highlight our friends at Cedar Corporation have uh, donated a lot of their time and expertise to put together a lot of the data that we've seen here already um, just tonight. So with that, I'll stand for questions. And again, happy to go through point by point, um, if need be, all those different uh, sections that we talked about, just highlighted real briefly earlier. Thank you, Mr. Allen. Appreciate the presentation, all of the hard work that's gone in over many months on bringing this forward. Are there council members this evening who have questions um, regarding the specifics, things that were in this report? Any questions? Councilmember Beaton. Thank you. Um, thank you, Mr. Allen. This is very exciting, much anticipated. Um, I, uh, I've been really impressed by the level of community engagement that this process has seen. Um, so thank you so much for um, to, to you and your partners for, um, for doing that. Um, I'm also really excited by the collaboration between the municipalities, between Altoona and Eau Claire. I know that um, big changes like this can often be a little, uh, we can be a little hesitant to do that because we don't want um, to create some undue competition between uh, municipalities. And so I was wondering um, what sort of continued collaboration will happen as we um, move into more policy change uh, time when, uh, when we start to impl implement some of these policies with the municipalities we've been working with? Sure, uh, very good question. I think uh, Josh Clements did uh, state it very well that, you know, at Altoona they understood that the housing market is more than just our individual municipalities. It's a regional animal that we need to wrestle with. And so that's uh, going to be ongoing regardless of, of how it's structured moving forward, if that makes sense. Uh, I know there's talk about uh, you know, housing committees and such. I think it's important to carry forward the work and energy and momentum from this task force. What that looks like is kind of up for debate right now. But you know, some sort of a working group uh, that can continue you know, looking at data, providing input, and just sharing ideas uh, certainly would be, would be uh, worthwhile. Thank you. Do you have a follow-up, council nope. member? Thank okay. you. Okay. Thank you. Further uh, questions from council? Council member Strobel. Um, thank you, Mr. Allen. Um, I didn't, um, I'm sure you, you probably got us that packet with all the statistics and stuff, but I didn't see it in, in my packet today, so I was wondering if, if certainly I could get it before tomorrow's meeting. I just, I'm sort of a statistics guy, so I'd like to kind of look all that stuff over. Sure, I'm happy to share the... Uh the PowerPoint from tonight with everybody. Uh, again, just as a, a quick introduction to some of the data that was, uh, that's going into the final report, but can certainly uh, provide that to everybody. We'll, we'll be talking through some of that in the work session tomorrow as well. Thank you. Do you have a follow-up, council member? And a follow-up to that, and I'm sure that somebody amongst all these people that participated probably asked this question, but one of the statistics, or two of the statistics that potentially could affect how we show up on this Alice report is uh, students. Um, so students pay a lot more rent. Um, you know, they, they may pay X amount per bedroom. And, and they also probably earn a lot less income. We have 10,000 students. How, how does that factor into our statistics? That could, that could affect us both ways on there. Mm -hmm. No, it's a, a very good point. I wonder if I can show some of that here. Uh, one of the numbers showed exactly that, that obviously Eau Claire has a, a higher percentage of rental um, occupancy than any of the other 
uh, Chippewa Valley uh, municipalities or counties. So I'm trying to see if I can see that here. But that's one of those data gaps that we're having to look at, and I'll talk more about um, moving forward, but uh, in the work session tomorrow. But it's one of those that we just don't have a lot of good information. As I mentioned, you know, these are numbers, for example, on the homeowner side. I'm trying to find the, uh, the rental piece here. But essentially, these are you know, five-year averages. These are voluntary surveys. They're just uh, the, the quality of the data. Uh, we're doing the best we can with what we have here. And this isn't really showing that, unfortunately. But uh, I think I maybe cut off where, where it showed. But we are 53% homeowner occupied and then 47% rental. So you're right. Of that 47%, we need to dive in a little bit deeper with that. And that's what I'm talking about as well, some of the different uh, housing segments. We wanted to specifically say moving forward, we need to study more uh, groups such as uh, seniors, uh, those with disabilities, and students. So all that to say, we don't have a lot of good data at this point to really drill down into, but it's something we need to review. So, so if our conclusions are based on the data and we don't have good data, um, and we're coming forth with a recommendation tomorrow, um, that, that's, that's hard for me um, to accept that we're, we're going to be doing the right thing based on actual results versus conception. Or, or I don't know if that's the right word, but um, I mean, how, how can we be making recommendations if we don't necessarily have the right data? That's a very good point, and I think what, what we'll see as we put together our, our work plan, and I'm coming forward with a pr proposal for a two-year work plan, is that we need to find better data because we can't implement a lot of these recommended policies and modifications without better data. So I think that's consistent with what we're seeing. Uh, certainly didn't want to come in here overselling that we have 35 recommendations that will solve everything and we just have half the data we need. Not at all. I think half of those recommendations will require better data. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member. Thank you, Mr. Allen. Yep. Further questions, Council Member Emanuel? <clears throat> Thank you, Acting President Worthman. And um, maybe I can add on to Council Member Shribble's inquiry that he had. Uh, I think, I'm not sure if this is what he means, but um, perhaps it would be helpful to clarify around the American Community Survey data set on if uh, there is an adjustment made with the student population, college student population. I know sometimes there is and sometimes mm -hmm. there isn't an adjustment. Sure. I think that actually would be able to help quantify um, if indeed the ACS data did include that adjustment for, for university students. Um, I have two questions that I wanted to, um, I guess, just bring into the fold, and I certainly do not expect any answers or not looking for them tonight, but I want to put them out there as um, two pieces that I think are really key to this. The first one, um, as mentioned in your goal statement, if you wouldn't mind plopping mm -hmm. that up. So in the second part, or maybe the last part of the goal statement, it talks about disparities resulting from differences in race, ethnicity, income, and location must be addressed. And so, you know, of course, we're talking about housing, and yet housing and a structure doesn't just stand alone. There's all these intersections of how this um, makes its way into somebody's life in our community. So I would be interested in hearing a little bit more about what can our community do to systematically help improve the disparities that often uh, affect people disproportionately along these lines. So that would be my first, first item I want to bring up. The second question is around, um, I guess maybe if I can just add in one last thing here. For me, I, I think that when we look at affordable housing, it's there's got to be this holistic approach. It's not just the home. It's the whole person. That's really important to me, and so I think some of this gets to that, but I guess I would bundle it up with uh, making sure we're taking a holistic approach um, in the community. 
And then the second question that I have is, um, you know, do you have any preliminary thoughts or suggestions of how we might identify measures and indicators of success and report on progress? And I know that that was stated that that's a goal in this effort and to figure out uh, how can we best do that so we can set some benchmarks, we can see if we're succeeding or, or not, uh, not making it and then adjust as we need to. Knowing there will be lessons learned along the way and it's not likely um, we'll get it right 100% the first time and that's okay. The, the important thing is to get a first step out the door. Dr. Allen? Okay. And respond to all of those, but uh, those are certainly great questions to uh, pass along as we move forward, uh, both with the finalizing the task force's work, uh, especially in regards to that goal statement. Are we addressing that appropriately and fully as we can in that final report? Uh, and then that uh, obviously holistic approach that was certainly one that that came out very early and often with the uh, the task force work, which is why we brought in all those and focused on those different sector groups to make sure that we are addressing those different components that uh, play into housing. In terms of the uh, strategies, kind of the measurement strategies, that's a very good point. I think we've tried to highlight those in a basic sense in uh, throughout the summary recommendations. Just thinking of one um, specifically here was we talk about you know, evaluating, evaluating existing policies, uh, you know, prioritizing um, different redevelopment areas and implementation programs. These are just things under city policies, for example. Uh, we tried to refine the comments as we ask these questions, and they can be perhaps a little bit too summarized, so we're hopefully can drill down a little bit better in that final report as well. Thank you. Further questions <clears throat> council may have on this? Council Member Strobel? I just uh, just one thing, and maybe this would help um, address Council Members Emanuel's question on the measurement thing. Something we get currently um, that might be used as a measurement um, is the, the building permits. Mm -hmm. um, one, of, one of the biggest reasons we, the housing costs are high is we have a shortage, shortage of housing, right? So we get those every month or year, um, new home construction in, this, in the city and also the, um, the apartments. Um, those are statistics that are pretty measurable. So if we're trying to lower the cost and we see an increase in building, that seems like it would be uh, something we could use. Very much so. And I'm trying to find as we're talking here uh, some of those uh, better examples than what I've been giving here as well. But yes, that's certainly one we're looking at. Uh, one of the action items, not to uh, you know, be a spoiler here, but I, you know, we're going to be looking at uh, you know, housing inventory as well, just setting better baseline standards some of these data. Again, we're relying on a lot of external sources. And is there anything that we can identify and provide ourselves, again, building permits being one of those, uh, that we can um, set some better baselines and framework for moving forward rather than just relying on you know, five-year voluntary summaries like ACS? Absolutely. Any more questions? Are we open for public comment? See any? Thank you again. All right. Uh, Thank you. Mr. Scott Allen, and as you know, we have our work session Look tomorrow to as well. Tomorrow so as well. Maybe some additional questions uh, between now and then. So. Certainly. Thank you. Then uh, we're going to open up this evening for public comment on this issue. If folks, again, would be able to approach the podium and please state your name and address uh, and, and keep your remarks to five minutes, that would be wonderful. Good evening. My name is Janet Fraze, and I live at 2516 East Princeton Avenue. I just want to thank the council and the staff for looking into this problem because it's such a big problem in our city as, as it is in many cities. I'm here tonight to encourage the city to establish an, an affordable housing advisory committee. I want to quote Paul K. Chappelle, who is a peace literacy ed educator. Paul, uh, he says, charity is not and should not be the system to solve inequality. Charity is the painkiller. It helps, but doesn't solve the problem. Eau Claire has an active, responsible, responsive, charitable system. 
Still, the waiting lists are one to two years for affordable rental housing that is based on income. We have over 300 children and families that do not have secure, consistent housing. The solution is often motel rooms for those on waiting lists and when the shelters are full. This is an expensive patch to the problem and often not very good environment for our children and families. In a 2018 survey that our city county health department did on a regular basis, but in 2018 they again for the second survey identified mental health as the top area of, a con of concern. It's difficult to be healthy, both mentally and physically, when you don't have a place to live, a place that's safe and meets basic human needs. <clears throat> if we listed the costs of taking care of the problem that result from the, the lack of housing in one column, and you list the costs of pre preventing the problems in the second column, I really believe that we would find the second column costs equal to or less than the first column. A healthy democracy requires the discipline of laws and regulations to provide the solutions, not charity. Charity is a very short-term answer. So a city affordable housing advisory committee is a way to begin a sustainable solution, a sustainable system to solve the problem. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Reyes. Any, any questions? questions? I don't see any. Thank you again for sharing. My name is Lee Hennick. I live at 3150 Runway Avenue. Good evening. And unfortunately, I could take an hour talking about this, but I only have five minutes. I recommend the council start addressing the rules that, that, that the state has put on cities to take control away from their ability to affect things in any way you can. This is one of 100 ways we can start moving forward. But if we get control back at our local city levels and not be dictated at Madison, we have more options. So I just one solution I wanted to say. Thank you. Thank you. Excuse me. My name is Mary Prosnick. I live at 4603 Putter Drive in Eau Claire. I'm recommending to council that um, they appoint an affordable housing <clears throat> advisory committee for the city or the region. Um, as Scott has said, I've been on the housing task force here for the last few months. There's over 80 stakeholders that are involved in a lot of ideas that come through, and it's hard to manage all those. Having an affordable advisory task force, or sorry, an affordable housing advisory committee would allow people from the community, stakeholders who specialize in different areas, be able to make recommendations to council and city staff based on their specialties, their experience, whether it's through their professional um, through their professional lives, whether they work in affordable housing, maybe it's through real estate, maybe it's because they're in banking, or just citizens in the community who are directly affected by the shortage. Um, that, that committee can, can bring different um, insight, whether it's regarding zoning, regulations, <clears throat> um, how to address the funding sources for it. The last couple, well, I'd say the last four weeks or so, I've spent so much time working with WIDA. We've spoken in different nonprofits, Impact 7, what it takes to go through to get even funding for affordable housing. And it's overwhelming to say the least. It's not an easy solution. It's not like, oh, we should build affordable housing. Of course, that sounds like a great idea. It doesn't happen that way. It takes time, just the application process alone to get approved for some of the funding is, it's really intense and it's really stressful. It requires developers to put up a lot of money and possibly get a no at the end of it. So again, it's just really important to have a committee that can make recommendations to kind of help guide you guys make those right solutions for our area. So I would just like to make that recommendation. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. I have a cold, so forgive me in advance. Acting President Worthman and honorable members of the City Council, um, my name is Susan Wolfgram. I live downtown at 550 Graham Avenue. I'm a member of the Chippewa Valley Affordable Housing Task Force and the co-chair of the Jonah Affordable Housing Task Force. For those of you that don't know, Jonah stands for Joining Our Neighbors in Advancing Hope. 
The mission of our task force is to facilitate culture change in Eau Claire City and County so that all stakeholders are informed about the lack of safe, good quality, affordable housing and are motivated to take actions to address it through public and private initiatives. We seek to facilitate a culture in our city of community benefit that all of us together, including but not limited to the city council, city staff, developers, lenders, re realtors, business owners, entrepreneurs, investor groups, nonprofits, faith community foundations, community advocates, and those with lived experience, our stakeholders and sitting at the table in meeting the needs of all of our residents, our neighbors. We all benefit when we close gaps of inequality and the research supports that it's also cost effective in the long run. The stakeholder approach of the Chippewa Valley Affordable Housing Task Force was one of collaboration, but most of all from my perspective, it demonstrated the will to meet the housing needs across the affordability spectrum from those without a home to middle income families who are in need of affordable single family homes, including but not limited to hourly workers in the service, hospitality and technical sectors, those who care for our children and our elderly, teachers, firefighters, police officers, correctional officers, students, and many other public servants, as well as those who work in the nonprofit sector. We are in support of all recommendations as well as, um, excuse me, put forth by the task force and would be happy at a future date to respond to any questions regarding specific recommendations. Our task force is currently collaborating with three developers in supporting their efforts to build affordable housing in our city and the Chippewa Valley. It is always about relationship, trust, collaboration, creativity, but most important from the jump, it's about the will. Our task force has recommended from the beginning that the city council institutionalize an affordable housing advisory committee, similar to the sustainability advisory committee that would advise our city in forming an intentional and strategic long-term work plan for meeting the affordable housing needs of all our neighbors in Eau Claire, but focusing on the 46% who are the most vulnerable, are housing insecure. These numbers include many of the hourly employees that our thriving business community depends upon, and also children, seniors, and disabled adults. According to HUD, a family with one full-time worker earning the minimum wage cannot afford the local fair market rent for a two-bedroom apartment anywhere in the United States. In Eau Claire, the average two-bedroom and medians are better um, to use, but we, we have averages more often is $800, you would need to make approximately $15 an hour working full time to afford this two bedroom if you're only spending 30% of, um, of your income on rent. Our minimum wage is $7.25 an hour. That's not even half, and many of our jobs are not full time. We listen in our task force to many of the people that we work with in the 46% who tell us that they cannot afford more than $400 a month without giving something essential up. So in closing, we all know about the challenges of increasing affordable housing stock in the city. We know it is complicated and that there is no more state inclusionary zoning developer mandates. I do not believe that we need to infuse any additional energy in that conversation. Let's put our collaborative energy into what is already happening, a will of all stakeholders to meet the affordable housing needs of our community members. The Jonah Affordable Housing Task Force is ready to collaborate in the design and membership of the Affordable Housing Advisory Committee. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Wolfram. Questions? Councilmember Emanuel. Thank you, Acting President Worthman. Uh, thank you, Ms. Wolfram, for um, showing up and helping to elevate this conversation. Uh, I had a conversation with um, Councilmember Emily Anderson, who sends her regrets for not being able to be here. Um, but she asked if I can pass along a question that perhaps you might be able to speak to. Um, it's really around, uh, do you know or have people in Jonah or through your research come across information on the uh, impact, adverse, I'm assuming adverse impact to children on uh, lack of affordable housing and or having to be transient um, during yes. their formative years. Have, have you mm -hmm. come across any research or have any thoughts about yes. that? <laughs> so I don't want to take up a lot of time because I know that other people want to speak and it's getting late. 
um, we're, we, we are given that question a lot. And so there is an entire body of literature. It's called The, the Impact of Affordable Housing on Families and Communities, a, a Review of the Evidence Base in 2014. I had earlier sent that body of literature to the council and I would be happy to send it again. So just, just in summary, so I'm just gonna state a couple things here because I carry this with me because people often ask me, okay. So, so I'm just gonna say a little and then Samantha Greinke, a person with lived experience with children who have been impacted by multiple moves and the lack of affordable housing, she's, she's here to speak as well. So forms of housing instability such as homelessness, multiple moves, or overcrowding, poor housing quality, and high housing costs relative to income are associated with health risks for children such as general poor health, asthma, low weight, developmental delays, and increased lifetime risk of depression. Access to decent affordable housing would provide critical stability for these families and lower the risk that vulnerable families become homeless and reducing frequent family moves. So just two, two more things I'll add. Housing st in instability can seriously jeopardize children's performance and success in school and contribute to long-lasting achievement gaps. Quality affordable housing helps create a stable environment for children contributing to improved educational outcomes. Researchers have found that when families do not have enough income left over to cover the rest of their household budget, children experience poorer health outcomes lower levels of engagement in school and emotional and mental health problems. Families are also less likely to be able to afford the food they need for a healthy and active life. This is of course known as food insecurity. There are many, many other pieces of data and I have all of that for you. And I'd be happy to send that body of evidence-based literature to you again. But I would like to invite, if it's okay, I'd like to invite Samantha Greinke up to share her lived experience in terms of her children that are impacted, if that's okay. Yes. Council Member Strobel. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Did you want? Did you have an objection to? Well, I, I had a question. That request. For, I had a question for Ms. Wolfgram before the next speaker. Oh, okay. Is that okay, Ms. Wolfgram? Well, of course. Yes. Okay. I'd be disappointed if I didn't ask you. Absolutely. A question, so. um, you know <laughs> what? I'm sh shots fired. It's okay. To <laughs> <laughs> well, you usually you seem to like you have the answers there, so I think you're the right person to ask this question. You you mentioned, and I I just caught part of it, but you mentioned the uh, average rent was like eight hundred dollars, and mm -hmm. it would take that individual making fifteen dollars an hour, x amount of time. My question for you on that is. <clears throat> Is, is that considering that person would be potentially a married person or would potentially having a roommate? Or is that just an individual? It's an individual. So if that person had a roommate or, or a spouse to share those expenses, it would, it would have that amount, correct? Yes. Okay, thank you. Yes. Thank you. Good evening. Uh, okay, Samantha Granke. My address is 1129 and a half Barland Street. Okay. Claire. Um, okay, so in January of 2016, I was accepted into treatment court, um, AIM court more specifically. Um, I was released in um, February of 2016. Um, I had nowhere to go, but treatment court offers you um, kind of like a halfway house. Um, it's called the Smith House, it's on the west side. They charge 30% um, of your income. Well, I had just gotten out of jail, so I had no income. Therefore, my rent was $600, which um, the other females I was there with, they were getting SSI. Their checks were $900 a month, so they paid 270 so that really didn't make much sense to me. Um, they did waive my first month rent, um, but that still left me with a $3,000 balance that I had to pay in full before I could graduate um, AIM Court. Thankfully, I have family that helped me with that. Um, so that was for six months, and then um, after that, my only option was to move in with my sister-in-law. Now, she lived um, in an upper um, on Eddy Street on the way to Mount Simon. Um, it was a one bedroom. Currently living there were um, two kids and an adult, and then 
me, my son, and my son's father moved in there, so that made it three kids, three adults. Then that was for um, a period of seven months. And for one month of that period, there were six adults, six children living in that apartment. It was less than ideal. It was um, probably the worst situation I've ever lived in, but I had no other choice. I had a record, I had no job, and um, that was all I had. Um, but thankfully, um, a friend of mine was moving out of her father's trailer, so I was able to move in there. He was willing to rent to me and my family. Um, I lived there for 18 months, still actively looking for somewhere to live, but with a record and um, very little income, it was hard to find somewhere that was affordable for two adults and a four-year-old. Um, but after being there for 18 months and being at my job for a period of time, I um, found a place on Facebook, private landlord. I got um, a letter of recommendation from my probation officer, from my um, human resource manager at my work, and from my current landlord. And um, these people accepted me, and that is where we currently live. It is a two-bedroom upper. It is $690, and there are, um, it's me, my son's father, and we have two sons now, five-year-old and a six-month-old. It is not nearly big enough, but he makes um, $16 an hour full-time. I make $15 an hour full-time, and we live paycheck to paycheck. It's really hard. Um, so once again, we are going to look for something bigger, but... You know, I, there's not going to be much out there for us. Um, and like Susan said, um, had my son been in school in this time where I was in the treatment house or um, living with my sister-in-law, the instability of the routine and um, what, <laughs> um, the routine for him and the stability for him going to school, that would have been really hard, I think, for him. Um, right now, he goes to Flynn. He loves it. He is very successful, and he's just in kindergarten, but um, he does really well. And it's because we have that place to live. But once again, we're going to have to find something bigger and better. Thank you. Thank you for sharing. Yeah. Questions for Ms. Uh, Granke this evening? See any. Thank you again for coming. My name is Judy Mosley. I live at 2230 Trimble Street here in Eau Claire. I am a member of the, uh, I'm, I'm the co-chair of the Jonah Affordable Housing Task Force, and I'm also an area real estate agent um, working in residential real estate in Eau Claire. 30 years ago in Eau Claire, I was a divorced mom with a house full of young kids and I was working full time. And if I received a little bit of child support now and then, I was grateful for it. And it was awfully tough to keep a roof over our heads. What didn't go for housing went for child care and transportation and food. And there was nothing left over after that. So, you know, I've, I've been there, done that. And I did what we hope will happen for, for families in these situations. My life improved. I worked hard. I, I got better jobs. I got better housing. My children went to school, relieving me of a little bit of the child care costs. And I got remarried quite a few years later. And I got remarried to a man who owned his own home. It made a huge amount of difference in our lives. And it's one of the things that's always impressed me about um, you know, different ways that people can improve their lives. And being able to own your own home is one of those things that really makes a difference for families. 
the amount of stability that it injects into your life is just, it, it's phenomenal. So all these years later, you know, uh, my, my husband and I have, have um, empty nested for the most part, <laughs> uh, but we have adult children who struggle. And I remember 30 years ago, the city of Eau Claire having to send CBD, no, let me get the, the, the initials right, the Community Development Block Grant money, had to send money back to the federal government without using it here in Eau Claire because the NIMBY response was so strong in the neighborhoods that the housing authority couldn't do what that money was intended for. So they had to send it back. And at the time, I was so upset about that that you know, it just seemed like a phenomenal waste to me. And here we are 30 years later and I kind of feel like things haven't improved that much for families in our community. I have a 28-year-old son who's autistic. He works two jobs so that he can pay his bills. At least two-thirds of his income goes for housing costs. One of the things that you find when you really start um, uh, doing the research on affordable housing is that it's linked to so many other things. And one of the things that affordable housing is linked to is transportation. So my 28-year-old son lives on the upper west side of Eau Claire because that's where he can find housing that he can afford. He works downtown at a local hotel. And when I suggested to him that uh, he might want to find housing closer because he's spending an hour and a half of his day on buses going back and forth to work. And I suggested, gee, you might maybe look at housing closer to downtown. And he was the one that pointed out to me that that's not an affordable option for him. That the housing that has developed in the downtown area is way out of his price range. So, you know, you find that these things are kind of linked and we haven't necessarily gotten better in the last three decades about taking a look at any of them. So I would like to really urge you all to take a real good look at all of the information that this task force has put together as well as the recommendations. And the important part isn't that we have perfect data or that we have perfect solutions or that we have perfect recommendations. The important part is that we do something. We can't afford another three decades of not doing something. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Ms. Mosley. Who would like to speak this evening on this presentation? Any other others who would like to speak? Good afternoon, my name is Brandon Buchanan. I live at 1435 and a half Summit Street. I wanna thank you all for um, having this task force that was convened and for taking the time to have this public hearing and for the possible actions that you are considering taking. Um, I'm speaking to you here today as a member, an elected member of the Eau Claire County Board. I wanna first welcome all of you to our county board chambers. Um, I sit actually right over there, right behind um, Terry. Um, I serve rep as a representative for District 27, which is just south of Birch Street and across Hastings Way up and over to where the North Crossing is. I represent from Eau Claire residents from all walks of life, but in particular, a number of my constituents are what you would call lower income. The folks that are identified by that Alice report that are just one medical bill away or one $400 car payment from not being able to make rent. So it is on their behalf that I wanna thank all of you for giving us this space and for possibly taking that action to address this very serious issue. The reason why I'm speaking here today is because I wanted to address one very specific concern that I have heard from some in our community or one specific complaint. I've heard that from some that city council should not be addressing this issue, that poverty or affordable housing are not the purview 
of local government. Some have said, I hope when I hear 300 children are homeless, I hope there's a church that can help them because that's not government's role. I don't want my taxes helping those people. I could argue a moral argument about that, but I'm not going to. Instead, what I want to say is, guess what? If you aren't willing to pay for it now, your taxes are still going to pay for it in the future. How do I know this? Because in addition to being a member of the county board, I'm also a member of the Judiciary and Law Committee. Right now, as we're sitting here, our county is looking into considering whether or not to expand our jail to build a fourth pod in this very building that we are all sitting in here tonight. That will cost us well over $5 million to flush out and $2 million a year just in additional staff. But that's just the cost of the jail expansion. Why am I bringing up the jail expansion? Well, because as we heard earlier tonight from Acting President Worthman and from so many other studies, if you know your neighbors, you're less likely to have crime. If you have a stable place to live, it's called housing first. If you have a stable place to live, you can integrate in society. You can get the help you need. It's a whole lot easier to find a job. It's a whole lot easier to keep that job if every single night you know where you're going to sleep. So if you aren't willing, the royal you, not this body, I know this body's interested in taking action, but for those of you out there listening who don't think this is government's role, that you don't want your tax dollars being spent on it, you will be. And it's gonna be a whole lot more expensive and it's gonna be a whole lot less humane. So thank you all for being willing to take action. And that's all I had to say. Thank you, Supervisor Buchanan. Thank you for coming down this evening. Are there further comments from those this evening uh, on this presentation? We just heard. Anyone else want to make a few comments? <laughs> Podium is yours. Anyone else? Seeing no further desire to speak on this item, I'm going to close it. Appreciate again the work of Mr. Scott Allen. Uh, and all of the task force in the presentation, and thank you again for uh, everyone who came to be a part of this discussion this evening. We're going to move to our next item, which is a public discussion on an ordinance amending Chapter 6.14 entitled The Keeping of Honeybees, Code of Ordinances of Our City of Eau Claire. This, this item has been, was postponed from our January 21st and 22nd, 2019 Council meeting, and this evening we have Ms. Stromberger joining us to share the details. Good evening. Good evening, thank you. So these are changes um, proposed following the study issue that was um, before council at your January 7th meeting, uh, which was previously postponed from your October 23rd, 2018 meeting. Um, so just to highlight briefly those changes that were made following the study issue. Uh, most notably, um, public space beekeeping was removed from this draft of the ordinance as well as changing um, the notice and objection requirements. So in this current draft, um, notice will be given to anyone within 50 feet of an applicant's pro proposed hive location and to all adjacent properties. If anybody gets that notification, they have the right to object to the issuance of a license. And a license will be denied if either at least 40% of those notified choose to object or if somebody who is notified um, has a medically documented allergy. So um, the other changes um, to the ordinance you've seen a couple of times already. So. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Stromberger. And are there questions from council on these proposed changes to the beekeeping ordinance? Council Member Weld. President, uh, just clarification on those that can apply. Is it uh, a tenant or a property owner? And does the tenant need the property owner's permission? A tenant could apply, but they would need the owner's permission to do so. I believe the application form has a sign-off for the property owner to do that. Okay. And then the notice then is sent to the neighboring properties. Um, is that sent to the owner of the property? And under so the, the address you have on record for the owner, is it? Correct. Under this proposed draft, notice would go to the address of record for that property, which, if it's a landlord, isn't usually that same address. But we would also send it to that address so that the occupant would get notice as well. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember. 
Any other questions? Councilmember Emmanuel. Thank you, Acting President. Um, I have a question that might fit under um, E, under 614-030. Um, my question is around the necessity to have an annual license. Um, and the reason, I'll give a little background on why I'm asking about that. Um, I serve um, on the League of Wisconsin Municipalities um, Public Policy Advisory Committee along with your colleague, Mr. Nick. And uh, one of the things the League is interested in looking at is uh, recommending a change in state law for uh, dog licenses um, to go from one year to perhaps three year license. So it got me to thinking, well, one, I had never thought of that idea, <laughs> but two, then um, I guess when we have these annual licenses, is that something that we have to follow by state or is that driven here by the municipality? So for this um, topic, I'm wondering, are we uh, confined to an annual license or is that something that the city can consider to make it a multi-year license? The city does have uh, discretion to create a longer license if it would choose to do so. Um, currently, the only one that I'm aware of that's longer than that is a bartender license. That's a two-year license. Um, but I believe the health department has reasons as to why they would want it to be an annual license. I see Ms. Ms. Kesey is very adamant about that. Um, if you would like to hear reasons, I'm sure um, either herself or Mr. Steinbach would be willing to speak to that. If the, if the acting president would allow, I think that would be very helpful. Mr. Steinbach. Matt Steinbach with the health department. Um, the biggest reason for the annual license would be the opportunity for people um, to object um, to, for especially for due to changes in neighbors. Um, we have a rotation there and to have that one-time opportunity neighbors change from year to year and if someone would move in with a with a severe allergy to bees that that would provide an opportunity for them to make us aware of that and object if I can have a follow-up please sure. thank you thank you for that information is there any uh, stipulation that would allow let's say mid-year a neighbor moves in has a severe allergy that the license could be revoked or even if they're there for six months it can't be considered that is a, a great point it's not specifically mentioned in the ordinance um, I don't know what our limitations would be with that I have seen similar um, language in other ordinances um, but there are complaint based um, opportunities but that would kind of fall out of the lines of that I don't know if you want to weigh in on that okay I can just have one last follow-up. So it seems that um, perhaps the, the main driver to have this annual license would be really driven by um, potential um, allergy and health reasons. Yes, another would be that um, if there was a issue with um, an apiary and there were a lot of nuisance issues, that that would provide an opportunity for neighbors who may be consented at the origin to express those concerns and object in, in later years. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Steinbach. Thank you, Ms. Stromberger. Do council members have questions of either Mr. Steinbach or Ms. Stromberger this evening? Further questions? Council member Strobel. Um, Ms. Stromberger, um, I, uh, I see that we took out the uh, bees in the public park section and I'm, I'm really, uh, happy about that but my other question is number five and ten on here I'm still trying to figure out on those large parcels uh, it doesn't seem like those would necessarily be residential parcels but parcels but um, up to up to 49 acres could have 49 hives um, where where are we still envisioning something like that occurring Maybe the health department wants to chime in on this one as well, but um, the reason that we are adding those larger acreage exemptions is we've had inquiries from, say, schools that have large amounts of property um, and are capable of, of hosting larger hive or more hives than the ordinance currently allows. So this accommodates those requests. And for those, would there still be protections for the the neighbors or maybe the users nearby? 
There are, there's still, um, there are large acreage um, ex exceptions, I guess the word would be. Um, but if they're 200, is it 250 200. feet um, from a property line, then they're um, exempt from some of the other requirements. Um, and obviously 250 feet is a much greater distance than um, what we're requiring of the smaller properties. Take a follow up. Just one more follow up then. So it, let's let's say it's uh, it's on school grounds. Um, I mean, the city is sort of saying in here what, what type of uh, um, enclosure you have to have um, and all that. Would you still, even though it's school grounds, would we still have some type of um, input into the type of enclosure or safety that there would be along those hives? Or is that now out of our purview? I guess I defer to health as to what um, specifications they require for a, for a hive, um, but enclosures wouldn't necessarily be required. It's public space. Yeah, it's, it's not a it's not part of the ordinance itself. The enclosures um, that we were talking about pre at previous meetings were focused on public park spaces. Um, there's not a requirement for residential. Um, uh, or other zoning areas to have a um, in fully enclosed um, apiary. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Councilmember Strobel. Thank you, Mr. Steinbach, for answering that question. Are there further uh, questions on the ordinance this evening? Further questions? I don't see any. Thank you again for your work and your presentation. Going to then open this item up for public comms conversation. This is again the item four on our agenda, the keeping of honeybees, uh, specifically amending chapter 6.14. Is anyone here this evening who would like to speak on this issue? Anyone here would like to speak on this particular issue? Seeing none, we will then close the public comment period for that item, item number four, and move to item number five. This is a public discussion on an ordinance which would create chapter 5.64 titled Dockless Bicycle Share and amend section 10.08.100 entitled Parking. This evening, uh, this presentation is going to be done by uh, Mr. Pat Ivory and Ms. Stromberger. Welcome. Good evening. Uh, good, good evening. Uh, tonight is the public discussion on the ordinance that would establish uh, licensing provisions for companies that would op operate a uh, dockless bike share business within the city. Uh, I'm going to provide a little brief background information regarding what a dockless bike uh, share operation is, and then Janessa is going to talk about the specifics of the ordinance that you'll be considering tomorrow. Uh, Leah Ness from Engineering, who's kind of in the back back there. Uh, from engineering uh, has also been very involved with the development of the ordinance and some of the research, so she might be available for some questions tonight also. So first, in terms of what is the dockless bike share uh, operation. Got to zoom in here. There we go. A, uh, a uh, dockless operation is a self-activated bicycle rental operation that utilizes mobile technology, and typically it's your smartphone, uh, to provide a shared use for bicycles either for recreation or provide uh, transportation, an alternative for people uh, to get from one location to another. Uh, bike share operations aren't particularly new. Uh, they got their started in the United States back in 1994 in the Oregon area, and then they actually started in, the, in Europe, uh, so they've been around for, for many years. Even though they got started in 1994 in Oregon, it still took quite a while for it to migrate over into, into the Midwest area. Uh, many of the staff members uh, became familiar with the concept of the bike share programs back in 2014 uh, when Councilperson Emmanuel uh, uh, sent an email to staff regarding programs regarding uh, bike share, particularly uh, those that were operating over in Chicago. I think that became, uh, came from a conference that she had attended. Uh, following that year, a student from the University of Eau Claire uh, prepared a research paper discussing the feasibility of a bike share uh, implementation within the city of Eau Claire. 
in that paper, basically the conclusion was at question whether it was feasible to do that within the city back at that time. And that was uh, looking at a particular type of uh, uh, bike share that I'll explain a little bit in, in terms of what the use would be at that time. Uh, since that time, the UWEC Student Senate has indicated an interest in a bike share uh, and staff and representatives of the community Organizations have met with a couple different bike share companies such as uh, Zagster and B-Cycle uh, that have indicated an interest in coming to Eau Claire. Uh, at that time, they were looking at a docking style of a system, and I'll kind of explain that in, in just a minute here. Uh, in recent years, there's been a lot of changes in the bike share industry uh, with the initial programs being those docked type of programs and now they're moving to what's called the, the dockless spike share operations and they're becoming more popular. This is a example of here of one of the uh, of one of the dock the, uh, the docking style types of, of bike shares. Uh, the primary drawbacks of the docking system has really been their cost. Uh, our meetings with vendors over the years uh, for the docking systems have indicated that the startup costs for these types of systems are in the thousands of dollars for the installation of the docking stations. And then typically the vendors will require the municipality to be involved with the maintenance and the operation of these systems too. Uh, so based on the meetings that we've had, uh, there's been really no organization or no city interest really in stepping forward and taking uh, responsibility for that sponsorship and for that ownership of, of the program. So that leads us to the, the, the dockless type of a system. And here's a photo here showing some line bikes. Basically what a dockless system is, it's that the, the rental bikes, but there is no docking system. The bikes just are really parked uh, at specific locations, just basically standing up uh, using a kickstand. So there's no really uh, uh, docking mechanism that, that's involved with it. Uh, the advantage of this system that limits the cost of the city, and they're really, in, in most cases, there is little, little to no commitment in terms of having to maintain or operate the system. It primarily is the responsibility of the vendor or the company that is operating it. Uh, so that brings us to this past fall. Uh, the city received a formal request from the University of Eau Claire Student Senate asking the city to prepare and adopt an ordinance that would allow for the operation of a dockless bike share within the city. And the city manager, uh, Dale Peters, directed staff to uh, develop a ordinance for consideration to address this request of the university. So at that direction, a staff committee uh, representing various departments has met uh, and researched uh, the bike share operations in other communities and prepared an ordinance that would allow for the licensing of companies that could operate a bike share within the city of Eau Claire. Uh, the departments and divisions uh, that re represented on this committee included someone from uh, finance, uh, city attorney's office, uh, the police department, engineering, community services, planning, and economic development. Uh, the ordinance that you have before you tonight, uh, we have presented this in, uh, to the Student Senate and to the Bicycle and Pedestrian Advisory Committee, uh, and both of those groups uh, seem to support the ordinance uh, as we have it drafted and that you'll be considering tomorrow. Uh, Leah also sent a copy of the ordinance to a number of potential uh, vendors or companies that operate dockless shares uh, to get their input to see if we were kind of on the right track with this ordinance. And uh, we didn't really get any real uh, good response back. Uh, basically, a number of responses indicating thank you for sending the ordinance out, uh, but they didn't really wish to provide much comment. So we really didn't get much negative or positive feedback uh, back from the vendors at that point in time. Uh, a couple questions that you might have that I just want to kind of address before we get uh, any further is, uh, is does this particular ordinance uh, uh, cover or include uh, motorized scooters? There's been a lot of uh, information in the media over in recent years, uh, in recent months uh, in cities, uh, both uh, good and bad in terms of the operation of motorized scooters. Uh, this ordinance does not 
uh, allow for it does not include the, the provision for the operation of motorized scooters. The reason for that is that state law currently in Wisconsin does not allow motorized scooters to be operated on city streets. So that's why we don't have this included in the ordinance. Hmm. Uh, we have heard talk in Madison that there is some discussion that this might be addressed in the next, uh, in the upcoming months in terms of how motorized scooters uh, would be handled or not. Uh, if that is changed in Madison, then we might come back and revisit that in terms of whether that would be something we want to, to look at or not. But currently, right now, that's not part of the ordinance. Uh, secondly, how does the uh, dockless bike share work? Uh, essentially, uh, the bikes are placed in designated locations uh, each morning. Uh, our ordinance here would allow for the bikes, uh, would be, there would be a requirement that they have to be at least at two city locations. And the, the vendor could also then contract with uh, the private sector or with the university or the Chippewa Valley Technical College for other locations. And we would fully anticipate that a vendor would work with the university and have one or two or more locations on campus where they would have uh, these uh, bikes available in, in the morning also. Uh, the bikes contain uh, electronics and GPS tracking, so you need a smartphone in order to operate that. Uh, you would download an app on your phone, and then once that app is on your phone, uh, you open that app, you'd be able to locate where the bikes are, are located. Uh, once you get to that point, uh, there would be an acknowledgement uh, on your phone basically indicating that you agree to the terms of the use of that bike, which would include language in terms of uh, uh, making sure you comply with city or all city ordinances, and then any types of requirements that the vendor may have also. Uh, then you'd be able to unlock the bike, ride it to your destination, and when you get to your destination, you'd be able to uh, use your app, uh, lock it back up, and, and move on. Uh, someone else could then come forward and uh, take that bike and activate it and, and go uh, to their particular uh, location. So as the day progresses, you start with the bikes at certain locations, uh, but then during the course of the day, people are uh, activating these bikes, using them for different things, and they, they wind up at the destinations where, they've, uh, where they wanted to go to. Uh, just wanted to show, I'm not sure how this will actually show here, but uh, this is on, on my phone here where I downloaded the, the Lime app for the, for the Lime bike. This happens to be for the Lime scooters. It happened to be uh, when I had a short getaway. The location that I was at didn't really have the Lime bikes available. But they happened hmm. to have the Lime scooters, so I used that. But the, the application and the intent is essentially the same whether you're using the, the scooters or the, uh, or the bikes. But in this case, it would be for the bikes. So you uh, press on that on your phone, and, base, and what happens then is a map comes up. And in this case, we can pretend we're in San Diego. <laughs> and what, what, the, what the map shows is basically based on your location right here, it shows where all the different bikes are in your immediate vicinity. So in this case here, if I'm standing right here and I wanted to select one of these bikes here, basically on your phone, all you're doing is, is pushing the... Uh, the icon on your phone to select that particular bike. And then this information comes up uh, on your phone indicating that this is the, the bike that you're about ready to select. Uh, this is the cost of what it would be here. Also, if you're not quite sure, uh, a lot of times there might be five or six, maybe even more bikes in that area and you might you want to make sure you got the right bike. So what you can do is push this button here and there'll be a buzzer or a, a bell will ring on that bike or, or scooter to make sure you got the right bike before you go ahead and start uh, selecting it. So once you have the bike that you want, you would push this down here to, to scan for your ride. Hmm. And then another menu would come up, which I'm not able to show here, but that would be the list of terms or the agreement in terms of that you're, before you can use this bike, you have to abide by all the the city regulations that are stipulated in the code and anything that the vendor would, would require. Uh, and then uh, to scan your ride, uh, you would put in this number here. Uh, the bike would unlock and you'd be able to drive it to your destination. Uh, once you get to where you want to go, there would be an, another menu down here basically to 
end ride or, or lock your bike, you would push that and that would end your ride. What's kind of nice about the, about the uh, system is then you can actually, uh, there's information in terms of the rides that you've taken. So for example, this is one ride that lasted for uh, one mile. It took me uh, nine minutes and it cost me $2.50. And then another ride here uh, was just a little over a half a mile that I was 14 minutes, so I was kind of dawdling, you can tell, on that particular <laughs> ride here. And that was $3.25. So you have a complete log of all your different rides, and you can keep track of the money that you spent uh, in terms of the money that you've put into the system. And uh, some of this information would be available to the city then in terms of some of the, the ride information. So how much does this cost? It really depends a little bit on, on the vendors, uh, but if you look at uh, Lime uh, as, as an example, what they do is they charge uh, $1 to unlock the bike, and then the fee is between uh, $0.10 cents and $0.15 cents per, per minute. So, for example, if you were going to take a bike from downtown and take it down to campus, uh, say if you're looking at about a 10-minute ride or so, uh, you'd be looking at about $2.50 in order to, to take that ride from downtown uh, down over to campus. Uh, if you were visiting the city and you wanted to go out and like for a 30 minute ride or maybe a 60 minute ride or something like that to kind of see the sights, a 30 minute ride would be a little over $5. Uh, a, a, 60 mile, a 60 minute ride would be about uh, $10 roughly. And again, that would depend kind of uh, uh, from vendor to vendor. And then lastly here, inquiries about other communities' experiences. Uh, one of the things that we, our committee felt was there has been a lot of press out there about uh, bike share, both positive and negative, and we wanted to kind of find out a little bit experiences about maybe some other communities. Uh, so we reached out to uh, Green Bay, uh, Wisconsin, and then also Golden Valley, Minnesota. Golden Valley is an entering suburb of the Twin Cities area, about 30,000 in population. Uh, both of those communities started uh, uh, launched uh, dockless uh, bike share operations this past summer, uh, and they're similar to kind of what we're talking about. They're in the a range of about 100 bikes to 150 bikes, so we thought it was somewhat comparable. And in talking with representatives from their cities uh, this past fall, they really had nothing but positive things to say about their experiences with the uh, with the dockless program. You know, we have heard horror stories about uh, uh, bikes winding up in the rivers or, or uh, abandoned in parks, and some of those things uh, can potentially happen, but uh, from the experience of Golden Valley and Green Bay, things have been, been very positive. Uh, the one thing that uh, we was interesting in talking with the fellow from Green Bay, within the first two months of their operation, uh, they had over 3,000 rides within that short period of time which indicates that there's uh, quite a interest. Now again, Green Bay is a little bit different than Eau Claire, but it does show that there is that interest out there. So with that, I'll turn it over to Janessa. Janessa is gonna talk about the specifics of the ordinance itself. So this ordinance um, creates a seasonal license for companies. They would be able to operate in the city between March 1st and October 31st. Maybe not this year, they might not want to on March 1st, but in theory they could. Um, it limits the number of bicycles in the program to 150 with an additional 50 able to be approved by the engineering department. It requires a financial guarantee per bike of $80 to be on deposit with the city in the event that the city incurs any costs um, in, re in relation to the bike share program. It requires that the city be named as an additional insured um, by the company in the amount of at least $2 million. It requires that the licensee have a brick and mortar location within the city in an appropriately zoned location, um, so it can't just be you know, somebody's front yard. Um, so that they have a, a spot for service and maintenance on the bikes. Um, it requires that the licensee rebalance the bikes throughout the city every morning by 6 a.m. Um, essentially, if all the bikes end up on campus um, at the end of the day, the licensee has to come in and redistribute them um, to various locations throughout the city. 
Uh, and the, the licensee would have to rent at least two bicycle parking locations from the city, one in the north side, one in the south. There's a map included in your packet showing a, um, a bunch of different locations um, and associated costs that staff has created um, that would be available for, um, for rent by the licensee. It also requires that the licensee educate the user regarding um, bike riding regulations in the city. Um, in particular, thinking about um, a lot of the downtown locations where you can't ride a bike on a sidewalk. So in anticipation of increased bike traffic in the city with this ordinance, um, staff is recommending changes to the bike parking um, or ordinance as well. Um, just a couple of highlights from that, um, bicycles would not be able to be parked um, so that they're blocking pedestrian or, or um, vehicular traffic. They would have to be, be able to, to allow for clear passage. And um, bikes would only be able to be secured to a bike rack or a bike corral, essentially something that's intended to have a bike um, locked to it. Um, and then any bikes in violation of those regulations would be able to be removed by the city. So there's also um, a section at the end then that amends the fees and licenses schedule. It would create um, a one-time fee per bike um, of $15 that the applicant would have to pay to the city. It creates a $250 initial application fee, $150 renewal application fee, and then either a $100 or $200 charge for the various rental locations um, throughout the city. So I can take any questions, ask Mr. Ivory or okay. Ms. Ness. Thank you, Ms. Stromberger, Mr. Ivory. Questions from council? Um, first up is council member Strobel. Um, thank you, Mr. Amberger. Um, just, just one question on the, um, I know the new regulations on parking them. Um, number four on there says shared bicycles shall only be parked at bicycle racks designated bicycle parking areas or on private property with the consent of the property owner. How, how, how would you expect that to be enforced? And there was an ask that question as I was just in Mesa, Arizona recently and they have those scooters and they're sort of all over the place and, and you see them sort of littering the sides of the road pretty much everywhere. So I, I think this is a good I idea, but if I'm, let's say, going to rent one of these bikes, what's to the, what's the stop me from just parking it on the boulevard downtown and walking away? That, so that list that you're referencing, that's a list of items that we're asking that the licensee provide essentially notification of to a user. Those aren't necessarily... Um, enforceable items so you know like the first one is helmet use is encouraged um, so that ultimately the, the the user would have to <coughs> abide by um, that that parking ordinance that I was referencing so as long as they're legally parking the bike um, then they're gonna they're gonna be in compliance okay. we're asking essentially that the licensee recommend that they park it in a bike corral or a bike rack something like that but it wouldn't be a requirement per se. Yeah. Council Mr. Trouble, do you have a follow-up? I do, thank you. Um, and in any case, it sounds like the regulations or the ordinance um, is asking the vendor to go pick them all up at the end of the day and redistribute them someplace else. So in any case, they're only going to be there for that day. That's correct. correct. Yeah, okay, thanks. Thank you. Further questions? Council Member Beaton? Uh, I have a couple questions. Um, so I, I'm still having a hard time kind of working off of uh, Councilmember Strobel's question. I'm having a hard time imagining if a, if a bike uh, in, this, in a program um, doesn't need to be locked to anything, it just is on a kickstand, then why would it, uh, would it still need to be on a bike rack or um, how would that work? I'm, yep, it, so it wouldn't have to be. Essentially that list is uh, like a list of best practices that we're asking um, the licensee inform a user of, you know, helmet, um, you know, yielding to pedestrians, um, complying with traffic regulations. So best practice is to, you know, park your bike in a bike corral somewhere where it's designated to be. But if they're legally parking it per our ordinance, then they're not going to have an issue. Could I have a follow-up? Sure. Um, and as far as... Um, I'm, I'm thinking even beyond a uh, bike share program and just um, people using their own bikes, um, changing uh, bike, bike parking ordinances. Uh, would there be any sort of initiative on, this, on the part of the city to install more bike racks? I know that downtown um, 
it's often extraordinarily hard to find bike parking um, and there's a lot of bike uh, traffic and so um, I guess I'm just thinking about myself or not thinking about myself but um, in my own anecdotal experience that um, uh, you know sometimes a lamppost is the only thing you, you can find. Yeah, I'll defer to Ms. Ness on that question. Good evening. We have been working with the bids to look at bike rack locations on street, especially with the capital improvement projects. Graham Avenue is one that is just recently being completed last year. We'll look at amenities that will go along that street, so trash receptacles, benches, and bike racks. We prioritize the bike rack locations, so we'll do a first priority, second priority, third priority, and lay out a number of bike racks that, um, locations that will be available. Then I believe with that project, we're purchasing 20 to 22 bike racks that will be placed in the downtown area. And we work with the business owners on the placement of those uh, in the bid district as well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Ness. Further questions from council on the bicycle, dockless bicycle program, council member Bergie. Thank you. Um, my question was about how does this work within the city limits? Like what if someone decides to take the bike to Altoona and all that's gaining popularity and I don't know if they just go pick it up again or if there's any, is that part of best practices that it stays within the city? Just my question. Sure. There's nothing in the ordinance that requires the bike to stay within city limits. If a user determines they want to ride it outside, they're certainly welcome to do that. And if it stays outside of city limits, it's on the company to, to go back and retrieve it if okay. it's left somewhere else. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. Follow up? Yes, I do. A different question. I'm wondering about are the bikes equipped with um, like lights for nighttime riding or would that be the responsibility of the bike, the person riding the bike or... I don't know if you know what the bikes would be like, just for safety-wise. Uh, it would depend, again, on the vendor a little bit. The bikes that I'm familiar with uh, did have uh, front lights and they did have rear lights. Uh, I don't know if they were necessarily as good a quality as I would like to have on my own bike, uh, but they did have those available. Okay, thanks. Thank you, Councilmember Bergie. thank you. Uh, Mr. Ivory, I wonder if, and I'll I'll follow up on that question. I wonder if we might consider putting that into the ordinance itself. It's a I we have oftentimes I'll see cyclists in the, at night who don't have lights, and it's a it's not safe for them. It's not safe for anyone, and so I wonder if we might consider that part of the ordinance. Um, further questions, Councilmember Beaton. Thank you. Um, in uh, staff's conversations with. Um, and research into vendors. Um, are there any vendors who offer low-income fares um, or low-income programs? I don't have a specific company per se, but when looking at some communities, they did offer different alternatives for different levels of income um, for the rider usage and uh, the rates that they would need to pay. Um, I don't know if it came through certain programs, but there were different alternatives um, by some companies. Could I, um, just a clarifying question, um, and were those programs uh, provided by the private company or by the municipality? Do you know? I do not know that. Okay. I know that it was an option, and I'm not sure if it was funded through the community or, or okay. an alternative through the vendor. Thank you. Thank you. Further questions, Council Member Gragert. Thank you, Acting President Worthman. And I guess this is a additional question on kind of the same concern of price and accessibility. Um, is there? I understand that this dockless system seems to be a little bit more dependent upon technology and smartphones than maybe a a, a docking system would. So, is there an actual way to? for someone without a smartphone to access these bikes? And for a typical company like Lime, for example? Uh, 
uh, based on my experience, uh, no, I'm not aware of the capability of uh, accessing you know, it without a smartphone. Uh, there's the possibility of that a vendor could work through a, uh, if they were to place the bikes on with a private, another private uh, business or something like that within within the city, they could possibly make work out some kind of arrangement maybe that the uh, bikes could be signed out through that business. The only thing is that business then would be liable at that point for the operation of, of that bike. So they're kind of transferring that liability to that, that business rather than the user. But otherwise, uh, most of the uh, vendors that I've seen and what we've researched on it pretty much is through a smartphone. Hmm. Follow -up? A follow-up question to that. Um, thank you, Mr. Ivory. Um, I guess the, there, and, and maybe it would be um, a legal question too, but is there a, a way for us to perhaps identify a maximum price <laughs> in, as part of an ordinance in order to assure a certain level of accessibility to the bikes or I guess this is meant to be a market driven kind of um, venture but at the same time I think we there's there's some concern about cost and accessibility to everyone in the community so sure that's something that could be added certainly um, this ordinance is based on a collection of ordinances um, across the country and I will say that's not a requirement that I saw in any of those okay. other ordinances Uh, you know, one other thing regarding that is that the uh, the license is not exclusive in terms of just having one vendor in the city. So uh, there is the opportunity for competition. So you'd think that would help kind of drive the price downwards too by having maybe the potential of having uh, more than one vendor within the city. Another another question, council member? Yeah, thank you, Acting President Worthman. Um, sort of diving in a little further on the price and options there, is there typically a monthly membership or annual membership? I understand that sometimes these companies will create a relationship with a university, for example, to have students have a specific price point, but is there, um, I guess I, I'm seeing this example of $1 to unlock and then a cost per minute, but I guess is there a way to have a membership that you've seen? For, for dockless systems? Yeah, I guess I'm not familiar with that, whether there is or isn't. Um, thank you. Thank you, Council Member Gregor. Thank you, um, Council Member Emmanuel. Thank you, Acting President Worthman. Um, I have some questions of my own, but if it's okay, I can perhaps add some additional information to some of the questions that were answered earlier. Sure. Okay, thank you. Um, so there are some um, accessibility programs that some of the dockless bike share programs have. One example is Lime Access, where they offer 95% off the usual rate. So it runs at five cents for every 30 minutes. Um, and you will see that in some of the programs, not all of the dockless programs. Um, the second is accessibility without a smartphone. Uh, that definitely is a concern. Um, so back when I first started studying this, the average recipient for, or basically highest um, benefactor of bike shares was 34-year-old white males who were pretty affluent. And that doesn't seem to be necessarily um, um, helping everybody out in our community. So one of the ways that bike share programs had circumvented that or tried to address that was to bundle a bike share program with public transportation because bike share is really meant to be uh, augment the first and last mile of transportation of getting from point A to point B. So um, while there's nothing here in this ordinance today, I think there's definitely a possibility to figure out, is there some partnership for bundling with public transportation to make um, public, uh, uh, public transportation more accessible? And then if people qualify for reduced uh, transit, then they likely would qualify for a reduced usage of the bike share. Um, so there's an, a possibility. And then some library, some libraries have partnered with bike share programs. Uh, so while I haven't done any research here in Eau Claire, you know, there could be a possibility of usage of the iPads that are accessible at the library. And 
checking uh, items out there. And um, so I, I think there are some options there of how we, um, how our community can address that accessibility. Um, so hopefully that helps and happy to take any other questions offline. Um, but if I may ask um, a few of my questions that I have. Um, this is in regards to um, racks and where people can park their bikes. Um, I know that um, some communities will have stripes instead of a bike rack. They'll have just, let's say, instead of eight stalls for eight, eight bikes, they would have eight stripes uh, striped on the sidewalk. Um, has the city considered doing that as, a, as another option to bike racks? In looking at the bike parking, we have looked at um, different ways of accommodating the, the dockless bike share and by using pavement marking and signage, we thought that would be an alternative instead of having to purchase a 200 to $300 bike rack um, to be able to use some paint and signage to designate those locations. Thank you. Um, what comes to mind, for example, for the Lime Bike Company, which if this passes, we don't know who would be the successful person or company to get a contract for bike uh, bike share, but they have very vibrant green stripes on the on the sidewalk, which is helpful for their branding efforts and hopefully helpful for the user to be able to match the bike with with the green stripe there. Um, the <clears throat> other question is around the fees that are indicated. Um, I'm wondering if these fees seem like they're on par with Green Bay and Golden Valley and other communities you looked into. Um, Pat did a lot of the research on the licensing agreements and the fees that were related to different communities, but in looking at some alternatives that actually companies sent to us as MOUs to work just strictly with the city, the, the fees are very reasonable compared to what we saw with other communities. Um, and I don't know, do you have that list, Pat, to share? Here's an example of some of the different, uh, again, with each city, the, uh, the way they charge their fees and, and, and charges are a little bit different, but for example, Milwaukee, they had a, the license fee of $250, but then they had a per bike fee of $50, where in this ordinance we're recommending $15. Uh, Madison had a application fee of uh, $500, and then for their, their rent of their public right-of-way, they were looking at $50 per square foot. And if you figure that for uh, like 100 square foot for, uh, for uh, five or 10 bikes, that's substantially more than what we're looking at here. Uh, Aurora uh, had a fees of uh, license fee of $2,500. Uh, $2, um, and this was more of a docking situation. This was a little bit different. Uh, Davis, California, $2,000. Uh, Durham, North Carolina, application fee of 1000 renewal of 500 So again, that's, that's quite a bit more than what we're looking at. A per bike fee of of 25 again where we're looking at 15. Uh, some other examples, uh, I guess uh, like St. Louis had a per bike fee of 10, uh, uh, Seattle had a bike fee of 15. So they're kind of all over the board uh, in terms of uh, Boulder, a bike fee of, of, of $100 here. So really, I think most of our fees we feel are pretty reasonable and on the lower end of what we've been seeing. Thank you. That help answer your question, Council Member Emanuel? Yes, thank, thank you, you very much. Further questions, Council? I don't see any at this time. We will then close uh, our question period. But if you have further questions for uh, staff, uh, either we can ask them again tomorrow before our vote, or if you would like to follow up outside of this meeting, it's also an option. We're going to then open up this item for public comment. Uh, are there folks here this evening who would like to speak specifically on our bike share program? Uh, if you want to, I know a few of you are here probably this evening, uh, please approach the podium and welcome.
Hi, uh, my name is Austin Northagen. I live at 814 Menominee Street, apartment number four. Uh, I'm a student at the university, and I'm the director for the Student Office of Sustainability. Uh, and one of the big projects that I did over the summer was research bike share. Um, and I'm very happy today to be up here and for it to be on the table and on the agenda. Um, it's wonderful to live in a community where there's opening or listening ears, open minds, and collaborative minds uh, from the city. Um, because to bring together students, the university, and the city is a rare moment. And I think bike share can be one of those symbols where we can all point to and say it took every mind, every effort from the city and say we worked together and we did something. We did something really cool. Um, and so I am proud to say that the Student Office of Sustainability and the Student Senate uh, passed a resolution last Monday in support of this ordinance. And the students are 100% behind this ordinance. Uh, this is a project that has embraced student leadership, student drive for the last three years, um, and I'm proud to finally see it come to fruition, and so I hope that I can gain your support um, in voting this up tomorrow and that we can all see uh, Bike Share come to Eau Claire, uh, hopefully sometime this spring or summer. Um, so thank you again. Thank you. Thanks for your work on this. Uh, Councilmember Beaton actually has a question yeah. for you this yeah. evening. Um, has student senate or the student office of sustainability considered um, or discussed a, a program um, to reduce the cost of a bike share program for students? We have, yes. Um, it's something that we, once the vendor is selected, um, hopefully sometime within the next month, uh, we will be reaching out to them and finding a way to collaborate to reduce the cost for students. Thank you. Are there further questions for Mr. Northagen? Any questions? I don't see any. Thank you again. Good evening. Good evening. Hello there, folks. Um, wonderful summary by Pat and Janessa and Leah. Thank you so much for doing that. Um, so I'm going to try to keep this short. Would you be able to state your, your name and your address, please? Yes. Um, my name is Lauren Becker, and I'm a student at the University of Wisconsin-Eau Claire. Um, and just to give you some background, in addition to being a student, I'm also a student senator, active member of our SOS. Um, a resident assistant and a member of our Bicycle and Pedestrian Safety Committee. Um, I've come before our city's representative bodies before on issues that invite community discussion. Um, and here I am, again, voicing my support for our collaborative efforts on this bike share ordinance on behalf of both off-campus and on-campus um, students. Um, I must call special attention to the work and the determination of our uh, student SOS director, Austin Northagen, done a tremendous job. Um, I couldn't be more proud to say that Bike Share is a product of student-driven action and a brilliant partnership between the city and our campus, for which I thank you all very much. Um, providing Bike Share, an already widely utilized system in the cities, in cities even larger than our very own, um, provides ease of access to affordable, healthy, and sustainable transportation within our city and our community. Ease of access, as usual, increases likeliness of use. This is a fantastic, student-initiated and community-collaborated step towards an even more sustainable and forward-thinking city. Um, so I thank you. And if you have any questions specifically about um, student involvement in this, I open um, to questions of all sorts. So thank, thank you for allowing for this time. Thank you. Thank you for coming and sharing this evening. Are there are questions uh, at all? I don't see any. Thank you, Ms. Becker, for all of your work Thank on you this. so much. Is there anyone else here this evening who would like to speak on the bike share ordinance? Please come forward. Good evening. Good evening. Uh, thank you, Acting President Worthman, City Councilors. Thank you for your time and attention. Uh, and my thanks as well to the students of the Student Office of Sustainability who have worked on this. Uh, for, for quite a long time. My name is Jake Rassi. I'm here in my capacity as a government and community relations specialist for the University of Wisconsin-Eau Claire Chancellor's Office. And I also had the privilege of serving in Student Senate a few years ago. Uh, and I can tell you when I started as a student in 2012, uh, downtown wasn't a place for students. It is remarkable how rapidly our economic development, tourism, uh, and residential uh, qualities in Eau Claire have changed. And I think that's undoubtedly been for the better. 
Uh, I know that for many, many years, folks in the SOS have had an interest in this kind of program, uh, not only as a mode of recreation or tourism, sightseeing, but as a means of transportation. Uh, and I'm pleased to hear the uh, conversation tonight is reflecting those goals we've heard for so long. I think that the uh, thing that on behalf of UW-Eau Claire administration I'm most happy to, to thank you for and especially thank city staff uh, is the integration of student feedback and comments uh, in the ordinance process. I think the work of the city attorney's office uh, created ordinances that would allow us to uh, effectively implement and solicit uh, contractors who could provide this service while also protecting the assets of the city and providing broad utility to students uh, community members and visitors to our city. Uh, in, in some, I would say that the university and the city uh, work best together when we stop proactively think about what is going to be best for students because so often this is an excellent case where we see a prospective student who maybe hops on a bike and gets to see more of downtown Eau Claire than they would otherwise, becomes a student, becomes a graduate, and maybe goes on to become a resident of Eau Claire. As I well, I do live in Altoona and I apologize for that. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll leave my bike downtown. I won't leave it in Altoona. All of that to say, thank you very much for your consideration of this issue. I know it is many years in the making. My thanks to the city manager's office, uh, the city attorney for putting this all together. Uh, and while I'm thanking folks, thanks to all the city crews who have done so much to keep this city functioning uh, and, and uh, able to be traveled at all over the past several weeks. So uh, with that, uh, our thanks for involving students taking this into account, and we do support uh, this ordinance. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Mr. Rossi. Rossi. Uh, any questions this evening? I don't see any. Appreciate it. And is anyone else here this evening who would like to speak uh, on the bike share ordinance pre as presented? Anyone else this evening? <clears throat> Welcome. Good evening. Good evening, uh, uh, Acting President. Uh, my name is Johan Wyckoff. I, uh, I live at 339 uh, Niagara Street. Uh, hello, all. Uh, I'm a, uh, just for the record, I am not involved in any of the committee, uh, any of the committee of who have done the great work that they've done with this bike share program. Although, as a biker, I would just like to comment on uh, biker, biker safety. Um, as someone who originally lived in Minneapolis, Minnesota, who has seen uh, the Lime scooters going around all over the place, I have seen some kids who have gone rode into the road, who have rode their scooters into the road, and ha and have seen the article reports about injuries, head injuries, wrist injuries, and all that. And I would just like to add, I just like to say that hopefully. We're all taking we're all taking into account the safety the public safety issues, mm -hmm. as well as the societal issues as well. So thank you mm -hmm. so much. Thank you, Mr. Wyckoff, and thank you for your presentation. Is there anyone else here this evening who would also like to speak on the bike share program? If not, we'll close that item, and move to our final item for discussion this evening. This is the parking ordinance. Public discussion on an ordinance. Mending Table 9 of the City Code of Ordinance entitled Parking During Specified Hours and specifically parking prohibited passenger loading zone related to the Pablo Center at the Confluence. Ms. Ness. Thank you. There are two locations tonight that we're going to talk about, um, both adding loading zone restrictions to Table 9 of the ordinance. The first one is the west side of the 100 block of Graham Avenue near the Pablo Arts Center. And the second location is on Eau Claire Street on the south side, um, just to the west of the existing handicapped parking stall. Uh, city staff has been working um, with the Decky Parking Committee, the Police Department, the South Barstow Bid District, um, regarding parking uh, related to the Pablo Center and the opening of this new facility. Um, with the Graham Avenue reconstruction project, it was one, this one block was not signed um, and we've used it uh, or taken uh, some time to try and find the proper signing to help accommodate all users in this area. This is a 
aerial of the location. But we started out working with the DECI Parking Committee and um, at the request of uh, the Pablo Center to look at a loading zone area for event timeframes. This was one of the original signs that we had placed out on the street that was a lot of information for people to process as they're driving past. And we found that not very many motorists were reading these signs and we were having many violations. Um, so to um, address some concerns with the DECI Parking Committee, we discussed that signage and looked at some additional um, signing alternatives and parking uh, approaches to accommodate the ask of the downtown businesses to maintain as much two-hour parking as possible and also allow the loading and unloading zone timeframes for the Pablo Center events. So we came up with, it's a flip sign that has the standard no parking from 2 a.m. to 6 a.m. Um, in the downtown area. It signs for two-hour parking from 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. And then when there is an event present or going to be present, the staff at the Pablo Center can flip the sign down to uh, alert the motorists that there's no parking um, for only immediate drop-off and pickup zone area. Um, there are three posts located along the west side of Graham Avenue that have this type of signage on it. Um, and then in addition to the signage, uh, these fluorescent green cones have been used. Um, this was the very beginning uh, trial state of the cones being set out, but now um, the cones are set along the curb edge in the morning to alert uh, the motorists that there will be an event in that evening um, or in the immediate future with a time indicated on there so they know that if they park at two o'clock and the event parking starts at four o'clock, they need to have their vehicle moved because otherwise it, the, the um, black face will go to the loading zone time frame. Um, this happened over a couple of different meetings um, and working directly with the Pablo Center staff um, at the ribbon cutting, we had the initial signs up that I had showed you, um, and through one of, a couple of the first shows at the Pablo Center, and we had uh, feedback that the circulation of traffic and pedestrians was not to the uh, standard that we were hoping it would be. Um, with the installation of the new signs and the coning, um, and some work with our CSOs and uh, staff at the Pablo Center on parking standards and, and flipping the signs. Um, I feel that the circulation has really improved in that area for traffic and pedestrian, for motorists and pedestrians. Um, we're continuing to work with the Pablo Center um, on promoting parking in the North Barstow Galloway ramp um, and providing prepaid options for parking potentially through their ticket sales. Um, and uh, I guess I'll move on to the next section. Oh, I have a couple more signed pictures. The other loading zone location that we are looking at is at the request of the district and the Lutheran Social Services. Um, at the DECI Parking Committee meeting, they indicated the need to have a drop-off and pick-up location for their clients. Um, specifically, the location would be behind this vehicle. Um, it's one stall back on the south side of Eau Claire Street, west of Barstow Street. Um, the LSS has clients that drop off and pick up between 7 a.m. and 6 p.m. And the district said that their drop off pickup time is typically busiest during meal times. Um, and then on the, the off times, 
that stall could also be load, used as a loading zone or a drop-off pickup for the Pablo Arts Center as well. Um, just in this area, there is a lot of activity. Um, I wanted to note that on uh, Eau Claire Street on the north side, there is a bus stop, and that area is essentially a loading zone because there's only 60 feet of curb there, and 50 feet of curb is used for bus, bus stop locations. So um, that's another area for drop-off and pick-up, too, when buses aren't in the area. Thank you, Ms. Ness. There are questions uh, for Ms. Ness on the presentation regarding um, the changes to our parking ordinance. Any questions specifically? I don't see any. Thank you again. Thanks for all your work on it. Are there folks here this evening who would like to speak on uh, this um, discussion on this parking ordinance? Welcome forward. Good evening. Good evening. Hopefully we'll bring this home very quickly tonight. My name's Ann Larson. I am uh, reside at 128 East Grant Avenue. Um, I am the program manager for Family Preservation Services at Lutheran Social Service. So uh, it is um, our group who is coming forth and asking for this parking spot. Um, interestingly enough, tonight we've talked about um, through your discussion on the affordable housing, we've talked about a lot of the very people that um, we are also looking for a simple parking spot. Um, the family preservation programming serves the, probably the uh, mental, mentally ill population of Eau Claire, who are also probably dealing with addiction issues, who are also probably dealing with homelessness or inadequate housing on unstable housing. We're talking about people with poverty issues. And we also talked a little bit, or, or previous speakers talked a little bit about the impact on uh, the children. And so what happens with our programming is that a lot of it is preventative. We are trying to work with these families to keep them together, to keep the children in the home while the parents are working through all of the issues that they might be dealing with. Um, there are times when the children are removed from the home uh, before the parents get, uh, reach what you might call a full recovery. So what we do in this building down here on uh, the corner of Eau Claire and Barstow, we have family visit rooms there where either previous to having children removed or after the children are removed, families can come together and spend time in a safe environment and they can be meeting, being served and keeping those bonds together that are gonna lead to uh, hopefully healthy reunification and, and they're gonna go on and, and do well. Um, one of the things that happens though is that most of these children are placed either with uh, grandparents, some of whom uh, could be elderly, they are placed with extended family members, they're placed most often in foster care. So the foster care folks in our community are already doing a lot of the work to help support the children in this community. When they're coming to bring these kids, they're coming carrying one, maybe two car seats, a couple toddlers, there might be a kindergartner, a couple of their own kids, and it's really very difficult and has become increasingly more difficult with the wonderful development in downtown. When I began working at LSS in 2005, we had the corner parking lot where we're gonna now have a plaza. We did not have the student building across the way. There was much more parking available. And as we've seen these wonderful developments, we've also seen a little more difficulty for those who are coming, receiving our services, and for those people in the community who are support, supporting our children and the people who are having difficulty. So we're, we're asking for this spot not for ease for the staff who work there, not for ease of you know anyone else, but for the ease of those people who are supporting um, really the, the people in the community that you guys have been talking a lot about tonight. So um, compared to some of the other things you discussed, we just want a little spot and then people can drop the kids off 
you know, pull in, drop the kids off and go. They don't stay there the whole time and then they come back two hours, three hours, five hours later. Um, so that's the, the basis of our request for this spot. Ms. Larson, any questions this evening from council? I don't see any. Thank you again. Mm -hmm. Thank you. <clears throat> Good evening. Good evening. Thank you. Hello, everyone. I'm Jason Anderson. I'm the executive director of Pablo Center at the Confluence and also a, a resident in District 4, uh, which is new. So it's nice to be back in Eau Claire from Chippewa. Uh, I want to talk to you sort of about Pablo Center. We all work together to do a great development. We, we had a concept of how parking would work, and I would like to thank city staff and, and the South Barstow bid for helping us sort of evolve how parking is going to function and us being having the ability to change that signage uh, but communicate clearly to those guests who are downtown who are trying to park and utilize our businesses and our downtown bid prior to us having events and then us moving to event parking only. The change in signage really helps. I think is far clearer and, and Leah has helped us get there as has the CSOs. And so really I'm here just to sort of take questions from you because I'm sure there has to be a, a number they're going to sort of explain why and, and how we got to the conclusion that we, we currently have and how it functions for us as a building and ensures our, our financial success as well as the success of downtown. Thank you. You're welcome. Any questions this evening? <coughs> Council Member Emanuel. Uh, thank you, Mr. Anderson, for coming down. Just a very short question. Are you satisfied with this proposal? Will this meet your needs? This proposal absolutely takes care of uh, our high school matinees when we have a number of school buses coming down and, and dropping off young youth that are coming to experience sort of the children's theater productions that are happening during the day. It ensures in the evenings and weekends uh, when we are having events that we can change that signage two and a half hours prior to an event to give proper notice and that the bright neon green cones make it very easy for us to drop out and it's a color that's complementary to our blue so it works well and, and we like it. Uh, and it, it also ensures that those businesses can function on days we don't have events. So it, it's been a good balance. Uh, as Councilman Strobel has witnessed, uh, it, it's still an evolving process as we try to sort of work around the amount of snow that keeps getting piled on our boulevard. And as we remove it, it, it adequately is, is reapplied and we remove it again. So it's, it's a good balance, <laughs> but it, it, it does serve our need uh, as we expected it to and also ensures that, it, that at every level people have access to the building. Are there questions? Council Member Gregor. Thank you, Worthman. Thank you, Mr. Anderson. I uh, guess I kind of wanted to dive into some related issues here a little bit. Um, so there's there's definitely some concern about ac access to the building, like from folks who have limited mobility or that have handicap permits. Um, so could maybe you explain what you currently do to help serve that population, but also what is kind of coming in the future in terms of information and and uh, as I, I was on the website for the Pablo Center and I didn't really I couldn't really find anything about like recommendations for parking or transportation so I wanted to see what you have in store for that absolutely and I appreciate that councilman so um, what we currently do to, to mitigate or handle handicap parking was, was taken to the South Barstow bid. And so we increased the number of spaces in the South Barstow bid to three total spaces, which is above the 2% that's required throughout the bid district. And, and Leah can talk to that at greater length if necessary. Those three spaces are in closer proximity to the Pablo Center than what the previous handicap spaces were to the State Theater to give a, a comparison. And not to compare the two facilities, but, but we absolutely absolutely have more adequate parking for handicapped individuals than we previously did. If, if a guest purchases a handicap seat within the theater, our box office contacts them and gives them free valet parking for that event, and that's anyone who's within the, the vehicle ride with them. So they, they all receive free valet parking with any purchase of a handicap seat in the building to help sort of ease that as well. So it's not an additional cost. And we're using that as a check because if, if it was by every handicap placard, that, that would be sort of unmanageable and untenable from a financial situation for us. Uh, 
what we're looking to do is JB Systems, uh, who's our, our website provider, we are rolling out additional transportation guidelines. We're just, we're losing our marketing manager to Pablo Properties uh, tomorrow. And so with the loss of Elaine Coughlin, uh, those delays are just sort of hitting me a little bit. And so we hope to have those updates out in the coming months that will sort of drive people to the North Barstow ramp as well as the South Barstow ramp and communicate where local parking is throughout the, the city. Thank you. Thanks. Does that help answer your question? Further questions, Council? Council Member Strobel. I, I might, uh, thank you. I, I uh, might just make some comments uh, as long as Mr. Anderson's up here, but I'm on the decking parking well, committee. Uh, Council Member Strobel, could, would, I think the, count, the, the con, if, there, if there are questions, if, if there are comments, maybe we could wait for them tomorrow. Is that okay? If there are questions uh, for Mr. Anderson. Uh, I guess, yeah, right. I don't have any other questions. Thank you. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Council Member. There are further questions for uh, Mr. Anderson this evening? Do you any? Thank you again. Thank you. Uh, anyone else here this evening who would like to speak on this item um, regarding the changes to our parking ordinance? I don't see any. We will then close that item, item number six, and uh, we will move to our public comment period. And during this period, um, <clears throat> if anyone has uh, des desires to hear their viewpoints, residents, uh, our city council, you know, welcomes them. Uh, we have the sign-up sheet at the back of the room. Um, Ms. Merle is just gathering it now. We don't have anyone who is interested in speaking during this period, but uh, thank you all for coming down this evening. We'll close item um, number seven, I guess, pub our public comment period. Um, and we'll adjourn, sorry, we won't adjourn. We will move on a motion by um, Council Member Strobel, seconded by Council Member Emmanuel. Um, we'll move into closed session. I'm gonna read this. It's a, du a motion duly made and carried by City Council to go, in go into closed session to confer with our City Attorney regarding a claim for tax exempt fi tax exemption filed by Blue Gold Real Estate Foundation Incorporated, Incorporated, which is permitted in closed session pursuant to statute 19.851G of the Wisconsin statutes. Um, that motion has be, been made by Council Member Strobel, seconded by Council Member Emanuel. Uh, do we have discussion on that item? Any discussion on this motion to go in closed session? See none. Clerk, please call the roll. Council Member Beaton? Aye. <coughs> Aye. Emmanuel? Aye. Gregor? Aye. Strobel? Aye. Wells? Aye. 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 John? Aye. Aye. And that um, motion has passed to go in closed session. Just the Eau Claire City Council meeting will return in a moment. Newsworks is made possible by continuing community support. If you would like to volunteer or make a donation, please contact us via phone at 715-839-5067 or online at valleymediaworks.org. This program is simulcast on WRFPLP 101.9 FM. We now return you to the Eau Claire City Council meeting. Call this meeting of the Eau Claire City Council to order. Please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Madam City Clerk, please call the roll. Councilmember Anderson? Here. Beaton? Here. Burby? Here. Christofferson? Here. Emanuel? Here. Wager? Here. Strobel? Here. Wells? Uh, here. Here. John. And we have quorum. Thank you again, Madam City Clerk. Welcome everyone to our Tuesday legislative session this evening. Glad you could make it down. Um, want to uh, thank Valley Media Works for stuff for helping to live stream the proceedings of this meeting. Um, please make sure to check those out at valleymediaworks.org or 99.4 on the government channel. And that's also simulcast on WRFP LP 101.9 FM. You can also find past meetings of this city council on their YouTube channel. I'm going to get 
Moving right away with our first order of business this evening. First up is our consent agenda. Is there a wish or desire by city council to remove any items on the consent agenda separately or do you have any questions for our city staff? Something you would like clarified? Council member Emmanuel. Thank you, Acting President Orthman. I'd like to move item number 11 to be considered separately. Is there a second on that? Doesn't need a second? Okay, well, I think Council Member Beaton has agreed to second anyway. So uh, that item will be moved for separate consideration. We'll take up the consent agenda minus item number 11, which relates to claims. Um, are there any questions on the rest of the items on the consent agenda? Seeing none, then on a motion by Council Member Strobel, seconded by Council Member Anderson, the consent agenda minus item number 11 has been moved and is open for discussion. Any discussion? Seeing none, clerk, please call the roll. Council Member Anderson? Aye. 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 Strobel? Aye. Weld? Aye. Aye. And, and that item passes. Um, we move then to item number 11, which is being taken separately. Council Member Emmanuel had asked uh, to remove this. Council Member, would you like to speak first on this item? Thank you, Council President, uh, Acting Council President Orthman, and thank you also to Council Member Eaton for throwing the second out there. Um, so the reason why I'd like to consider this separately is because um, through what I've read in the newspaper um, and through a little bit of what I learned uh, yesterday in closed session, which um, you know I won't be repeating here in public, um, I have some concerns about um, just some of the um, some of the process and I guess when I boil it down, it seems that the city and, and the, the nonprofit um, organization that supports students has a good track record of working together and trying to find a solution um, instead of uh, going through a legal process. And it seems that sometimes when we allow things to have a little bit more time for consideration that perhaps another alternative can come out. Um, and so I would be interested in postponing this um, until the next meeting. Um, so I guess we're, I don't have a motion just yet. This is just to be considered separately, but I, I would be just curious to hear from other colleagues if you know, they would be you know, ready to vote on this tonight or if they you know, feel that they could use a little bit more time. And I think that would help me because I'm, I'm struggling. As you can hear from my voice, I'm struggling with how to proceed forward with this. Thank you, Councilmember Emmanuel. Uh, would anyone else like to would speak to this item? No one. Okay. Councilmember Emmanuel, would you like to uh, make a motion at this time? Um, let me just take a moment to think. Okay. Any other council members wish to address this again? I'll, I guess I'll ask, I'll open up the mics if someone would like to talk about their preference on this. Councilmember Ber Berge. Thank you. I guess I'll just say I would be prepared to vote on it tonight, so. Okay. Councilmember Emanuel, I think the floor is yours. Thank you, Acting President Orthman. I think we can take the vote. I'm just struggling because I think um, in just a conversation a few minutes ago with the city manager, he shared that um, he would be concerned that um, some of the uh, substitute resolution that I had worked on today um, potentially could jeopardize a legal strategy. And, you know, I do have an obligation to the city. Um, so I don't have it in a clean enough form where I feel like um, it's probably in its best format. So I think we can go ahead and take a vote um, when you're ready for that. And um, I, I'll just share that I'm gonna vote no against this this evening because I think we could use some more time. 
and I, I think that um, a better solution is out there. Um, I know our community has a really good history of working with one another, and I'm certain that a better solution is out there, and I, I don't agree with um, kind of how this has been um, proposed, and uh, I would rather just see that all parties can come together and work out a solution proactively, and I hope that's what will happen as we go forward. Okay, thank you. Further comment before we take a vote on this item? Council Member Strobel. Um, thank you. Yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to support the resolution as it was presented to us. So uh, on the advice of uh, our professional council and, and city staff, so I'm, I'm going to support it as it is. Thank you. Council Member Weld. Thank you, President. I also will support uh, the resolution. And I, I think there's still time, whether we, we approve this today or not, to, to work something out. And I'm still confident that we're going to do our part as far as the city um, to make sure it's a fair and equitable agreement between both parties. So. Thank you. Any further comments before we vote? I see none. Madam City Clerk, please call the roll. This is specifically item number 11 regarding claims. Councilmember Beaton? Aye. Berge? Aye. Christopherson? Aye. Emmanuel? No. Gregor? Aye. Strobel? Aye. Weld? Aye. Worthman? Aye. Anderson? Aye. And that item passes. This evening, we have one proclamation. If I could ask the Winter Mission uh, team to join at the podium, um, that would be wonderful. So thank you all for joining up here. I just want to say a few words about, uh, about your important work. Um, for those of you who may not have kept up with everything that's been going on, it's pretty exciting. This past November, uh, Heather Smith with WEDEC alerted staff to new technical assistance grant opportunity uh, from the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. And for those of you who don't know, Robert Wood Johnson has helped uh, in the past as well with um, our Invest Health Initiative in Eau Claire. Um, and 80 cities um, who were helping uh, winners become national leaders in winter city planning, uh, design and programming. And that grant is called Winter Mission. Um, under the coordination of the Eau Claire City County Health Department, leadership of the public health specialist Audrey Berner, uh, Eau Claire became one of 62 cities who applied for the Winter Mission uh, grant. Additionally, several other participants uh, helped with the application, including Councilmember Berge, including our health, uh, health Department Director, Lisa Giese, uh, Mr. Jake Rassi with the University of Eau Claire, uh, Government and Community Relations Specialist, Stephanie uh, Ponell, Visit Eau Claire Marketing Manager, and Scott Allen, our Community uh, Co Development Director. Last month, three folks were able to go up to um, Canada, um, Saskatoon and Saskatchewan. I'm pretty sure I'm not the only one who has trouble with that. <laughs> um, and Saskatoon. And at that conference, uh, it was announced that Eau Claire was actually one of the three cities selected for winter mission. Uh, and the Winter City Vanguard, which is the, um, which is this uh, plaque that I'm holding here this evening. Two other cities, Buffalo, New York, and Leadville, Colorado were also selected for this prestigious award. So over the next two years, um, Eau Claire will participate in groundbreaking winter mission program, including community engagement, pilot projects, and the creation of a unique winter city strategy. According to the 880 cities, winter mission aims to combat social isolation, as well as increase physical activity in the winter. And it's for all, re uh, all residents, no matter of their age or their ability, socioeconomic background uh, or ethno-cultural background. Starting next week, Eau Claire will launch the first ever community engagement of winter mission events, and it's gonna start with winter after hours, uh, March 7th. So stay tuned for that. There's gonna be a lot going on 
moving forward. And that's going to be happening at Pinehurst Park, culminating with the official kickoff of the event of the Visit Eau Claire Ex Experience Center um, at the Experience Center the evening of Friday, March 8th. Over the past several weeks, Eau Claire team has been doing one of a lot of, well, they've been doing a lot of things, but one of the biggest is helping to build collaborative team project partners. So they're all working together and reaching out in the community. And this team includes Volume 1, El Centro. It includes Among Mutual Assistance Associations, local businesses, City of Oak, Altoona, uh, just to name a few of the different partners that they are uh, working with to make this successful. So if you are a Winter Mission Project Partner, which I think all of you are, if there's any others that are here this evening, um, please be sure to join us for recognition. And thank you all for the incredible energy uh, that's gone into helping to bring this forward into our community. It's absolutely an exciting time. Uh, and especially with all the snow that we have on the ground right now, I think our community just recognizes um, the need that, it, that we have to make sure that winters are still a time where we're able to uh, reach out, build community, uh, and make our, our community safe, fun, and uh, livable. So wonderful, and congratulations to all of you for the incredible work on getting this. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah. Absolutely. Oh, yes. Were they called toques? Who knew? They're called toques. Scott has yeah, them too. Like toques. <laughs> Good. I didn't get to go to Canada. I unfortunately had to be in Florida that weekend, but they, they did okay. <laughs> Thank you so much, Acting President Worthman, the City Council, for this recognition. Uh, 880 Cities gets its name from the idea that whether you're 8 years old or 80 years old, the built environment of the city needs to be able to accommodate the recreation and social activity that it takes to move the social determinants of health. I think this can build really well in our participation in the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation's Invest Health Initiative. And we've seen, we, we all know the incredible growth and change that's happened in Eau Claire over the last central, uh, several years. You've all been a part of that. We are now identifying how the things that bring us together in summer, the rivers, the bridges, the parties, the music, how can we prevent that from driving us apart in winter, keeping us isolated? <laughs> It's no small task, and we've got a great team assembled. Thank you so much for your support. We look forward to engaging the community to best understand what works about our winter, what events are good templates, and how ultimately we can make this a better place for everybody to live. So thank you all so much for your support. Thank you for your work. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you all for your hard work. I'm going to move then to our business agenda this evening. First up are the alley improvements. Um, item number 13 is a final resolution approving a project and levying special assessments on the alley east of Fifth Avenue, Congress Street to Fulton Street. We had our uh, presentation last evening on this item. For, um, from Mr. Solberg. Are there any follow-up questions regarding this alley improvement before it's moved? Any follow-up? I see none. Then on a motion by Council Member Emanuel, seconded by Council Member Weld. Item number 13 has been moved. Is there a discussion on the alley improvement? Seeing none, clerk, please call the roll. Councilmember Aye. Aye. Emanuel? Aye. 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 Weld? Aye. Aye. Anderson? Aye. Mm -hmm. Aye. That item passes. We'll move then to item 14. This is regarding street improvements on Eddie Lane and Melby Street. Again, this is a final resolution which would um, 
bring special assessments and um, work on utility improvements on the following streets, Eddie Lane, Star Avenue to Hastings Way and Melby Street, Anderson Drive to Hastings Way. Um, this had a presentation as well last evening. Is there any, are there any questions from council regarding this um, final resolution? Council Member Gregor. Thank you, Acting President Worthman. I guess uh, I would appreciate if um, Mr. Silberg brought up a, a map of the, or a design of the Melby Street uh, portion of the projects in front of us tonight. Good evening, Mr. Silberg. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Um, I guess my, my question was, um, can you maybe describe the trail connections on the east side of this project and that along Melby Street? Because I know it's only been maybe about three or four years since the Melby Street trail was, was created. And my understanding is it's on the south side of Melby Street until you get to the the frontage road or on the east side of Hastings Way and then it goes, it crosses to the north? Correct. Um, the, the project that was constructed between uh, the frontage road and out to uh, the 53 freeway does, um, the trail does lie on the south side of Melby Street, but the crossing um, for the crosswalk with um, that was existing is on the north side of the intersection. So it does cross over and then it utilizes the sidewalk and it goes, goes to the west on the north side. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Silver. There are uh, follow-up questions um, from council regarding this project? Um, seeing none, um, then on a motion by council member it would be beaten, seconded by council member Gragert. Are you okay seconding? This item has been moved and is open for discussion or amendments. Do you have anything, uh, council member Gragert? Thank you, Acting President Worthman. I am um, kind of exploring this a little bit last night. Um, the idea that there's a, I guess, the fact that there's a trail that's coming in from the from the east side of this project on the on the north side of Melby Street, and it's really great that we're able to fit these sidewalks in because we, there's no sidewalks at all right now. Um, but I. One thing I asked last night was whether it would be possible to fit in a uh, a trail on the north side in the in the right of way and upgrade the sidewalk to a trail. So um, it appeared that that was quite possible, at least um, until you get close to the railroad track, where it would have to get down to six feet. Um, so right now it's being proposed to be five feet, and I do have an amendment that would um, allow for the portions of the trail that are on the north side, or the portions of the sidewalk on the north side to be upgraded to a blacktop uh, trail of eight feet um, instead of the sidewalk. Um, so I'd like to, to make a, a motion okay. to amend the, the project to be able to include that, and that would be from the Old Abe State Trail to the, the entrance to the um, gas station. Um, and one of the reasons for it, in addition to the fact that there's a trail on the east side, is that there's no bike lanes that go through, that'll take you through the, uh, the railroad track because it's just such a, such a narrow um, right of way there that we have to work with. So uh, this would help kind of fill in a, a bicycle facility gap. So I'm going to pass out a copy in each direction or copies in each direction for my colleagues on the council, and if perhaps uh, someone could make sure we have one in front of the, the screen as well with the language of the, the motion. Thank you, Councilmember Gregor. If I could ask if there's a second at this time, Councilmember Beaton seconding the motion. Do you want to speak to it first, Councilmember Gregor? Sure, yeah, I, I think I probably just explained it to the, as much as I probably could, but just my use of this area um, 
has been you know frequent enough that I understand quite a quite a few of the needs in the area and the fact that we've been able to develop the Melby Street trail uh, makes me feel that we should try to continue it through this project um, okay. since there isn't a bike lane through the railroad track Thank you, Councilmember McGregor. Uh, Councilmember Beaton, did you want to speak to it? No. I guess I had a question for the mover. Is have was there a cost differential on a cost difference on doing it this way? Uh, I'm told that there's not a cost difference because we're we're moving from it being a a concrete blacktop sidewalk to a to an asphalt trail. Are there uh, council members who wish to speak on this amendment? Council Member Strobel? Uh, I'll support this amendment. I think we heard last night that it was revenue neutral and we, uh, you know, matching up an eight foot trail with that other trail. And I think we did this last year by Shopco, so I, mm -hmm. I will support it. Thank you. Any further comments? Seeing none, clerk, please call the roll. Council Emanuel? Aye. 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 That amendment passes. We move back to the item on the table, which again is the Eddy Street and Melby Street reconstruction projects, levying special assessments. Any further comments before we vote on this? See any at this time? So we will take a vote. Again, this is with the amendment that just passed from Councilman McGregor and Beaton. Um, clerk, please call the roll. Councilmember Emanuel? Aye. Gregor? Aye. Strobel? Aye. Wells? Aye. Workman? Aye. Anderson? Aye. Beaton? Aye. Kirby? Aye. Mr. Aye. That item passes. We move then to item 15. This resolution orders sidewalk repair um, on in accordance with Wisconsin Statute 66.0907 on the following streets. Eddie Lane, Star Ave to Hastings Way, and Melby Street, Anderson Drive to Hastings Way. And again, this is the uh, resolution that would order the sidewalk repair. Um, are there any questions specifically on this item before we move it? Seeing none, then on a motion by Council Member Berge and seconded by Council Member um, Christofferson, this item has been moved. Um, is there a discussion before we vote? Seeing none, clerk, please call the roll. Council Member Rager? Aye. Strobel? Aye. Weld? Aye. Worthman? Aye. Anderson? Aye. Beaton? Aye. Kirby? Aye. Mr. Jefferson? Aye. Emanuel? Aye. And that item passes. We move to item 16. This is regarding grants. This is specifically a resolution accepting and appropriating a recreational trail grant from the Department of Natural Resources for the use uh, along downtown Riverwalk between the Confluence and Lake Street. As a note, this project, because it would amend our budget, needs a two-third vote of the elected members or eight affirmative votes required for adoption. Mr. Koala, good afternoon. Good evening. Um, uh, some months back, we applied for a, a grant that is um, distributed by the Department of Natural Resources to help cover the cost of, of our recreational trails. Um, we were recently notified that the grant for the trail section from the um, Haymarket Plaza to Lake Street would, was uh, awarded um, to f up to $45,000. And this particular um, item on your agenda is to appropriate funding for such. If there's any questions, I'll be happy to entertain those. Council members have questions on this trail, the design of it? Council Member Strobel? Um, thank you. The, the, um, the, that section of trails included in the CIP for construction this summer, correct? That's, that's okay. my understanding. That's correct. Thank you. You. Further questions on this trail grant? See none. Thank you, Mr. Qual. You're very welcome. Um, did you want to present on the next item too? Sure. <laughs> uh, item number 17 it, in, is in regards to a, a similar grant that is um, tied to the Recreational Trails Act that is uh, managed by the Department of Natural Resources. We have also been notified that we're we have been awarded forty-five thousand dollars to. Um, repair the stairwell from the birch picnic area on the east end of half moon lake which extends up into carson park you may know that those uh those stairs have um deteriorated quite a bit in the last several years to the point where we 
have to block them off. They're essentially becoming unsafe. We do have um, um, our city engineering departments uh, assisting us with design. We will certainly want to recreate um, the look and ambiance of that stairwell as there is a sitting bench halfway up the up the, the bank and um, we'll, it'll make, after the completion of the causeway, it'll really make a nice connection um, to get to the upper side of Carson Park. And again, $45,000 for that will, will be assistance from the DNR for that grant. Thank you, Mr. Kuala. Are there questions from council regarding this Birch Street um, grant? Or sorry, not Birch Street, Birch Picnic Area Step Rehabilitation. Council Member Gregor. Uh, thank you, Acting President Worthman. Thank you, uh, Mr. Kuala. Uh, I was wondering the design of this staircase. I, I know right now it's made up mostly of stone which is like pretty cool. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it feels like you're going up into a castle or something. Mm -hmm. So I guess I was wondering what kind of material you were going to use to reconstruct the stairwell. It, it likely would not be stone. It would more than likely be a form liner replicating the land in stone, which would be, would be concrete. It would, it would certainly have the look of the stone that is there, though. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member. Council Member Emanuel. Thank you, Acting President Worthman. And this is more of a, a financial question, so I'm happy to volley this to somebody else if you feel that's better. So I understand this is um, a cost share grant. Um, is this coming out of the CIP, or is this? Correct. For okay. this particular yep. project, it's in our uh, Fund 450, which is the Parks Capital Improvement Plan. We had budgeted to uh, $50,000 for this project, and this the this will match it to well nearly half uh, of $45,000, which will more than more than or hopefully will cover the whole cost with that that half from the Department of Natural Resources. Sure, thank you. Mm -hmm. So the way it was budgeted was anticipating <coughs> crossing our fingers that you'd receive some matching funds. Yes, ma'am. And then um, in the event that uh, the city budgets for, let's say, a CIP project and grant dollars exceed what the city's uh, previous commitment was, what happens to then the balance? So let's say if there's $5,000 remaining, where does that go? I believe that that would go into the overall uh, citywide trail program. It would still be earmarked for, for trail work and that would carry over. I believe. Oh. Nope, I'm, I'm lying to you. <laughs> no, you're trying Thank your you. best. <laughs> Thank you, Jay. <clears throat> um, it, it depends upon the type of, um, we've got kind of two different types of funds within our, uh, within our CIP. We have those mm -hmm. Uh, projects that lapse um, at the end of every year, and we've got those projects that um, that um, are non-recurring projects uh, that uh, have three years to spend the money. Um, our trail program is is a recurring program; happens year after year. Those funds at the end of the year lapse and just go back into the uh, fund balance uh, for uh, for that particular capital fund, and then they have to be reappropriated. Um, the next year, uh, for um, if they're if they're going to be spent on another capital capital project. May I ask a follow up, please? Sure. Thank you. So, what happens if um, you didn't receive the grant, and you know you've got budgeted fifty thousand dollars, let's say, and it really would cost about ninety thousand? What happens then? We would we would budget, we would come back with additional budget requests in our capital program for the following year. Okay, thank you very You're much, welcome. and congrats for the grant, and thanks for your work on that. I know a lot of the city departments work really hard to um, stretch the dollars, so thank you for looking for those opportunities. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jay. <coughs> thank you. <clears throat> then on a motion by council member, um, yeah, item number 16. Then on a motion by council member Strobel, seconded by council member Anderson, Item 16, this resolution is regarding our uh, recreational trail grant along the confluence down to Lake Street has been moved. Are there uh, any comments, motions, thoughts or feelings on this item before we vote? I see none. Clerk, please call the roll. Councilmember Strobel? Aye. Weld? Aye. Anderson? Aye. Anderson? Aye. Eaton? Aye. 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 Aye
Aye. And that item passes. We move then to item 17. This resolution again is accepting and appropriating recreational tra trail grant from the Department of Natural Resources for the Birch Picnic Area Step Rehabilitation at Carson Park. Um, on a motion then by Council Member Catherine Emanuel, Emanuel and seconded by Council Member Weld. This item will be moved. Is there any discussion on this step rehabilitation program? Seeing no. Please call the roll. Councilmember Weld? Aye. Workman? Aye. Anderson? Aye. Beaton? Aye. Kirby? Aye. Ms. Jefferson? Aye. Emmanuel? Aye. Brigert? Aye. Strobel? Aye. And that item passes. We move to item 18 on our business agenda this evening. This is an agreement, specifically an agreement um, and memo of understanding between the City of Eau Claire and Eau Claire American Baseball. Mr. Jeff Pippinger is here this evening with details. Good evening. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Thank you, Acting Council President Worthman. Before the City Council is a memorandum of understanding by and between the City of Eau Claire and the Amer Eau Claire American Baseball. This MOU is for the use of the Fairfax Park baseball fields for the term of five years with an automatic five-year extension. This memorandum of understanding includes the responsibilities of the city, the Eau Claire American Baseball, scheduling, field preparation, concession sales and operations, capital improvement goals, and insurance requirements, indemnification, and hold harmless provisions. The Department of Community Services finds that this partnership will be beneficial to the parties and the community as a whole by providing valuable recreational programming to the youth of Eau Claire. The applicant is not here tonight, but uh, I'd be happy to answer any questions you might have. Thank you. Council members have questions regarding this agreement? See any? Thank you again. Thanks for your work on this. Then on a motion by Council Member Beaton, seconded by Council Member Gragger, item number 18 has been moved, open for discussion. No discussion. Madam City Clerk, please call the roll. Aye. 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 And that item passes. We are then on to item 19 on our business agenda. This is a resolution approving appointments and reappointments for various boards, commissions, and committees, namely RDA appointments. Um, my apologies. RDA appointments require, as a note, they require four-fifths vote of the city council for adoption. Bring it up here real quick. So on this item, uh, we met, uh, our advisory committee on appointments met last week, I believe it was, and recommended um, the following appointments for the Bicycle and Pedestrian Committee. Um, a new appointment to an unexpired three-year term of, for Kyle Brilliard. Uh, we have a new appointment of an unexpired term to expire December 31st, 2020 of JJ Henriksen, and a new appointment to an unexpired three-year term December 31st, 2021 of Scott, Scott Larson. We also recommend uh, to the City Council the, for the Redevelopment Authority a new appointment to a five-year term to expire December 31st, 2023 of Wayne Willey, and for the South Barstow Business Improvement District, new appointments to three-year terms, again, on the South Barstow Business Improvement District. These would be up in December 31st, 2021 of Julia Johnson, Vicki Maluski, and Aaron Salmon. And lastly, the Waterways and Parks Commission, we recommended a new appointment to an unexpired three-year term of Joseph Maurer. Are there any questions that council members may have of um, the appointments committee members, which is myself, um, council member Beaton, council member Zhang is not here this evening. Do you have any questions regarding um, our appointments? Council member Gragger? Uh, thank you, acting president. Um, I guess I was wondering, um, one of the redevelopment authority positions was left uh, open, is that correct? And, and maybe we could describe uh, 
the nature of that position on the RDA and, and our need to fill it and maybe the type of candidates we're looking for so we can maybe get the word out about it? So I'll address that. Um, we, we, uh, we did meet and review all of the candidates. Um, and the way that, that it works with RDA is that um, those who serve continue to serve until we find a replacement. So it's not as if there's a gap right now. Um, and just given the field of candidates and the expertise, we wanted to try and see if we could broaden out um, for, for more applicants. So um, I can kind of and maybe work with our city manager as well, who's been doing a lot of hard work to get the word out. But um, our hope is to have more applicants and um, potentially look for different expertise. Um, so we left that. We decided not to appoint for both positions this time, but we meet every month to two months, and there's a likelihood that next month we will appoint. Councilor B, do you want to add to that question? Um, no, I, that's a, a good summary. Okay. Um, I did have a, a question, though. Sure. Maybe uh, Acting President Rithman, you might be able to help jog a memory. Um, I, I remember a different appointment for Waterways and Parks uh, Commission. Um. Yeah, I think maybe we could. I would actually like to call for just a quick um, couple minute recess to, to make sure that we're getting that correct. Um, we'll work with Kathy Morrell and readjourn in a couple minutes if, if the council's okay with that. So I think um, we just want to make absolutely sure that uh, uh, the decision was the one that we had that we had made, and so we're going to actually request to postpone that specific uh, waterways and parks recommendation. Um, I think both Councilmember Beaton and I uh, just want to make sure and, and work with um, Ms. Morrell too to make sure that we're um, all on the same page about that. Uh, suggestion, but we will have another meeting coming up in probably a month or two, and so we'll make sure we get that one um, squared away. So, um, I suppose um, we'll, we'll move this, and then um, it would be Councilmember Strobel. Do you have a question um, before we move it? I, I do. Thank you. Sure. Um, just uh, um, maybe the redevelopment authority again. Sure. Um, what do you look for specific qualifications? For these individuals, um, I know it's it's maybe not specified there. Like you know, Landmarks Commission is pretty much specified. You have to have a couple of architects, a real estate person, blah blah blah. Redevelopment authority. Or really, I don't, I don't know. Are, are there any actually qualifications that that you guys sort of look to when you're looking for somebody on those committees? So I'll I'll answer that question. Um, I think the the biggest qualification is is knowing the finances, especially in a TIF district, and and how. Um, you know, how to work with uh, increment. Um, and I think obviously, you know, we kind of look for that first and foremost, but then if um, it's someone in the lending community or a community that's relevant, um, uh, organization or, or business that's relevant to, um, to the redevelopment authority is sort of the, the other big qualification. Um, and, and beyond that, we've also talked about the, um, you know, hoping that there's a sort of a uh, focus or an interest in looking at how do we include more affordable housing as well. Um, and so those are just a few of the, the discussions that we've had at appointments committee about things that we're looking for um, in, in approving someone for this. Council Member Beaton. Just to add to that, um, it's, it's our understanding in um, communication with staff that um, staff has been um, searching for um, somebody who kind of fits that bill with, um, with you know, the right type of experience to bring a strong um, sort of perspective to the RDA that, um, and that, uh, and, and with sort of an affordable housing lens um, and an equity lens, but uh, it's been a, a challenge to find somebody living within this city who's willing. Um, and so certainly if, if anybody has any uh, recommendations for the committee and for staff, please bring them forward. Councilmember Brie Emanuel. Thank you, President Worthman. Um, 
I would just add on to that that the the RDA has been able to function very well with um, people who are willing to serve, who have a real passion for this community, and so they do continue to serve. Um, but we are governed by a Wisconsin state statute, and I can read a little bit of the qualifications that um, have to go into the criteria. Um, it says that um, the appointing power shall give due consideration um, I'll skip to a uh, couple of the descriptive words to, from the general public, labor, industry, finance, business group, and civic organizations, and that appointees shall have sufficient ability and experience in related fields, especially in the fields of finance and management, to assure efficiency in the redevelopment program, its planning and direction. Helpful. Thank you. Does that help answer your question, Councilmember Strobel? It does, and then and then the follow-up question of that, of course, is um, um, the the appointment there. I, what what qualifications? You know, in the past, I think, and you can you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I th thought the appointments committee sort of sent out the applications that the, the people filled out to us in the past. I could be wrong, but I I didn't see anything on this applicant. You know, in order for me to make a judgment, um, is there anything you have you can share, or do we? I think I'll, I'll direct that to the city manager or to Ms. Merle. Do we send out the packet? I believe the packet went out to the co council in addition to the council members, or the advisory committee members. So I, I believe that packet does go out to the full council. <coughs> Do other council members, have other council members seen the, the packet of appointments? No? Okay. Um, oh, I suppose, um, you know, I, I'll, you know, we can, if, if, if there's a desire to postpone once this has been moved, we can make that, um, but, and, and to, to get more information, but council member Beaton. Um, so your point is well made, uh, council member Strobel and, um, the, uh, that maybe something that we can take up in the committee. Um, but I, uh, uh, and are you asking specifically about Mr. Willie? Or, or just any of the applicants? Yes, and the old, you know, all of them, I guess. Um, okay. If, if, I'm sorry. Uh, you, yeah, your, your mic's on. Um, yeah, we used to get, you know, I, I know they fill out the applications for the city, and we used to get, get those emailed to us. So we could at least have an idea. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Okay, so uh, Ms. Morrell is, is clarifying that the, the packet did go out, but you may not have seen it in your emails. Um, I think if there's a desire to postpone, that, that's certainly okay. Um, if council, council would like to take these up in two weeks um, and have a look over the packet, that's totally fine. The, um, you know, I, think, I think that's okay. So we'll, let's move the item and then we'll take up that. Um, council member uh, Beaton and myself will move this um, list of recommendations floor is open. Councilmember Gregor. Thank you, Worthman. I, I do know I've received this packet in the past, so I, I do recall reading about most of the folks um, because they had applied in some cases more than a year ago, um, and I'm very comfortable with, with all of them. Um, and uh, I did for, for for Mr. Willie, for example, for RDA, um, I did recommend to a member of the RDA that he would be a good choice. <laughs> um, so I am familiar with his background, but um, but I, I'm certainly fine if, if folks feel like there's more time that's needed um, to be able to to research um, what what the applicants have put forward uh, when they filled out the citizen resource bank form, so. Thank you, council member Gregor. Yeah, I'm looking back in the email and I can see that this um, advisory committee on appointments packet was sent to the entire council, but you may have, may have not seen it in your in, in inbox. Do council members, um, would you like to postpone this item? Council member Emanuel. Thank you, Acting President Orthman. I would be, uh, I would prefer to vote on it tonight. We did, everybody received a packet dated on February 7th, 2019, with the full packet of the Advisor Committee on Appointments. Um, so I do feel that uh, Council has had more than sufficient notice to review the materials. 
And also, um, you know, I, I, I trust my colleagues on their vetting process and I uh, respect and appreciate the work that they've done there. Um, sounds like there's some clarification needed just around one of the uh, uh, nominated um, appointees, but other than that, I'd be prepared to vote on this this evening. Okay. Councilmember Strobel. I would just like to postpone the RDA for two weeks. Okay, is that a motion to pull that consideration separate? That, that is. Okay, do you have a second? Is there a second to do RDA separate? Councilmember Anderson? Would you like to speak to it, Councilmember Strobel? Uh, no, I, ju I just, um, I guess I, I didn't have the email and I can't, can't seem to find it. And so I wouldn't mind, you know, two weeks, um, if that's not going to hurt anything, just to review the uh, qualifications of the RDA member. Okay. Further discussion on this motion to separately consider, well, I suppose, um, do we have to vote on uh, separating this? Um, City Attorney? Help me out separating what um, this? Councilmember Strobel wants to separate um, the RDA consideration separately. He wants to take that up separately. I want to pull water with his tail. Right. Uh, I think you can, you can kind of divide the question like that by your okay. declaration or okay. by, by the request of any member. Okay. So I think you're fine. So, um, so that we're clear, what we'll do is um, we're going to vote on uh, the recommendations minus RDA and minus waterways and parks. Uh, waterways and parks and RDA are being, actually they're both, well, we'll keep them three separate. RDA and waterways and parks are both being recommended for postponement, but we'll first just take up the recommendations um, that are not being considered for postponement, which is Bicycle and Pedestrian Commission, South Barstow. So on those two, um, we're gonna take up a vote to accept the recommendations of the advisory committee. Does everyone understand that? Just on those two. Okay. Um, clerk, please call the roll. Councilmember Anderson? Aye. Meaton? Aye. Burvey? Aye. Christofferson? Aye. Emmanuel? Aye. Gregor? Aye. Strobel? Aye. Weld? Aye. Horstman? Aye. Sorry, I didn't turn your lights on. Then we will move to consider postponement of RDA, which was a motion made by Councilmember Strobel and Anderson. Is there any discussion on that item before we vote? Councilmember Emanuel. Thank you, Acting President Worthman. Uh, I will be voting no on that. Um, in reviewing the um, nominee's um, credentials, it fits very well within state statute of uh, this person is an investment portfolio manager, has experience in wealth management, has um, experience um, uh, as in the finance world as a banker, a trust officer, as well as having educational background in economics, which plays a big role in uh, these decision makings, plus a wealth of um, civic leadership, including faith-based communities, sports, um, food security, um, there's no reason in my mind to to uh, to delay this for this individual. So I'm I, I think it's helpful just to um, advance this. Okay, thank you, Council Member. Uh, Council Member Beaton. Um, thank you. Um, I, I normally I would I would say um, I'm always up for taking a little bit more time. Um, at, we should maybe consider that. Um, Members who are trying to leave uh, their appointment would um, would need to stay in order to until we we reappoint their seat, um, and so um, so consider as you're making the, your decision consider that um, you know there are folks who are ready to do, to move on to something else. So thank you, Councilmember Beaton. Is there any further discussion on? The motion to postpone the specific item, Councilmember Strobel. I will withdraw my motion. Okay. Um, that motion has been withdrawn. So we still have to vote to approve it, though. <clears throat> so, 
could we get a motion um, for um, approval of this? Council Member Emmanuel, seconded by Council Member Beaton, to approve the recommendation specifically on RDA. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, clerk, please call the roll. This is specifically just on RDA, the RDA appointment. Aye. Christopherson? Aye. Emmanuel? Aye. Rager? Aye. Strobel? Aye. Wells? Aye. Hartman? Aye. Anderson? Aye. And that item passes. Then I would like to make a motion uh, and seek a second to postpone the Waterways and Parks appointment until the next meeting. And Councilmember Beaton is seconding. Is there any discussion on that item? Seeing none, clerk, please call the roll. Councilmember Berge? Aye. Jefferson? Aye. Emmanuel? Aye. Rigert? Aye. Strobel? Aye. Wells? Aye. Worthman? Aye. Anderson? Aye. Aye. And that passes. We move then, and thank you all, and again, um, if, if I could recommend uh, council members who want to work on helping to get out the word in the community, um, please be in touch with our city manager. Um, who is and staff who are also doing their uh, work to, to make sure that the word gets out um, and see how you can plug in and, and help. It's, it's a really a team effort. Uh, we want to make sure we have as many applicants as possible. It's always better to have more applicants um, for any of these positions. So thank you for um, offering to help. We'll move then to our ordinances for action this evening. First up is item number 20. This is an ordinance amending chapter 6.14 entitled The Keeping of Honeybees of the Code of Ordinances of the City of Eau Claire. This item was postponed from our January 21st and 22nd City Council meeting. Do council members this evening have questions on the ordinance as we heard presented last night? Any questions? I don't see any. Then on a motion by, I'm not even sure where, where we were, we'll just start again. Council Member Gragert, seconded by Council Member Berge. This item has been moved. Is there discussion? Council Member Welt. Thank you, Acting President. Uh, first of all, I, I appreciate the, uh, the compromise uh, in regards to the uh, consensus and the 40% mm -hmm. um, within the neighborhoods. Um, but my only concern is, and it more or less is just a, more will end up being a recommendation, but um, it is the same as it was last October when you know, more or less we're removing the, the neighbor talking to neighbor um, part of the equation. Um, I think that it, it's worked in the past when the neighbors took the time to go out and, and knock on doors and introduce themselves and, and, and talk about their idea and talk about how it works and what it looks like and, and answer questions. And, you know, I, I know it was mentioned several times last night in regards to the importance of neighbors talking to neighbors and what that means in regards to safety and crime. And um, I think as a community, it's a win-win. Um, when we can put it uh, in the neighbor's hands to, to, to work these things out and sort through them. Um, I know my experience on planning commission, whenever someone comes before us in regards to a conditional use permit for our, for our in-home business, you know, the first question we always ask is, have you spoken with your neighbors so that they understand what your business is and what it looks like? And so often they're, they're not taking that time and then so often we're getting so many neighbors coming in and objecting. So again, I think it, it helps the, the beekeepers if they do take that time. And my only recommendation would be that if we can ask staff to you know, either somehow recommend it uh, to the applicant, whether it's put in big red letters, please talk to your neighbors, um, or if it's part of the notice that's sent out, and I'm not sure if this is uh, appropriate or not, but if, if the name of the applicant and their phone number could be there, um, so that if the neighbor does have questions, that they can refer to the neighbor uh, with those questions. So really, I just want to get back to that idea, and, but I understand, too, it's almost spring, or it will be spring sometime, and we need to get moving on this. So, Thank you. Thank you for those recommendations, Councilmember Weld. Uh, further uh, comments? Councilmember Christofferson. Thank you, Acting President Worthman. Um, I really appreciate the clarity um, that has come to this ordinance as a result of all of the work and the, the conversation around it. I will um, join Councilmember Weld in that idea of it's really nice to promote 
that connectivity not only with our sidewalks but with our relationships and with our conversation. I like the idea that maybe this letter that's mailed out would indicate who the license uh, applicant might be. But um, I'm, I'm really grateful that this is not asking that single um, person who is, is not in favor of coming to council for some kind of um, decision. Mm -hmm. So I, I think that this is really uh, good for our community. I think it um, allows us to be connected with our, our food source and um, is a good opportunity for families. Thank you, Council Member Christofferson. Any further comments, Council Member Strobel? Um, thank you, and this is, this is for my fellow council members. I just want to throw it out there, maybe get a little thought on it. I, I want to, just a couple things I was thinking about and see if anybody else has the same thoughts or not, but under number five and six, and I asked a question about that last night, those large acreages, um, 10 acres but smaller than 49 acres, there, there can still be 49 hives, and then 49 acres and over. And the, the indication was really the only spots those could potentially be weren't necessarily private homeowners in the city but but potentially uh schools or school districts mm -hmm. um it's it's a lot of hives for me um especially I, I thought of a couple things i thought about well either we limit it the number of hives and maybe it wouldn't be such a big deal or if in fact we're going to allow that many hives then i wouldn't mind seeing us at least put the requirement back in there that we were talking about when they were in public parks about um, enclosures and perimeters. Um, and, and one of the things I was thinking about was like South Middle School. So if, if they have a lot of hives there, um, you know, you have the American Baseball League, Fairfax Park is right there, this pool. Um, you know, kids, kids are kids and, you know, is it possible some junior high kids might want to vandalize those hives someday and knock them over. If you knock them over, the bees are going to swarm. I, I don't know, I wouldn't, we don't have any requirements here and I wouldn't mind us seeing us at least if we're gonna allow these to at least require the enclosure. That's, that's my thought and I'll wait to hear from my fellow council members. Thank you, Council Member Strobel. Council Member Weld. Thank you, Mr. President. I, I guess I would support the, the mover's intentions there um, in regards more, more than anything, just the safety issue of it. Um, and if it is going to be kept, or if they are going to be kept in our schools and our school grounds, I, I think it'd be nice to have some parameters set so that there's an understanding there and some safeguards in the event that something does happen. Thank you, Council Member Weld. Um, Council Member Emanuel. Thank you, Acting President Orthman. Um, I think Councilmember was um, Strobel. Was that a, um, a a statement? It wasn't a motion just yet. Is that correct? It was just a discussion. Okay. Um, so I am not an expert on bees. Let me just fly that flag right out in front. Um, you know, I, I would think that each school campus has to go through their own risk management process um, on their own, and so I don't know what that looks like. But I also think about. Um, I don't know how to say this, but sometimes I think we imagine some um, reality about, we'll say, bees in this example that, um, you know, they're out to, to hurt people um, sometimes. And, of course, if they were provoked, of course, who wouldn't and what creature wouldn't do that? But it seems that, you know, for the most part, um, you know, these are very docile creatures. They're they're doing their work with their queen and... Um, to be making additional um, safety measures when a school is likely going to be doing their own risk um, assessment, I, I, I think I'm, I know I'm comfortable just to, you know, let's try this out, let the schools work out those logistics, knowing that for the large majority, um, you know, bees are very docile worker bees. Thank you, Council Member Emanuel. Um, I'll also follow up on that, Council Member Strobel. Um, so this, as you know, one of the leading um, uh, conversations has been the tech college that's looking at doing a class, which is specifically, um, you know, they were involved in the conversation about this. The, the um, school, the Eau Claire School District has not expressed an interest to date, and I 
would assume that even if they did, that they would, as Councilman Emanuel said, go through their own um, safety precautions. But not only that, but you have to work on an entire checklist with the health department about whether your uh, practice is safe or not, our, ins our inspectors. Um, and so I think my feeling is that there's enough safeguards in here in the process of setting this up that it's it would be done in a safe manner even if there was that um, I think unlikely chance that a school one of our schools would do it I'm not talking about tech but I'm talking about our Eau Claire area school district um, so I think that's that's sort of my what I would say I would say the the other thing is is it the the large acreage this recommendation of one hive per acre is sort of a standard that that's essentially enough space for a, a bee colony one you know one box essentially to be able to have enough to forage and that sort of thing so that's where the one hive per acre comes from um, but again I think my sense is that if a school like South wanted to do this there'd be a lot of uh, proactive sort of safety measures put in place by the school district and then they would be working directly with our our health department to make sure that it's that it's safe so I hope that kind of answers the question too Council members have other um, comments. Uh, Council member Berge. Thank you. I, yeah, my understanding from sitting on the Board of Health when we talked about this was that it was more designated towards CVTC and their program. So I really don't remember any conversations about elementary schools, middle schools, high schools. So, And another point, too, is I know the Health Department did a, the, a lot of vetting through this ordinance, so I do trust their judgment as well. Thank you, Council Member Berkey. Any further comments before we potentially vote, or if Council Member Strobel has an am amendment? No, Council Member? No, no amendment. Just uh, th 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 thank uh, thank uh, staff and, and everybody here, Council as well. When we worked on this, and and we uh, we came through with some suggestions, and they came back with an, uh, um, a resolution that sort of uh, addressed all those. And I'm I'm very happy that we um, have taken the bees out of the parks uh, for now as well. So I will support this. Thanks. Uh, seeing no further desire for comment, clerk, please call the roll on this ordinance. Councilmember Christopherson? Aye. Emanuel? Aye. Braggart? Aye. Strobel? Aye. Wells? Aye. Worthman? Aye. Anderson? Aye. Eaton? Aye. Berge? Aye. And that ordinance passes. We move to our item on the agenda, which is item 21. This is regarding our dockless bicycle share program. This ordinance would create chapter 5.64 entitled Dockless Bicycle Share and amend section 10.08100 entitled Parking. Last evening, um, Mr. Ivory, uh, Ms. Stromberger had a presentation for us and we went through a lot of different details at that point. Do council members have follow-up questions um, regarding the presentation that we heard last night on the Dockless Bicycle Share program? Any questions? Okay, I already see a few coming. Councilmember Gregor, do you want to go first? Oh, sure. Um, thank you, Acting President. I think that, uh, I guess I have a question about a time frame that we are proposing here for, for companies to be able to, to bring and operate um, a dockless bicycle share system. So um, I guess the month of November kind of came to mind as a, as a possibility of a way to to extend the season a bit um, of bicycle share. So I guess wondering if staff had uh, any thoughts about whether that would be something that would be that much different than the fact that March is included um, and the temperatures are roughly the same and the sn snow, um, except for maybe this here is probably, uh, the snow cover is about the same between November. Um, so. Uh, I guess from an operational standpoint and from an ordinance standpoint, I was wondering if there was a thought on that, uh, on adding November. Our city manager, Peters. Thank you, Acting President Worthman. Uh, staff talked about this this morning, and we would not see any uh, operational you know, challenges with extending it through November. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Council Member Berge, did you have a question? Thank you, Acting President Worthman. I was wondering about... Um, how the locations of the bike share places were um, identified and if there's flexibility with that. I'm just looking at the map, thinking about the north side, and there's not many 
well, there's nothing on the northeast side unless there's something under this graph. Um, and there's only one on the way by the dog park, which is great on Sundet. But I just wonder if there's flexibility with that and how it was chosen. Um, Ms. Ness, do you want to address that or Ms. Driver? Mr. Ivory and myself looked at different public locations throughout the city, um, plotted different uh, public properties, looked at community parks, worked with the community services department, parks and rec department on identifying which parks we thought would be a good location at um, just to start out with. And we decided to include the community parks for a starting point and then work with the vendors. Um, we also, when we looked at locations, looked at the transit routes to see if there's any way to include the last mile um, and decided that as a vendor comes on board, it's something that we'd be able to work with them on potentially identifying locations with our transit group um, if it would be a good fit for their company to have locations uh, outside of what's desired or shown on these maps. These are just starting points. And then also, th these the companies are not limited to these locations either. They can contract with private properties, um, private businesses to locate on those locations as well. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Are there further questions um, for Ms. Ness or Ms. Drivery? I guess I wanted to follow up on one, uh, Ms. Ness, and I had uh, emailed with Stromberger earlier, but regarding the lighting on the bikes, so um, I understand that it's state law that anyone who operates a bicycle is supposed to have the proper lighting at night, but I still am a little unclear about whether that's the bicycle that has to have it or whether the rider themselves has to have it. Do you know that? I'll let Janessa answer okay. that. Sure, so state law um, requires um, either one. It says that the bike has to be equipped with it or the rider can have similar equivalent lighting on themselves, presumably you know, on their helmet or something okay. like that. So it's an either or situation. Hmm. So, and, and we just say that through this program you need to follow state law, but we don't specify. We just say follow state law. That's correct. Okay, that, that helps, thank you. Okay. Are there any further questions that council may have um, regarding this ordinance? Seeing none, then on a motion by council member Christofferson, seconded by council member Strobel. Okay. This item has been moved and is open for discussion. Council member Strobel. Believe it or not, I'd like to propose an amendment. Um, under the re licensee requirements, and then if I get a second, I can speak to it, but I, I would like to add a different one as number one and move them all down one number, but number one, I'd like to see in bold letters on their app to their riders, no riding on downtown sidewalks. That's my amendment. Okay. Um, do we have a second for the amendment that Council Member Strobel is proposing? Any second? Council member, um, I think we'll go with Anderson on this one. Um, Council member Strobel, I recognize yeah, you. Thank you, it, it's just, um, we're, we're trying really hard right now downtown to, to uh, let the bikers and the um, skateboarders know that they're, they're not supposed to be on the downtown sidewalks. We've got the uh, applications going on the crosswalks and on the poles, and the majority of these bikes are probably gonna get used downtown. I mean, they're, they're, the racks are gonna be downtown in that. And, and just to refer people to local ordinance and stuff is not going to allow them to know that they shouldn't be riding on the sidewalk. And then down number five, they, they say no, um, no motor engagement operating on the sidewalks. Well, the fact is our ordinance 
doesn't allow bicycles to be driven on downtown sidewalks. Um, and so I think it's only fair for us to require it on the application so that the people that are renting these bikes know that they shouldn't be riding them on the downtown sidewalks. Um, and that's, it's a safety concern and um, I just think it's more fair to the, the users too that, because it really doesn't specify anywhere in here, you can't, you can't ride bikes on the downtown sidewalks. So that's my reason. Just, would you be able to repeat your amendment? Pardon? Would you be able to repeat your amendment? Um, the yes, language? I, I would add either as number one on the license requirement under 5.64.050 on page 74, I would add either in number as number one rule or either in bold over all the rules, just no riding on downtown sidewalks. So that would, you're saying that Councilor Strobel, you're saying that that would just be in the ordinance, but are you requesting that it be listed in the app or anything? You're, you yeah, want yeah. it to be listed in the app as well? In, in the app, because that's one of our requirements here in the application that, that we're gonna, the applicant's gonna have to put in their, their app to the people that ride the bikes, all these different rules they have here, please wear a helmet, mm -hmm. um, yield to pedestrians and sidewalks, those types of things, but it doesn't say anywhere on here there's an ordinance against riding bikes on downtown sidewalks. Please don't do that. Okay. So. Um, further comments on the amendment being proposed by Councilmember Strobel, Councilmember Gregor. Thank you, Acting President Worthman. I, I do think it is important to to point this out to people because it obviously is a major safety issue to have bicyclists riding on the sidewalks downtown. Um, but I guess. I was wondering maybe if, if staff would have a recommendation that is in line with um, our Walk Your Wheels program um, that maybe is along those lines in terms of messaging that is maybe a little bit less harsh, <laughs> although obviously it's a serious matter. Um, so something to the effect of please walk bicycles on downtown sidewalks or something like that could be a substitute for you know, just saying no. Um, considering that we've tried to roll out a program that is a little bit more um, positive in messaging, mm -hmm. I guess. I would accept that as a friendly. Okay. okay. Councilmember Anderson, you accept I, it as a friendly too? Yes. Okay. Okay, are there further, further discussion on the uh, amendment being proposed regarding the rules? Uh, did you want to add to it? Or um, City Attorney Nick? Yeah, as long as we have a little discretion in kind of crafting that, but it, like what I quickly w wrote down was, you know, walk your wheels on downtown sidewalks uh, and you know, where required or something like that. And I think <clears throat> the point of, of all those is there might be some ability to modify the exact language when it actually hits an app, but it, it's making sure we communicate that information, we communicate it accurately, uh, knowing that um, our maps on where you can ride or where you need to walk your wheels uh, change from time to time, and um, I think that's the concept, and we'll make sure we, if this is passed, that, that we'll, we'll get that in there. Any further comments on the proposed amendment? Seeing none, we're going to vote on it then. Clerk, please call the roll. Councilor Emanuel? Aye. Gregor? Aye. Strobel? Aye. Weld? Aye. Worthman? Aye. Anderson? Aye. Eaton? Aye. Berge? Aye. Stafferson? Aye. And that amendment passes. We're back to the ordinance on the table as amended. Any further comments, amendments, thoughts, Council, Councilmember Gregor? Yeah, thank you, Acting President Worthman. Um, I um, just wanted to show appreciation, certainly for, for all the work that has gone into this before I offer a few amendments that would <laughs> help strengthen it, I believe. Um, but the, uh, but certainly I, I think I, like at, at the, the um, at a minimum I want to recognize the fact that I, I think students really have been, students at UW-Eau Claire have really been kind of the driving force behind this for for quite a few years and obviously have had had great allies on the council and among staff to explore 
this um, over the years too, but the technology has changed over time and the, um, and the needs of the community have changed and, and of the campus. Um, and the campus has certainly started to be more active in our, our downtown as well. Um, so, I, so I think this is an appropriate way to go forward is to an ordinance that allows for dockless bicycle sh sharing and really still will be in many ways an experiment to see how it works here. Although we've, had, we've heard good things from other communities like Green Bay that are pretty similar to us. Um, so I just wanted to acknowledge all the hard, hard work that has gone into this and that it's really been driven by a lot of advocacy and, and a lot of need out there as well, I think, particularly from, from UW Eau Claire students. And I think it'll be a tourism a boon for the community as well and for, for businesses that are really um, sometimes struggling with, with how people can access their business. So um, I do want to offer a few uh, amendments out there, <laughs> however. Um, one of them I'll pass out would allow for the month of November to be included as a, a time to operate um, bicycle share in the city of Eau Claire. So I'm going to pass out what that would look like in the, in the ordinance itself. So <clears throat> That would require that the, so the, the motion that I'd like to, to make would be that rather than, than uh, the license period shall run from March 1 through October 31st, it would be March 1 through November 30th. And then later on, uh, we would mention the month of, it would strike the month of November from the, from the, um, from the licensee re requirement, uh, from the, from the unlicensed time period. So. Um, thank you, Council Member McGregor. Uh, Council Member Beaton, are you seconding this? Okay. Um, Council Member McGregor. I can Board certainly members. explain sure. the rationale here, and I appreciated the time today having staff um, also consider this. The, uh, the fact that right now the month of March is included um, when, if this were, were to pass and we were to, to have a bike share company suddenly be able to spring up in two days, which is unlikely, <laughs> they could actually start operating on Friday of this week, um, which is like pretty hard to imagine with all the snow. Um, so like it really is up to the company to decide when it's, when it makes sense for them to roll out a, a, their, their bicycles. And also, there's a number of provisions within here that, that make sure that a snow event is taken into account or that um, if it does snow, that, that, that the bikes need to be moved so that snow can be cleared. Um, I think having the month of November really helps a lot in term, because typically there isn't a lot of snow that really sticks around in the month of November like we're about to see in March. Um, and then also it really, um, does not get quite as cold, although it feels colder for some reason <laughs> in November than it does in March because 40 degrees feels a lot different in each month. But um, I think that there's good reason for to leave it up to the company to decide when within the month of November they would want to take down operations or maybe it would even be in October. But one of the, the reasons for including November is that, that I think it'd be really um, great if people could ride the bicycles to the polls in the November election. Um, so it improves access to our polling locations uh, if the bicycle share system is still operating in November. Um, so that's kind of my reasoning for this and um, just putting that out there okay. for folks for discussion. Thank you, Council Member Gregor. Uh, any further discussion on this amendment? Council Member Strobel. I'm, I'm prepared to support this. I'm just, I'm just glad you didn't make it year round. And so uh, I'll support the November. Councilor Strobel, thank you. Uh, any further comments before we vote? Um, seeing none, clerk, please call the roll. Council member Gregor? Aye. Strobel? Aye. Wells? Aye. Anderson? Aye. 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 
Aye. Aye. Aye. And that amendment passes. Council Member Gregor, did you have another amendment you would like to make? Yeah, thank you, Acting President Worthman. I, I do have another amendment. This one's a little bit more complicated. <laughs> um, and this is actually uh, an amendment not within the dockless bicycle share ordinance itself, because there's actually a included within within this is an ordinance change to parking for bicycles mm -hmm. at the at the very end of the, the document. So it'd be helpful for my colleagues to actually bring that up uh, if if they can. Um, the uh, parking provisions. Yeah. So it's it's five point six, or actually it's ten. Point oh eight, point one hundred uh, for parking, um, and right now it's actually just there's actually just one sentence in that that describes um, as it's currently written in our ordinances. There's just one sentence that really describes our you know the the do's and don'ts of of parking a bicycle in the city of Eau Claire. Um, so I understand certainly why we need to expand upon that, um, but I'm going to pass out changes uh, that are um, essentially amending what the proposal is in our packet. Um, okay. And then I'll try to describe it and justify it. <laughs> well, if you want to, if we could get it up on the screen and then if you want to Oh yeah, and up on the screen, that would be great. And justify it separately. Okay. Once it's been moved. I, yeah, I can describe um, the changes here. So, okay. in the in the one that's in our packet, that um, is, is a there, there's a addition uh, at the beginning uh, for that adds a at the at the top that that says that a bicycle should not be parked on the street. But I decided to clarify that that the street is just the curb face to curb face area, um, and the reason why this is being this, why this was added was because of the emergence of bicycle corrals within the city. So I, so we left that in there, but clarified what area we're talking about is the street. Um, and then in under B, striking upon a street, but in, but actually including um, a lot of what was originally going to be striked um, in order to... Um, To kind of clarify, to to keep a lot of the original language that we had in our ordinance, um, the uh, the part that I'm not including in this amendment is uh, C from the original <laughs> uh, one we have in our packet because it says that uh, bicyclists should not secure their bicycle to a whole number of different objects like signs and poles. Um, and the fact is right now there's, um, I guess I could go into that more in the ju justification side, but, um, that's, that's a, the C on the old one is what I'm getting rid of. And I can okay. talk about why later. Um, and then it, it keeps D and E, but it relabels them C and D. Okay. Okay. Um, that's helpful. So I think... Um, you're you're moving, uh, Councilmember Beaton. You're seconding. Um, so the items on the table, and Councilmember Gregor, if you want to speak to it first, um, that'd be great with the justification. Yeah, sure. Thank you. Um, so I guess the, the the main reason for for editing this is that the the impetus for it came with the fact that we are rolling out potentially a, a bicycle share uh, system that is dockless that does not require or allow the bicycles to be locked to anything. Um, therefore, we do need to make sure we keep our s sidewalks clear. We need to keep our streets clear so that the bicycles are not being parked in the way of anything. So it's important that we add some language, and, and we, we've done that in both versions of this. Um, that kind of protects the public right-of-way, protects access for people using the bus, protects um, you know, people who have mobility needs. Um, 
so that's so I think that's really important but I guess the original version of this went, went a little too far I think for where we're where I think the bicycle pedestrian advisory committee was really ready for was really within the scope of their discussion after speaking with their chair today um, it was it was not really understood that these changes were going to be so broad as to impact um, the securing of of all bicycles to to various objects around the, the city and I do think ultimately we should restrict you know the securing of bicycles to certain objects but we kind of need to have that conversation um, I think in a bit more detail and since bike share does not affix bicycles to objects I think that's kind of a conversation for later mm -hmm. um, and then um, another reason for updating this parking section is the emergence of bicycle corrals and I think that these amendments acknowledge the fact that bicycle corrals are typically placed on streets and we need to therefore in that specific instance allow a bicycle to be parked in the street um, and um, so that's kind of where where I'm at with that uh, as far as these as okay. far as justifying this okay Thank you, Councilmember Gregor, Councilmember Strobel. I wonder if we could have Ms. Ness come up and speak to this a little bit. Um, what's the What's the nature of your question, Councilmember Strobel? Um, she presented the ordinance, so I have I have questions on on uh, how it was presented, who it was presented to, um, how this would be affected, removing C in particular. Okay. Yes. Thank you. The removal of C uh, from the parking section of the bicycle, um, C describes bikes should not be secured to any trees, signs, poles, public art, or other items in the public right of way other than a bicycle rack, corral, or similar designated location. Um, the intent of that statement uh, was really we, we do have locations in the downtown area where bicycles are being chained to or locked to a, a decorative pole that we want to maintain um, the integrity of the pole uh, to trees similar similar situation we want to be able to keep our trees um, healthy in the downtown area and in areas around the city um, and and designating locations better outlining where bicycles should be able to park within the right-of-way um, with the bike share as we discussed last night they don't have to lock to a, a bike rack but we could paint areas within the right-of-way for them to be placed and designated um, sign locations to designate those locations. So that was really the intent of having C included. And then if I may ask you a question on that. Um, so C, C applies to all bikes, right? Correct. And not necessarily just the bike share. And and you, you put this um, amendment past the business improvement districts as well and they all they all saw the way it was. Did they comment on any of it? Did they, they approve of it this way? Um, I know you did take it to the South Barstow bid. Um, can you, because the businesses have all approved this where the, and I know why we're not doing it because of the decorative poles and that type of thing. So what, what did you get for feedback? Um, positive feedback from the bids, um, especially with the relationship to the trees, not, not having bicycles chained or locked to trees, um, and the public art, uh, I guess. Uh, there were some questions asking for clarification with the location of bike racks and we do have a policy on how we locate bike racks within the right-of-way certain spacing that bike racks need to be spaced um, the distance from a fire hydrant um, safety issues like that that we take into consideration when we place bike racks so um, those were a couple of the questions that we addressed at the South Barstow bid 
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Ness. Further uh, comments, discussion on this amendment? Uh, Councilmember McGregor. Thank you, Acting President Worthman. I, I certainly um, understand why this, you know, since we're looking at the parking uh, of bicycles right now as, you know, looking at making amendments that I think it is something that we should do at some point is actually look at what we want to restrict people from securing bicycles to, particularly trees. <laughs> we really shouldn't be allowing that. The problem is, I guess, is that I think we could use more time to be able to analyze that specific piece of it, particularly because while I really recognize we're making progress on on downtown bicycle parking in, in certain parts of our downtown, not not a lot on, there's really only one bike rack on, or only a few bike racks on Water Street right now, for example, where we maybe will be rolling out a lot more in the coming years. But right now, like 90% of the city, you, could, you cannot find a bike rack for where you're going. That's like, like so if we're going to take Bellinger Street, for example, or Hastings, like South Hastings Way, um, there's a lot of parts of our city where there's, in, in virtually every residential area, that a, a bicycle, bicyclist could not secure their bicycle legally in those entire like parts of the community. So, so we need to find a way to not only add more bike parking, but, but have some flexibility. There, the city of Minneapolis allows for bicycle parking on signs, for example, sign posts, mm -hmm. but not on trees and not on light posts. Um, so maybe there's a way to, to look at some other communities as to what they do, and um, especially the most, some of the most bicycle-friendly communities in the country, like Minneapolis. So, um, so that's the, really the reason for this. I, I'm totally interested in taking up the topic, and I think the Bicycle Pedestrian Advisory uh, Committee is as well. It's just that when we're talking about bike share, which does not secure to anything, <laughs> and we're talking about bike corrals, like these are the these are the more immediate amendments I think we should make uh, at this time. But um, when we're talking about securing bicycles to things, I think we need a little bit more more input and discussion about that. So, mm -hmm. thank you, Councilmember. Any further comments, Councilmember Emanuel? Uh, thank you, Acting President Orthman. I have a clarifying question. I think maybe Councilmember uh, um, Gregor might be able to answer it is just to help me um, have a better understanding of the difference um, between uh, A, how it was worded before, and now how it's worded, that what is the distinction between adding um, the words that you did? Councilmember Gregor. Thank you, Acting President Worthman. Um, the words that were added were curb face to curb face after the word street. Um, that's an attempt to clarify that we're talking about just the street and not the sidewalks or the boulevard. Um, so essentially, uh, in order to, for a, a, a bicycle corral to, to be, exist in the street, we um, were, um, were basically creating a way for that to, to happen. <laughs> by having this added. Because right now, technically, our ordinance says you can't park a bike in the, st in the street. So, Because in, in B, in my amendment, we take out upon a street. OK. Thanks for that. Does that help clarify, uh, Council Marie Emanuel? Sorry, I'm, I'm challenged in my city engineer um, knowledge acquisition. There's another flag to fly. Um, I guess I don't, I don't understand. I, what I seem, how I read it is that bikes need to be parked in a designated bike corral or something that's designated. I still don't understand the distinction. It's not something I need to get hung up on, but I just, I really don't understand that. So maybe a little educational moment for me. Council Member Anderson. Uh, thank you, Acting President Worthman. Um, just to respond to um, Councilmember Emanuel, I also had trouble with this, and I want to make sure that my what I eventually came to is accurate. 
I was reading a street curb face to curb face, meaning the only time you could park on the street is when you're in one of those little corrals that's like cut out from the street. So there's curbs on three sides of it. Is that basically <coughs> what we're envisioning here? Mm -hmm. Thank you, Councilmember Anderson. Could, would you be able to bring your microphone closer or pull it up a little bit? Just for, yeah, thank you. Um, further comments, further questions for Councilmember McGregor before we take a vote, Councilmember Emanuel. Thank you, Acting President Worthman. I'm pretty sure Councilmember Gregor and I have to go have a bike ride and have a learning bike ride. Um, so, Basically, if, if I understand correctly, then it's kind of like a, uh, let me just say it in my words, you got a sidewalk and then you got like three walls, we'll say, that walls probably not the right word, but basically designated boundary space. That's the space that you have to park in it. But in the event that maybe somebody wants to make a makeshift bike corral, maybe a special event has some cones out, that designated location would cover that type of variance. Is that correct? Um, I think that staff may have to answer that question as to what the meaning of similar designated location is. I'm not sure that I it could be for a special event. I'm assuming that's what you know. it is, yeah. Similar designated location, I would assume that's for like a special event corral or something, but yeah, okay, that's correct. Further discussion on this item? Uh, Council Member Weld. Thank you, Acting President. Uh, just a clarification on the walk the, your wheels zones. Are they, does that include Water Street and Grand Avenue and then all of downtown or is it more specific or? Um, uh, I'm going to defer to um, I'm gonna defer to Mr. Solberg on on that. My idea there is an offer friendly to the amendment to maybe get back to what Councilmember Strobel was hoping for, and 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 C in the amendment it would state bicycles shall not be parked. Uh, where are we? Um, I guess leaving the, the language that's already in the, the ordinance, bicycles shall not be parked. Bicycles shall not be secured to any trees, signs, poles, or public art or other items of public right of way in walk your wheel zones. Um, council member, uh, well, if, I'm, if I could ask, because um, council member uh, Gregert has s taken out that language in his amendment, I would ask if this fails or if it passes, if you want to amend it once we've taken the taken the vote, because if this amendment fails, then I think your amendment's going to fit better uh, in changing it. Is that okay? Uh, sure. Okay. Council Member Strobel? I, in the past, we have amended amendments, haven't we? Sure, but Council Member Gregor is actually removing the current language in C that appears in our packet. He's, his amendment removes that language completely. <clears throat> um, just because of that, because of his, the nature of his amendment, I think it makes more sense to add it in if this fails or add it in after it passes potentially, but it doesn't fit necessarily in C because he's amending C completely out. Council Member Weld. President, I guess I'd like to see if we can, I, guess, I would like to propose that, uh, I guess, add it as another. All right, so uh, thank you, Councilmember Beaton. Maybe that would be the best way is to add um, letter E to the proposed amendment stating that um, mostly all the language that's in C in the original ordinance, um, but then would be added the wordage that in all walk your bike, all walk your wheel zones. Okay. So Councilmember Weld is proposing 
to amend this amendment that we have here by adding the language of C, which is in our packet, which describes not securing your bike to trees, signs, poles, public art, or other items, public right of way, other than bicycle rack, corral, or similar designated locations in all walk your bike zones. He's requesting that that language be added as another uh, item to this. I'll second that. It's seconded by Council Member Strobel. Um, Council Member Well, would you like to speak to it? Sure. I, again, just getting back to the original intent, I think that the areas that we're really mostly concerned about, um, as far as protection of this of, of our art and our, our posts and, and our trees and, and um, in an area where we already are discouraging you know, the riding of bikes. But I understand, too, that there's other parts of the community in the city that those are probably the only options where we can lock our bike in some of the residential areas. So I, I, I agree with, with supporting that, but maybe just designating the, the walk your wheel zones as more or less protected area for those amenities that we've, we've invested a lot of money in and the community's invested a lot into. Thank you, Council Member Weld. Uh, Council Member Beaton. Um, well, I appreciate the effort. Um, I um, can't support this amendment. Um, Councilmember Greg Ayrton and I had an opportunity to speak about uh, this, the original amendment before the meeting, um, and I had agreed to second it. Um, you know, my, my interest was to make biking in our community easier and, and less complicated. Um, you know, to, to stipulate kind of what, what we can lock to and what we can't lock to um, creates a lot of confusion. Um, I also, I feel really strongly that um, in all areas of our community, um, not just outside of the downtown, but even especially within the downtown area, bike parking is extremely limited. And uh, I, I, I do think it's important uh, to start looking at ways that we can reduce parking on these areas that are listed, the uh, trees, signs, and our public art. But I think that we really need to make a concerted effort to in increase uh, bike parking first before we do that. Um, so I guess I won't be supporting this, but um, hope to see some more solutions come forward in collaboration with staff and the bids. Thank you, Council Member Beaton. Council Member Strobel. Uh, thank you. I I think we're talking to Council Member Weld's amendment. Can we talk to Council Member Gregor's tour? Or we we um, wait on that one, or how do we? Let's let's focus on Council Member Weld's uh, addition okay. of the language. I do support that as a as a compromise here. I um, I I would have preferred we left this whole section alone. I mean, I think it was a pretty good ordinance that staff worked on. Went through all the multiple parties and the, the multiple um, uh, business improvement districts to present this, and uh, the enthusiasm for that was was there. Um, I think as a, I can speak to this and in, in the, the not having bike parking, I, I, I'm down there every day. I, I see bike racks that aren't used every day. And, you know, the Pablo Center's probably got, I don't know how many of them, right behind them on the trail there, probably 30 or 40. Um, the Business Improvement District just spent over $5,000 to add more bike racks to the uh, Haymarket, um, Haymarket Landing site. Um, so I think there are plenty of bike racks, and our big concern down there is businesses. And these people, all of us, and myself included, paid a lot of money for those, uh, those improvements. I mean, the, some of these businesses were special assessed over $80,000. So these decorative lights, um, the poles, the, uh, the benches, the, the garbage cans, those are being paid for by the businesses down there. And, and they don't necessarily want to see them wrecked or especially you know, in the trees as well. So it's not just the trees, it's the decorative poles. Um, and there are plenty of bike racks down there for the use that I'm seeing down there, um, for sure. And there's more coming this summer. And I think uh, Ms. Ness also said that Graham Ave's getting another 20 plus bike racks. So I, I think it's fair to, to leave language like that in um, to protect the, the investment that we have down there. And I don't think it's hurting the bicycle people. I think it's just notifying them that you shouldn't park there, so. Thank you, Council Member Strobel, Council Member Emanuel. Thank you, Acting Worth, uh, President Worthman. I'm wondering if we could have maybe somebody from legal or maybe Ms. Ness just share about what is, maybe to answer my question about what is, what are the current laws about where bikes can, can't be parked and 
is this as it's originally written, is any of this redundant? Like, if we took it out, do other laws still stay because they already exist? Um, I think this is going to be for Ms. Stromberger. In answer to your question, um, it's a yes and no. Um, we don't have anything in city code currently that addresses it. I think, as Council Member Gregor at that pointed out, it's just the one sentence in city code currently. Um, there is state statute, though, that says that you can't obstruct any uh, traffic signs or um, intentionally interfere with the effective operation of them. So if somebody's attaching to a sign um, that affects the visibility of it or the effectiveness of it in some way um, that's already prohibited by state statute and potentially overlaps with uh, what is proposed here. May I ask a follow-up, please? So what is a, the one sentence? I, I have need the a existing. reminder of that. Mm -hmm. um, in the draft that staff proposed, it is paragraph B. It says no person shall park a bicycle. That's how it starts out. Mm. May I ask a follow-up? So then the conclusion of that is um, then when the words trees, signs, poles, art, et cetera, that's confirming B as staff wrote it? Correct. Okay. So if this language... If I may ask another sure. question. If this language was removed, that doesn't supersede this language that already says in a more generalized statement, you can't do X, Y, Z. Still enforceable. If somebody locks their dockless bike to a tree, if somebody locks it to a public art, that B still exists. It's in the um, motion resolution, and it could be enforceable if it was a problem. It could be enforceable, but B requires that it obstruct normal pedestrian or vehicle, vehicular traffic in order for it to be a violation. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm going to let someone else speak because, um, Councilmember Strobel, you, you've spoken on this, but you can, we'll come back to you. Uh, Councilmember Christofferson. Thank you, Acting President Worthman. This is a more general question. As we began our conversation, it was my understanding that um, Council Member Gregert brought this because it had not been discussed by the um, bike advisory or is that is that a correct understanding? I'll, uh, def I'll let Council Member Gregert answer that. Uh, thank you Acting President Worthman. Um, the, when I spoke with the chair of, of, the, of the Bicycle Pedestrian Advisory Commission today he there was a lot of focus on the the, asp the fact that we're what was in front of them was about dockless bicycle share, and I think just the detailing of the. But they they thought that that the, um, at least at least the chair felt that the um, the parking provision at the end of the document was pertaining to bicycle share, and not necessarily to to the broader bicycle um, environment. I guess that we have. Currently, um, so I, so I don't think that it was understood the gravity of the, of the language, mm -hmm. at the time. Does that help? May I follow up? Sure. So, but the bid uh, boards were pretty clear as to what they were considering and what the impact would be for their jurisdiction. I'm, my question then would be, if we simply recognize that there was a lack of clarity here, when? When would this come back to be amended again? If we if we passed it uh, based on Council Member Gregert's, for example, how would this come back in front of Council for further clarification on um, the language of item C? Um, maybe I'll take a stab at that. But m my understanding is that um, that provisions in the parking ordinance could come forward working with the Bicycle and Pedestrian Commission. I don't know if it's in the work plan or not, but maybe they would work on that and, and bring forward 
these kind of recommendations on bicycle parking beyond dockless bicycles? Maybe it's something that the city council, by just having this discussion, is helping to encourage. This. That's kind of my understanding of it. Council Member Strobel, did you want to speak on this? Oh, council Member Gregor? Yeah, thank you, Acting President Worthman. I, I think this discussion like essentially proves my point that we need to spend some time on this because I mean we are we have about a half hour left in our meeting before we have to be out of the room is my understanding as well um, but just to to justify my reason for n not supporting this amendment to the amendment is to say that currently we do really do not have bicycle parking in about half of the of the uh, walk your wheels areas right now um, there's some bike parking if we're if we're going to look at Water Street for example um, there's only some on the kind of the eastern end over by Aspens and Mogensen Hall and one in front of a bike shop on the 400 block um, and West Grand Avenue I can't think of any bicycle parking um, I'm not I don't even have a map of the walk your wheels uh, territory so I can't even really judge it effectively right now to be able to even vote on this um, but Bellinger Street if that's included has no bicycle parking um, most of Madison Street has no bicycle parking. Graham Avenue is being is starting to have bike parking and will within the summer. So essentially, I wouldn't support this because we don't have places for people to park their bicycles mm -hmm. to actually follow this ordinance. And I wouldn't want to pass an ordinance that we're not going to enforce. And obviously, we are going to have challenges enforcing it anyway because we don't have like it would be a, our CSOs my understanding would be the ones potentially enforcing this um, and um, really I want to reiterate the point that really all this discussion started based on the dockless bicycle share um, concept and the ordinance around that and the fact that we've implemented bike corrals so I think we should focus on that tonight and then I certainly welcome the ideas, and I do re actually really like this idea of, of defining it as the walk your wheels area, but we're just not ready for that yet because we don't have the bike parking there yet. So Thank you, Council Member Gregor. I think that probably concludes the conversation on the amendment being offered by um, Council Member Weld. Um, just to review again, it adds... It's an amendment to Councilmember Gregor. It's an amendment that you see in the screen here would add um, an section E, which would say bicycles shall not be secured to any tree, signs, poles, public art, or other items in public right of way other than a bicycle rack, corral, or similar designated location in the specific walk your wheels area. That language was added to it as well. Um, Madam City Clerk, please call the roll. Councilmember Strobel? Aye. Aye. No. Anderson? No. Keaton? No. Kirby? No. Christopherson? No. Emmanuel? No. Gregor? No. And that item, that amendment fails. We move back to the amendment presented, what you see on the screen here. Is there further comment or dialogue on that, Councilmember Strobel? Just one more, one more bite at the apple here. Um, uh, Council Member Gregor, um, I, when you were mentioning uh, bike parking on Water Street, I'm, I'm sure they added a bike corral in front of Mona Lisa's last year as well. That, and and um, um, and then also I think there's a, a bike corral on uh, Graham Ave now in front of the, um, the the bike shop there. So those are a couple of the new bike corrals that that were added on street. And I just I just want to clarify that it seems to me that that if you support this amendment that you're saying it's okay to, to tie up or to lock a bike up to the light poles, the, the trees and the, the amenities on, and the sculptures on, on any of the business districts, that's what it seems like uh, my, my council members are okay with. I just, I, you know, I, I think everything was going pretty well on this and I, I just don't understand the, uh, the opposition to that. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Strobel. Um, uh, there's three people's hands up. Who would like to speak first? Council Member um, Emanuel. Thank you, Acting President Worthman. Uh, my understanding is that dockless bikes don't get locked up. 
There is no locking. Except for when they're done with their ride, then they indicate that and it interfaces with the GPS. So I don't think locking of a bike will even occur. Um, Councilmember Beaton, did you want to say something? Yeah, I guess I just wanted to reiterate that um, I think, and I think that this was reflected in some other council members' um, comments too, but um, you know, I will be supporting this, um, but it's not because I think locking to art is okay. Um, I think that we have a larger bicycle parking issue um, and we can't um, prohibit people from locking. We, we can't, we can't, you know, restrict without having another solution. We're, we're um, prohibiting things without giving people options. And so um, I'm hoping that this conversation sparks a, a greater conversation with our city about how to address that bike parking because um, I know I know that there is there are park, uh, bike parking issues downtown and throughout our city. Thank you, Councilmember Beaton. Councilmember Christopherson. Thank you, Acting President Worthman. Um, I'm not in favor of securing bicycles to art and valuable poles, but this did come up about dockless bikes bicycles, and this is what's going to appear on the screen, so that. The only people that will see this regularly are people with dockless bicycles, and it certainly gives us a lot of time to deal with the larger issue of what does everyone in our community do with their bicycles. Thank you, Councilmember Christopherson. If I could just clarify that um, it, I think this provision that we're looking at right now may not be on the app itself. It's in the ordinance, but I think the provisions in the app are specifically mentioned in 5.64.050 B, one through, now I think it's seven. So I just wanted to clarify that. Um, Council Member Weld. Yeah, King President, yeah, again, clarification. I believe the ordinance is for all bicycles, not just dockless bicycles. This is pertaining to anyone riding a bike or parking a bike in, you know, in, in the city limits and, and not just the dockless ones. Thank you, Councilmember Well, and, and, and that is correct that the, this provision that we're looking at, which is an amendment to our parking ordinance, pertains um, to, to all bicycles in, in the conversation we're having right now. Um, further comment, Councilmember Gregor? Thank you, Acting President Worthman. I, I did just want to um, answer a question from Councilmember Strobel about location of bicycle corrals and it's important to keep in mind that, that they're seasonal in terms of their implementation in the community. And I believe they were removed in November or around that time period. So, so if we're talking about right now and, they, and, and for the next month or maybe even two months, depending on the snow, um, there are no bicycle corrals on Graham Avenue or Water Street. And, and what bike parking does exist on sidewalks is largely covered in massive snow piles right now and not being cleared. Um, so for the hardy winter bikers that still exist out there, um, like they, many of them have, have, don't have a choice as to where they're, whether they're parking on a, on a rack or, a, or a, um, a pole. They just need a place to make sure the bike is in a safe place, um, but also out of the way of other people so it's not a safety hazard for other folks. And, I've even had a bicycle blow away because I didn't lock it up because of a storm. So <laughs> um, I think it's a, there's a lot, lot to consider here. And I do appreciate the interest in the, in, in the topic, <laughs> but I'm afraid we're gonna need more time to, to explore it. Thank you, Councilman McGregor. Seeing no further discussion on this item, the amendment that we see here on the screen, clerk, please call the roll. Councilman Weld? No. Aye. 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 And that amendment passes. We move back to the ordinance on the table. There are further uh, amendments or conversation about this ordinance? Councilmember Emmanuel. Thank you, Acting President Worthman. I want to um, just thank all the people who have worked on this. Uh, I remember my first um, 
volley at this, I had to come before the city council and ask permission to use travel funds to go and study this at an American Planning Association conference. Uh, there were two conferences in the country that year, one in D.C. and one in Chicago, and um, I'm really grateful to the council and to staff who supported a future vision of bringing in a, uh, another type of transportation to our community. <laughs> And during that time, you know, it was brought to my attention about some of the social justice restrictions or opportunities. And, um, you know, this really sets some of the infrastructure to then begin entertaining requests for proposals and proposals of um, potential uh, bike share uh, plans to come to our community. And if done right, a bike share program can not only help uh, improve the fun, the funness factor, improve the health, the accessibility, um, even just the maintenance of owning a bike can be cumbersome to folks, um, and uh, it can be a huge stress relief uh, for people just to have that, that wellness activity. And so this is, I think, a wonderful um, connection for our community. I also see that we also have uh, long parking discussions, and we spend a lot of money figuring out parking plans and paying for parking structures. And more people were riding bikes, we'd have a little less cars to be worried about. Um, and I am a vehicle driver. We have two in our family, so I'm not um, um, saying cars are bad. Uh, however, if we can look at um, making riding your bike, taking public transportation as um, an easy choice, I think that we'll have some longer term successes for really the big picture that our community is going. So um, I hope this passes and we'll look forward to um, seeing what else comes out of this. I also want to thank um, Austin, who is here from the university tonight. Um, we met at my home several times over this last year and I've met with previous folks from the university over many years on advancing this idea um, and, and many other um, community leaders on this. So it's a special day for sure. Thank you, Council Marie Emanuel. Any last thoughts or discussion before we vote? Seeing none, we will call the roll. Councilmember Workman? Aye. Anderson? Aye. Payton? Aye. Berge? Aye. Jefferson? Aye. Emanuel? Aye. Aye. Strobel? Aye. Wells? Aye. And that passes unanimously. We've moved to our last ordinance for action this evening, which is regarding parking. This ordinance, uh, item number 22, would amend table nine of our city code of ordinances of the city of Eau Claire entitled parking during specified hours, specifically parking prohibited passenger loading zone related to parking near the Pablo at the confluence. Last evening we had um, the presentation on this and we heard from a couple folks about uh, the two changes um, that we're gonna be seeing tonight. Was there any follow-up questions that council had regarding this item? Any follow-up council had regarding this? Seeing none, on a motion then by council member, I think we're around to Anderson, seconded by council member Emmanuel, it's parking Item has been moved and seconded. Is there a discussion? Councilmember Strobel. Oh, yes, I just wanted to uh, thank you. Um, I just wanted to add in, I was gonna almost do this last night, um, that th this was a, a really good example of uh, um, staff working with uh, the businesses um, the, through the DECI Parking Committee. Initially, that Grand Ave was signed, no parking from 4 p.m. to 2 a.m. every day. So a lot of empty spaces all the time. The businesses weren't real happy about that and Pablo didn't need it then. So we all got together and um, we worked out sort of a shared agreement on that. And the businesses all said whatever Pablo needs they get, we don't have a problem with that at all. So we worked on a signing and uh, you know, it's a, it's a really good shared use. All the businesses down there are very happy with it. I think Pablo's happy with it. And then also we get to add in this uh, loading zone for LSS, which it seems like was very well needed. So I think it was really, um, I wanna thank staff, uh, um, uh, Miss Ness and, and Mr. Solberg for meeting with us as well. Uh, I think it was a really good compromise for everybody. Thank you for that, Council Member Strobel. Any other comments, um, thoughts, or ideas on this ordinance before we vote? Seeing none, Madam City Clerk, please call the roll. 
Councilmember Anderson? Aye. Eaton? Aye. Berge? Aye. Christopherson? Aye. Emmanuel? Aye. Gregert? Aye. Strobel? Aye. Weld? Aye. Worthman? Aye. And that passes. We move then to our announcements this evening from our city manager and city council. Mr. City Manager. Thank you, Acting President Worthman. Uh, just a couple of announcements. Um, on next Thursday, March 7th, uh, you have three different things to occupy your day. One is from uh, noon to four. Um, we'll be doing some time, spending some time together on the strategic plan uh, goal and doing, doing some training on that. Um, and then that evening, you have two choices, either to attend the rescheduled Chippewa Valley Rally or Chippewa Valley Joint Cities Meeting up in Bloomer or the Council President Candidate Forum. So uh, all of that is going on on March 7th. And then on March 13th uh, is the 11th Annual Downtown Eau Claire uh, Awards Evening. And if you're interested in going to that, please uh, let Ms. Marole know. That's all I have. Thank you. Oh, other than we have a work session immediately following this uh, in an uh, affordable housing in the room behind the council chambers here. Thank, Thank you. This program was brought to you by a cooperation between NewsWorks and the City of Eau Claire. A transcript of this meeting is available for the hearing impaired. It will be available within seven days of this telecast. Call 715-839-4912 or TDD 715-839-1689 or write Eau Claire City Clerk, P.O. Box 5148, Eau Claire, Wisconsin 54702-5148. NewsWorks is made possible by continuing community support. If you would like to volunteer or make a donation, please contact us via phone at 715-839-5067 or online at valleymediaworks.org.